There you go. What's your Ryan. favorite sword, Haas? I like the swords. I like the swords. Oh shit. I need a place for my swords. Um, starting with the one, the only, infra open quotes, Haas, close quotes, read ten minutes to talk about his political theory. Followed, of course, by President Sunday. Then we will do our back and forths, give everyone a fair chance to talk. And the timer starts now. Modern politics is beset by the same fundamental contradiction, the same asymmetry defining modernity as a whole. Thinkers like Bruno Latour once framed this paradoxical contradiction as between a process of purification, establishing some ontological zone, such as man, reason, cogito, civilized people, etc., and opposing it to its other, such as nature, the animal kingdom, outsiders, etc., as well as the process of translation, where the actual effect of applying this pure form to actual reality leads to hybrids between the two, proving modernity's inability to fully conquer its own premises. Political modernity understood in this same vein of purification, establishing the universal rights of man, privileging the abstract and generalized concept of man as the supreme political subject, without any essential regard for the particular details of personality, background, estate, religion, or even race, gender, and wealth. Likewise, political modernity has given rise to various hybrids of its own, strange combinations of this universal subject with its opposed particularity, in the form of different classes, separatist ethnic and religious identities, interest groups, racial animosities, and the form of identity politics itself today. I merely propose, drawing from the ideas of Slavoj Žižek's ontology, that an even more fundamental political contradiction pre-exists that between universality and particularity, state and civil society, human and nature, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is internal to the abstract form of political modernity itself. Both the political left and right take what Latour calls the rupture in time of political modernity for granted. The political left is revolutionary wing of modernity, representing the abstract form of change. The right in its, is its conservative wing, attempting to derive a definite political logic out of this modern process of purification, situating people in their rightful place with respect to objects in the case of private property and with respect to other persons in the case of various hierarchies. So modernity implies a paradox or internal contradiction that pre-exists and arguably engenders the division into left and right. On the one hand, it implies a revolutionary change. On the other, it also implies a new order and form of preserving itself. In the aftermath of the French Revolution, various thinkers attempted to resolve that contradiction in some kind of end of history, such as Hegel, Kojev, and most famously Fukuyama. But none of them were able to anticipate our current multipolar world. My basic argument is that the contradiction has to do with the political subject of politics which is an individual substance. In today's era, with the October Revolution, I argue, playing a comparable role to the French, the subject of politics is neither individual nor substantive, but collective and virtual. The modern universal state and its hegemony, founded on human rights, has already synthesized both the left and the right, accomplishing the goal of the fascist third position. Progressive change is already the order of the day and is in no way revolutionary in the sense of actually challenging state power, but on the contrary, is situated within a hegemonic order that preserves it. Here enters a new kind of political subject, which I call the partisan, partially drawing from Carl Schmitt. Rather than being some neutral subject or atomistically uh, individual substance, the partisan is already virtually disposed and partial towards some kind of collective political identity. The partisan embodies the internal contradiction of modernity itself into one political subject, rather than solely giving expression to one of its forms. It doesn't represent one of the asymmetrical forms comprising the difference. The partisan essentially is political difference itself. Partisanship implies a way of differing into a specific collective political reality. Because of this embodiedness, the deeper order of rural life is fertile ground for the partisan subjectivity. But because the partisan gives specific content to politics, such as in the form of class struggle, they are revolutionary with regard to the modern state, positioned in such a way that already regards it as illegitimate, for example, serving the interests of a particular group. The partisan not, is not strictly defined by a specific ideology or set of values, but a position with regard to what Antonio Gramsci calls that uh, hegemony, or what Popper calls the open society. 
Their revolutionary stance makes them fundamentally left wing, but coupled with a profound social conservatism, reflecting an embeddedness in the deeper premises of civilization. Many mistaken this for third position syncreticism, but the difference is that the partisan conservatism isn't based on ideology, but popular sensibility. If the goal of political partisan were created by individual thought, such as by a theory or ideology, the goal would only coincidentally be effective, its realization coinciding with some deeper, objectively established and material premise that makes the partisan's movement across the social fabric effective in the first place. Without their position being rooted in an objective reality, a partisan is no longer a partisan, but just some guy with an opinion. I argue that the partisan is the sub subject of a polarity, an objectively existing orientation toward the reproduction of an existing civilization. The source of a political polarity, the force of partiality in the partisan, is a specific resolution of the contradiction between the universal state and its real civil society, a resolution whose development is already propelled into motion and arguably even implied by the nature of the contradiction itself, a logic reflected in uh, Marx's Communist manifest Manifesto. This resolution is the universal partisan empire, the authentic unity of a people given expression by a people sovereign, whose power takes the form of, rather than pretending to be elevated above, the contradiction between state and civil society, such as in the case of a proletarian dictatorship, the class struggle. Thus, my political philosophy implies an entirely new notion of subject and object itself, drawing from the concept of hyperobjects of speculative realism. The universal empire is a hyperobject, an object participating in its own phenomenal disclosure by engendering the very conditions of its own development, and whose scale in both time and space exceeds what can be reduced to individual experience. That is the objective, common sociality that pre-exists individual subjectivity itself. The stakes of this theory are clear. In a historical situation defined by the crisis of Western liberal democracy, Many leftists have joined in with the State Department's characterization of the current multipolar world as a struggle between democracies and autocracies, labeling all sovereign counter-hegemonic states challenging the so-called rules-based political order as fascist. I argue this is reactionary from the current historical perspective. As an ideology, Western leftism is the vanguard of the current ancient regime's hegemony, which has become outmoded by history itself. It is for that reason that it is also a vanity. It will be condemned to the dustbin of history as a multipolar order rises from the ashes of the globalist empire. Anybody else smelling burnt toast? I can see why 10 minutes was necessary. All right. Um, burnt toast aside, President, it's your call. Uh, thank you, Haas. Thank you, Vosh, for moderating. Um, so we are apparently uh, debating my opponent Hawes's groundbreaking theory of the political spectrum. At least that's how I understood it from our messages prior. I'm not entirely certain now. The principal source for this being an essay on the infrared substack entitled The Rise of Mega Communism, <clears throat> the purpose of which, given in the heading, being to establish, quote, how can mega and communism be united? For one is clearly far right and the other far left, unquote. Putting it lightly, this essay is bizarre. At over 13,400 words, it is meandering and overlong, filled with esoteric terminology which, while in more rigorous hands, might be sufficiently explained so as to mean something specific, is here ultimately included only to be put to the service of motivating statements like, quote, leftism is a type of mental retardation according to which the latest, quote unquote, open agenda constitutes real historical change, unquote. But the essence of my opponent's thesis can actually be given rather quickly. In a move of breathtaking erudition to which one can only react with awe, Hawes proposes the revolutionary thesis that the left, the right, liberal elites and quote-unquote globalists are in fact all the same people, and that these refer to the political opponents of globalization, trans rights, BLM, free immigration, other left-wing causes, and so forth as quote-unquote Nazis to obscure the fact that they themselves have in fact inherited Nazism. Thus it was in fact the right, who are actually the left, who beat the Nazis in World War II in order to establish a global leftist hegemony that is in fact a rightist hegemony to disguise the fact that they actually were the right all along. And in a stroke of diabolical genius through, quote, agents of deception like Ron DeSantis, unquote, they simultaneously persecute and pretend to be the genuine right, which they are, except they aren't because they are the left, with the result that, quote, a complete takeover of the Hitlerite kind is all but now inevitable, which will attempt to satisfy the patriotic aspirations of the MAGA movement into consensus for war, a war which will seek to preserve the power of the bankers and globalists, unquote. 
In this apocalyptic vision, my opponent sees the left being both the right and the left all at once, which is why when he writes that, quote, so-called rightist, quote-unquote, ideologists are thus today split between Azovites and the accidentally based, unquote, rightist is put in quotes because it actually refers to the left, and the accidentally based refers to cranks like Jordan Peterson, whose rhetoric just incidentally happens to run contrary to whatever species of establishment paranoia Haas wants to capitalize on in the moment. No robust treatment of communism is given, and so no robust ideological goals get in the way of my opponent going all in on an argument for allying communism with the MAGA movement. How MAGA escapes being right-wing for my opponent is by being partisan. What does this mean? Haas introduces this term partisan by way of Carl Schmitt's essay, Theory of the Partisan. The partisan, for Schmitt, is a combatant fulfilling four essential conditions. The partisan is irregular, has increased mobility, has a heightened intensity of political commitment, and is thoroughly Tellurian, which is to say land-based. This is what distinguishes partisans from pirates and corsairs for Schmidt, and is, as far as I can tell, the only part of the definition Hawes really takes up. Because introducing the partisan through Schmidt, uh, despite this rather, my opponent simply insists that Schmidt, despite taking his cues from the likes of Lenin and Mao, and readers of the same, is too limited by his Hobbesian formalism, quote-unquote, and argues instead that the partisan is, quote, the political agent at the end of history, for which change is a moment in the development of an order more eternal than can be given form by modern statehood, unquote. And that the leftist is the great enemy of the partisan because, quote, leftism grounds politics not in partisanship, but in some supposedly universal morality, and the fundamental enduring fact of political antagonism vindicates the leftist's sense of smug, self-satisfied superiority, unquote. He then claims instead that, quote, partisanship can also be defined by a specific Hegelian sublation of established political distinction, representing a type of political subject interpolated by a new form of universal statehood, the Kajevian empire, polarity, or determinate globality, unquote. What this means is anyone's guess, but it doesn't matter, because by describing the idea of partisanship as something that sounds sort of like it, it can easily attach to nationalism or a determinate civilizational polarity. Uh, he can now describe MAGA as partisan because it is, quote, unquote, telluric. Thus it concludes after an almost unbearably long series of paragraphs too convoluted for me to even attempt to recapitulate here, that the anti-communism of the MAGA movement is just an endearing Americanism, that MAGA should form its own discrete party, and that, quote, there is no other choice for MAGA communists, unquote. Oz isn't stupid. The material he is handling in this essay runs very complicated very quickly. It takes a lot of work. He could just produce run-of-the-mill right-wing content. It would be easier and more lucrative. Despite the overall incoherence of the essay, there is a degree of effort here that doesn't strike me as a pure product of cynicism. Unfortunately, by putting his theory of left and right solely to the service of justifying the absurd slogan of mega communism, a move which reduces communism to a street-facing bench with imagine your ad here displayed on the back, all of this work is reduced to incoherence. Thank you. All right. Wonderfully delivered and well under time from you both. Uh, let's get into the back and forth. I'm sure you both have lots to talk about. It doesn't need to be like one minute block to one minute block. Obviously, you can engage normally, but give both people space to talk, please. All right, good luck. First of all, I'm not sure why you referenced the MAGA communism essay if it was too difficult for you to comprehend, but I can already point out well, that, that there the, were... That was the, that was the source you, you referred me to. It was that or the video which you recommended. Yeah, but I don't know why you brought it up here when the only thing you can say is that you found it incoherent. Well, you're going to find out that there is a coherence to it, whether or not you want to acknowledge that. And All before right, we ready. get to that, Late on I uh, noticed a few things you said, just a few that I decided to write down. I'm sure there was others that were completely mischaracterizations of the essay. You said that I was saying the right is the left and the left is the right when... The broader point I was trying to say is that today, oftentimes, things that are considered right-wing and right-wing populism uh, manage to outdo the left in many regards. For example, in the anti-war stance and the opposition to the federal agencies like the FBI and so on and so forth, the overall anti-government stance. And what, I, what that meant to me was that right-wing populism today can more correctly be characterized in its essence as partisan. There's nothing essentially right-wing about it, but that only makes it potentially left-wing, not necessarily already left. Well, I don't, I don't think being opportunistically against the police when they uh, are enforcing government policies you happen to disagree with or defending, for example, invasive wars just because you happen to have some kind of ideological affinity with the aggressor, I don't think that 
makes you uh, succeeding more at what the left generally wants to do than the left. I think it's kind of a silly proposition. But I, I find your characterization idealist because you're focusing too much on. What, what do you mean by that? Can you can you can you elaborate? Yes. Well, I was going to, but before yeah. you cut me off, you're speaking strictly within the realm of the alignment of ideological values, as if this what it underpins the uh, what I would call the counter hegemonic position of MAGA. But the ideological alignment is downstream from the fact that there is an objectively real hegemony. There is a real hegemony, which is characterized by a specific ideology. You can object to the characterization that it's called globalism. That's just a simplification. It can be called neoliberalism. It can be called uh, liberalism generally. I'm not going to be too picky about what you want to call it ideologically, but there is a hegemony. There's a clearly a monopoly capital and a ruling class that is in power in the West, which exercises hegemony through institutions, uh, both the legal institutions, the federal agencies, the CIA, the FBI, the increasingly politicized um, yeah, right, government. right. So, so, so your thesis is that there's an international cabal controlling the world and that the right is, is more fervently opposed to it. No, I, you can be more specific because it, first of all, doesn't control the world. And that's exactly why we are witnessing so-called challenges, sorry, challenges to the so-called uh, rules-based order. Clearly doesn't control China, Iran, Russia, North Korea, even Cuba or Venezuela, for example, or Syria. I'm sure there's other examples. Uh, it clearly doesn't even completely control uh, the so-called second world or non-wine countries. Um, maybe Brazil is a good example of this, right? Because other countries are caught in between. That's Gramsci's entire point of the idea of hegemony. There are intermediate blocks that are not necessarily one way or the other, and hegemony attempts to exercise dominion over these intermediate uh, classes or states taken in the realm of international relations. So there is clearly a hegemony based in what we call the unipolar American world order. Now, uh, I think you're roughly trying to compare, uh, make an allusion to anti-Semitism or something of that nature. Well, the idea of a unipolar American world order is not even controversial from the perspective of the American State Department itself. It calls this order the rules-based international order, the various scholars and thinkers of the West, I'm sure, regularly make reference to the significance of the Bretton Woods post-war world order. So you don't need actually to talk about uh, some conspiracy theory. I'm just, I'm, just not sure, I'm just not sure what your thesis is, because you're throwing names and references at the wall willy-nilly, and I'm not seeing okay. a coherent thesis. I'm just defending actually... the idea that there is a hegemony. But I don't think anybody contends that there's no hegemony. Um, okay. this, is, this is why anti-colonialism is, is uh, uh, endemic left-wing. Uh, okay, stance. well, what, what, what are, but colonial, the colonial era, for example, this is why I don't think you understand what hegemony is. The colonial era, maybe there's neocolonialism with Francis Sifak, right? But the colonial era um, belonged to the pre kind of um, Bretton Woods era, the, the period of the 20th century, the mid 20th century was characterized by various formal decolonizations. So the way in which American unipolar hegemony exercises its control over the world obviously is not through direct colonization. It's through the exercise of soft power. It's through the exercise of um, I, I know, but, economic... But Anti-colonialism anti is not strictly concerned with, with direct colonization. It's also concerned with um, the, the, the residue of, of colonial hegemony in, in the present. Like, it, I... Okay. I just... <clears throat> well, sure. Well, the residue of a, a colonial hegemony has culminated into an act. It's not just a residue, it's an active system of unipolar uh, American hegemony. It's not a residue of something from the past. It's a system that emerged after World War II, which um, clearly is a global hegemon. So okay, why did you I, make an allusion to a global cabal of some kind? Uh, uh, this, this, is, this is this is you. You're the one who refers to liberal elites and globalists as, as being the the originator. Um, of, originator of a, of, of, what? A, of a deliberate uh, attempt to uh, manipulate through through these these ideological distinctions. 
I, I don't know what exactly you're referring to. I, 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 I quoted you, you confused. pretty yeah, directly you here. You seem very confused. I, I so am indeed very there confused. There is a object, so there's an objective system of unipolar imperialism. There are indeed liberal elites who benefit from this hegemony, the hegemonic elites, the cultural elites, and so on and so forth. And then there's so, also... So, so who, who, are the, who are the globalists then? Uh, just help me out here. So I'm referring to globalism as an ideology and a form of... But you, you refer specifically to the globalists, so you mean something definite, right? Yeah, I think, the I think, for example, the globalists are the hegemonic institutions of society, the mainstream... But you're not no, no, globalists aren't institutions, right? You're referring to people. These are ists. These are, these are, this is uh, globalism in this context. So my thesis is that... You don't, you don't uh, say globalist institutions, you say specifically globalists. Are you, are you trying to, like, allude to this idea that... I'm not uh, alluding to anything. I'm just asking you a question. Are you saying that s social forces are reducible to the individuals that comprise them? I don't know. I don't know what you're asking. You haven't... You haven't... Are you asking... It kind of sounds like you're asking... It kind of sounds like you're asking who well, is... Well, that doesn't, that doesn't work, though, because you juxtapose liberal elites and globalists as if these are one and the same. But liberal elites aren't institutions. Liberal elites are people. Globalists yeah, but are they people. are people, and you don't say are, globalist institutions hold on, or, hold on. or whatever. But they are the globalists. people that have benefited from the hegemony uh, characterized by these institutions. They are the people who epitomize the rule of these institutions. They are the people whose interests coincide with the hegemony. That's okay, all. Okay, sure, but who are they? Uh, all of them. Do you want me to name like millions of people? <laughs> what? what what are you asking specifically? What do you mean, who are they? Do you need well, like I an thought, example? I thought we were here to debate your political theory, but it, it seems like my you, you, you've just completely ignored my, my critique of it, and you're now insisting that the right wing or, or something... You didn't have a critique. You said that it was incoherent, so now we're trying to uh, educate yeah, you. Yeah, but on, on fairly fairly particular bases, though, because you, you uh, deploy a bunch of terminology that you cherry-picked um, to build to a thesis that somehow uh mega communism uh transcends the right and the left on the grounds of being telluric that's not what i said at all i said the i said first of all the exact opposite that i'm against the syncretic position of beyond left and right i completely rejected that position if you actually read my paper it says that the first of all maga communism is a slogan i the basic idea is that a communist movement can be derived out of the maga movement which would indeed be left wing because it's revolutionary, but there's a difference between left wing and leftist. Leftism is an ideology, supposedly trying to be authentically left wing. It's not an actual position with regard to politics. Positions are not about what your beliefs are, what your ideas are, but where you are actually positioned in regards to the status quo. So I said leftism is an idea of change. It's an ideology of political change, it doesn't actually represent political change. So no, I didn't say it transcends left and right. You're completely fabricating that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, but we can move on from there. The essay is extremely long and I don't have the quote directly to hand. Well, you didn't um, read it with enough I, 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 I read it pretty care, carefully, I guess. actually. Okay. Um, oh, I, I don't know, Haas. Where, where do you want to go from here? Well... Uh, your thesis is that my uh, position is incoherent. So let's get into the specificities of well, why, why don't we why don't we make it coherent? Why don't you start from the why don't you start from the top and let's go from there? I just I gave a nearly I think it was like an eight minute intro. Did you I, I were you not listening or I was I was listening very carefully. Okay. I, I could not I, I, I gotta be real with you, Haas. I don't think I think I speak for everybody. I could not follow that at all. I don't think you speak for everybody at all, but I could help you in particular and educate you about what I'm... Please, help me. Yeah, okay. So the idea of from the MAGA communism substack and the political theory underlying it is basically that there is a political realignment we are facing right now because of a transition from one historical era to another. The previous historical era you could be, uh, could be characterized as classical modernity. Now, can I stop you right there? Yeah. A political realignment of what? What are you referring to? Uh, basically, in the West, right now, speaking like very, uh, in the, like, as of the 2010s, what's yeah. developed as of the 2010s, for example, like this immediate? 
there has been a specific association of this is what the left is and this is what the right is, right? So I'm saying we are witnessing. Is there? Is there I think that's debated. I don't think there's much consensus on that at all. This is like the whole leftist infighting meme. And nobody can decide on who the hell the left is or who the right is. I think leftist infighting can is transcended when it comes to people like me. So no, I don't think there is uh, any problem so? as far as how to identify leftists is concerned. How so? But uh, so there is a political realignment going no, 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 on. But, right but now. How, how so do you do you transcend that? And what does that mean? It, no one's talking about transcending anything. There is a realignment. I'm no, arguing. No, but you you said that you you transcend that distinction. Can can you clarify? What do you mean by that? No, I explicitly said I don't believe it's possible to transcend political difference. But you just said you do. You said well, you said you you transcend um, leftist infighting somehow. So you, you oh no no, I said the leftist infighting is transcended. Sorry, you you focused on the word transcended. It's put to yeah. the side when it comes to how they treat people like me. So all these leftists can fight each other, but when it comes to Haas, they are suddenly aware of their common enemy and realize they're all leftists. Wouldn't that just point to them recognizing you as right wing? That's their view, yeah. Well, you can say that that means they recognize me as, as if this is the case, but there is clearly a association of this is left and this is right, right? I mean, you yourself saying this, that's an acknowledgement of that. There is clearly um, an association of what is considered left and right. Well, well I, th I think, I think I, I've definitely encountered a lot of people who would characterize you as right wing on the grounds of, of your associations and your rhetoric, et cetera, et cetera. But By in, way, in terms of, in louder? terms of, in terms of like an actual theory, I, I'm not committed to the stance therefore. Can you speak louder? My association with what? My, what? Sorry? I didn't hear what you said when you said because I'm not I'm not committed on the grounds of observing that people associate you with the right wing fairly unproblematically or seem to treat it as unproblematic. I, that's not the point, though. The point no, 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 is but that, what I was saying, though, is I'm not committed. Therefore, all right, I didn't think this would be that. I didn't think day. it would be that controversial to say that there has been a vague association of these are the leftist values and these are the right wing values that has developed right. in the 2010s, especially because of the culture war and. You know, and the, if you're on the internet, I guess GamerGate, things like that. I mean, these clearly have defined different. Well, kind that, of that's 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 largely, I think, tracking uh, electoral politics in the United States. It's not quite that clear cut at a higher degree of resolution. Okay, well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about the actual reality of uh, popular ideologies and political views in the United States. I think it's fair to say there yeah, are in, in the United actually, States. That's 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 what I just said. Okay, there are conventionally established associations of what it means to be a leftist or what it means to be a, a right winger, um, and I'm saying that that is changing. But, and but there's we're, a like, like, for example, our, our our moderator, for instance, is is considered uh, not left wing by a bunch of people who we would probably agree are leftists. It's considered liberal by a bunch of people who I think that's part of Same the confusion. Me. Yeah, I think that's part of the confusion defining the political realignment that's going on. Uh, the moderator. We, I guess we have to reference the moderator now. No, we we it, don't. I'm just I'm just okay. using like an obvious example to hand. Yeah. Well, the moderator is assuming positions that traditionally, from a broader historical perspective, were not associated with the left, and that's why. But it's still um, many people still believe it's left wing because, on the cultural front, it had been established in the past decade, I guess, or maybe depending on how long you back you want to go the past few decades that culturally it's left wing so i'm just trying to say there's a lot of confusion and obscurity about what it means to be left and right in this day and age it's pretty simple i don't know why it's controversial i'd well, like think, to ask a, what, one moment oh thank god please i'd like to ask a brief question Haz, <clears throat> when you use your definition of this distinction acknowledging how confused it is to everyone um when you think of what it means to be a leftist are you thinking of a position with regards to one or maybe several specific issues, whether or not the economy should be decommodified, democratic ownership of the means of production, opposition to American geopolitical politics, that sort of thing? Or do you think it's an emergent property of a haze of positions that can't be so easily quantified? How concrete, distinct can it be made? I tend to object to, uh, to answer it simply. I don't think that 
political distinction is based on differences of opinion uh, when it comes to, I think those are all just symptoms. I think the real political distinction is based on what position you have with regard to some kind of status quo. So historically, the left wing was defined by those who were in a position, a revolutionary position with regard to the status quo. They wanted to kind of overthrow it, basically, and overturn it. And leftism, I have diagnosed, is a re more recent phenomenon. Maybe it's coming from, I don't know how far back you can really go, but I would at least the new left, right? Which I think is an ideology of the hegemony, uh, because the progressive changes that it... Uh, it is characterized by advocating for and, and trying to push correspond with the goals of monopoly capital and if as I well can, as yeah if i may though um you say that your your positionality has to do with with an actual like position that's not simply reducible to ideas and opinions that you hold but then your point of reference for what makes people these things is specifically referred to their attitude towards revolution and things like that you're not referencing anything uh, more concrete than their ideas and opinions. Because it's not about the ideas or opinions, but where those are coming from and whose interests those serve. But we're still talking about ideas and opinions, right? They're talking about the attitudes of, of actors, not like specific actors. We're, we're, talking, about a, we're talking about a hegemony which um, utilizes or exercises sorry, it, um, disseminates ideas and opinions as a form of, for example, soft power. So to clarify then, and hopefully to put an end to this specific semantic bit, Please. you would say then that leftism is a property of taking a revolutionary, a revolutionary attitude towards a given hegemonic position, that one being, in this case, uh, uh, global capitalism, and that any position which is revolutionarily against that one would necessarily be a leftist position. I think there's semantic confusion because for me, leftism is not the same as a left-wing alignment. A left-wing alignment is not a position about attitude. It's where do you stand positionally, right? Let's say as an agent of information or as a candidate, electoral candidate, doesn't matter, political actor. Even a, a Schmidt's actual partisan, people who were like on the ground waging guerrilla warfare, where are you, what is your position with regard to the status quo? Are you considered a enemy of the status quo? Are you a fighter against the status quo of some kind? So, but leftism to me is, a, is an ideology. Okay, okay, what does that mean? Can you, can you clarify that a little bit? Yeah, leftism is an ideology that tries to reduce the historical tradition of left-wing, real historical left-wing traditions into an ideology. So, so there's so, not so a leftism, le left, So leftism is, is an agent then? Like it, 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 it attempts things? Leftism oh. is an ideology. Um, people attempt things. I, I don't know what you're... Leftism is an ideology. Well, well, when you're saying it, it tries to, um, that, that to me oh, okay. signifies I'll, I'll, like I'll, I'll, I'll clarify then. Sure. The ideology of leftism attempts to develop the idea to arrive at somehow the idea of the left. So it's an idea of the left, right? It's an okay, ideology. Okay, sure, sure. But there's, it, it's, okay, but it's a directed thing, right? It's a thing that has a goal and a purpose. So I guess my... my is that fair? Like it, it the, has... the goal, the 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 purpose of the ideology is to distill the essence of change, modern revolutionary political change All right, into so an idea. Okay, so whose purpose then? Because we're, we're not we're not just, we're not just talking about like uh, like an aggregate of of ideas that are just kind of sitting inert. We're talking about something that has like an, an, an it, it's 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 purposed to interfere in some way with the world it, it's doing something to these ideas and turning them into whatever okay uh, yeah yeah well I, I think i get what you're trying to ask yeah 
Yeah, I would say that for the purpose of realizing the aims and exercising the hegemony of monopoly capital, for example. Oh, okay, well, my, my question is then referred a little bit farther back. So, so to this, this is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So the hegemony has weaponized the, I guess, um, the hegemony has goals that could be called um, progressive. That's the whole ideology of progressivism, right? For example, Rockefeller, the oil, oil guy, Rockefeller, he had a whole progressive vision of an international integrated society, and he championed progressive social causes and so on and so forth. We all know how corporations champion progressive causes and so on and so forth. So somehow revolutionary change, sorry, not, I don't know if I would call it revolutionary, but change, political change, cultural change has been assimilated by monopoly capital and by the hegemony. Okay. And leftism is the ideology corresponding to that um, hegemony, having assimilated uh, change, modern political and cultural and social change, movementism, and so on and so forth. All right. Um, okay, so... So, so what is, is, is leftism just equivalent to wokeism then, or, or what are we doing exactly? I mean, you can, it goes, I guess you can call it many things. Maybe wokeism can be a form of that. But I think leftism, contemporary leftism, which at least dating since the new left, has served that purpose and can, I think, fairly be characterized as that. I don't think, for example, that the new left, the legacy of the new left is based on some kind of like grassroots thing going on with the working class. I think the new left was propelled into significance because much of its legacy was appropriated by the culture industry, by Hollywood and mass media. These people went on to become yuppies. Working that's that's in response. Food. That's in response to like fairly harsh criticisms of Hollywood and mass media from outside of it, though. That's not a thing that happened spontaneously from within. You could argue that it was definitely cynical on the part of certain studios um, to to uh, like like predictably, for example. Um, gender bend or or or, or like right. do, do but then i would have to ask you sure. in, in, a, in a strangely motivated seeming way but, but that I, doesn't I don't strike me as an indication sure, that there but i don't think it's fair to say that the impetus to that is, is i don't think it's fair to say that the new Sorry. left and the counterculture spread and emerged in a purely grassroots way i think it's also fair to say that the influence of the ford foundation the influence of well i don't the, think anything i don't think anything spreads in a grassroots way uh to okay cause. so so it's not just that Hollywood. But, but I mean, the, the definition of the left has never been that it's that it's grass. So the the culture industry and the counterculture and the new left worked hand in hand. It wasn't that one was just uh, one was criticized, so they became better because they were received too harsh criticism. I mean, I think the election of Nixon kind of proves that the so-called silent majority was a real thing. The hippies and the new counterculture and this new left were not really actually that popular among the people so i don't see how popular pressure could be responsible for for example corporations and uh well well hang on it's, it's not exactly true though or it's not exactly fair to refer to that as kind of a a a a, a naturally arising uh uh majority position um, when during this time, uh, leftists of, of many stripes are being directly persecuted, as well as many of the groups of people uh, who they now advocate for. Um, persecuted this is a time, by who? This is the time, sorry? Persecuted well, this, by this is, this is the era of McCarthyism. Um, this is when no, it's not. you could be, what? It's not the era of McCarthyism. Uh, communists and socialists and leftists weren't being persecuted in, in universities and out of office at the time? It wasn't illegal. That for was example, uh, something to, that to was happening in the fifties. That was not what characterized the counterculture. In the, if anything, the new left was criticizing the established. Uh, what do you What do you think the basis? So the new left was a critique of the established communist parties, both in the United States and in Western Europe. It wasn't. Uh, those were not the people being persecuted under McCarthy are not the same people being persecuted by local police departments 
hippies and so on. It's completely different kind of people. Uh, okay, Hooverism then. I, I just, I, I don't know. I just don't know what this gets you exactly. This, this was still- So I asked you who was persecuting these new leftists and my best guess would be oh, that- it would be, it would be police? Politics, yeah, local police sorry, departments. Sorry. So there was a conflict uh, happening at this time where, and I'm not defending local police departments, I considered them reactionary, but there was a conflict going on between local police departments and the growing hegemony that was associated with the federal government. That's not, I'm not giving like a, you know, positive appraisal of police as resistance of anything. It's just, there, sure, the but but the, yeah. the point though the point though is that it was only fairly recently um that it wasn't the case that you could lose your job or you wouldn't be viciously excoriated um or persecuted for being even even vaguely left wing um that's that's why we have the whole notion of like a pinko for example what what uh how recent do you imagine this to have been uh probably actually until present day to be honest um we were so doing you think research until... for uh, we were doing research for a debate with destiny on whether or not um there was uh there was persecution of uh centrist or or, or otherwise professors and in, in university for not towing the woke line and we found practically no none of the examples provided uh, to that effect so actually you, held you're trying to but we me. found multiple people yeah. um who were uh persecuted out of university for um, criticizing, for example, uh, uh, local police departments, local politicians, uh, oil magnates who were who were donating to the universities, etc. Wait, so you're saying that until recently, and to be generous, that's the 2020s. You're saying that people who hold left-wing views were being, on a significant level, being persecuted in universities. I would say they are they are still being so. Very much so. Actually. Um, so, I'm universities wanna, aren't universities aren't, aren't collapsing guy. their philosophy programs. And sure, I don't. I don't want to be that guy because they're being I, run by administrators. Yeah, who, who, like, I, have again, I don't. I don't want to be that guy who's going to ask for a source. It's just that my personal experience contradicts that, and the experience of everyone I know contradicts that. So, do you have a source well, for well, that? What, 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 fire people for having left wing. Um, I actually, I actually can produce them, but I'd have to uh, search through and, and get those documents again. It's been a hot minute. Um, I just, but I put, I put the ball back into your court, though, since you say it is your experience. To what are you referring to? In I'd like to add something, if I may. Please. In my or lifetime. Haas, uh, actually, hang on, hang on. Haas, are you okay with that? I think that's fair. Haas. What did I hear? What? I want to uh, know if you're okay with me adding something. Are you cool with that? Yeah, I don't, I don't care. Well. I can't speak much to the persecution of left-leaning professors in my lifetime, but the most significant, I guess, political excision that I've seen um, while I've been politically active was after the Iraq War. Um, obviously, there was a very gung-ho attitude towards the war back when it began in 2003, and I remember there being quite a lot of talk of contrary media pundits, professors, and the like who were openly anti-war. A lot of them did get the boot for that. I don't know how much that's necessarily a left-wing position, though there is a correlation, of course. That's more of a broad anti-state hegemony position that gets cracked down on. I, I think that's true uh, during the Iraq war, but I think the reason for that was that, as you said, it wasn't an essentially left-wing position. The Ron Paul libertarians and those kind of other, even, even kind of, you know, the Alex Jones, Infowars guys, that was a broadly counter-hegemonic position to be against the Iraq war at the time. Now, now it's this popular thing, but yeah, at the time being against that war, and it wasn't even just because, you know, conservative was in power. Another thing people do, I guess, don't pay attention to, there was a lot of hegemonic left-wing apologia for that war that was drawing in many ways from the legacy of the counterculture. Like, you know, for example, we have sexual freedom and we can do drugs and we are the free West and they're conservative and backward over there. So I, I think the Iraq war speaks to an even greater um, argument for how uh, progressive change has become assimilated by the status quo. I think that, that's the, probably oversimplifying it quite a little bit. A lot of people were praising, for example, people like Chris Kyle, who are absolutely not um, celebrating America's sexual liberation in contrast uh, to the Middle East, except when um, it allowed them to uh, dunk on 
uh, how backwards people in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, but, were. I but I think that was right. When did? But first of all, there's two problems. I ne I never said that this neoliberal uh, justification was the sole one for the Iraq War. Just that it was the one that uh, was this uh, sorry most effective hegemonic most effective ideology of the hegemony that defended the Iraq war. And this is not even um, to say that it was just a, an open endorsement. Even the forms of anti-Arab racism and uh, even in, you know, I remember Saturday Night Live and all that kind of stuff. There were these implicit justifications for the war based on how backward and medieval they are over there and compared to the civilized west all right can we uh can we we're supposed to be debating your political theory here and we're, we're right i think it's over. related though because you're asking for example I, i'm 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 yeah. sure but like the reason why we moved on to that point is because you're making particular assessments of, of current movements and trying to make arguments on those bases but we're talking about like identity in, in theoretical terms which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm kind of squinting here because it's like i came prepared for a theory discussion and we're, we're going through okay. the history of the united states um, could I, maybe wait, this can help. I'd like Please. it if we could move on from this point. And to that end, I think we, I'd, I'd like to suggest something that perhaps we can agree on, um, a build a foundation to move the discussion forward. Um, I think that we can both agree that, uh, what has been termed left historically, uh, has often been categorized on vague and often contradictory uh, standards. Um, as Haas pointed out, you know, we have left opposition to the Iraq war, which I hope most people here would agree is a good thing. Um, but we also have the cynical invocation of Western progressivism as a pretext for, um, uh, you know, spreading democracy to the Middle East. Uh, now, both of those things have been called left at times. Um, I don't know if we would call one like syncretic or, or fake or, or artificial, but pause. When you talk about you know, your theories, you're referring here, the, the revolutionary opposition, this would not include the 1960s, uh, so-called countercultural hippie types, correct? We were talking about non-co-opted left sentiment. Yeah, broadly speaking, no, I think there were exceptions, but broadly speaking, no. Okay. And President Sunday, do you agree that whatever distinctions we're carving out here, there is something meaningful in the the distinction between what Haas is referring to here that um non-co-opted revolutionary opposition and broadly what is termed left which is used in so many oh ways. oh categorically in fact one of the frustrating things about his essay is is actually that it's not entirely incoherent um there is a tendency to uh, once again brute force a specific interpretation on the grounds of what flows best um in terms of uh of you know what 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 piece of terminology justifies the next step in his argument? And in that sense, it's overdetermined and the schema corrupts, corrupts the whole. Um, but earlier on, like the distinction between um, leftism as, as sort of like a, a general ideological uh, uh, tendency that doesn't actually correspond towards like the, the robust attitude of, of individual actors or parties or whatever towards, um, you know, existing or hegemonic structures like that. I onboard categorically. In fact, I think generally we we're actually in agreement on what distinguishes the left from the right, and that the left has uh, not so much a set of policy distinctions that can be crystallized at one given uh, point in time, but rather it's it's a a critical or, or deconstructive or or at at the very least um, uh, non conservative attitude towards structures um so that like thing experiments and 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 developments are allowed to take place and we aren't sort of chained to um the the ghosts of things that have so happened I, before yeah so uh, i think this is can be a point to develop the contention because i would actually disagree with that characterization of what the left is all right i don't think the left refers to a um unequivocal or that's not the right word, unilateral opposition to existing structures. I want to be clear that my theory proposes that both the modern left and the right are forming in the aftermath of what we call political modernity. So it's a big misconception, for example, that the right actually truly was defending the ancient regime. By the time you saw something like a political right or reactionaries to the French Revolution, 
the ancient regime was already corrupted by modernity. Um, what is that, what does that mean? Can you can you clarify? Yeah, it well, means actually actually before before you clarify yeah. that, just just for absolute clarity, what do you mean by modernity? Because we're period sure, in this. Sure. And what do you so, mean by it being corrupted by modernity? So broadly speaking, uh, I tried to invoke just because I thought it wouldn't maybe it wouldn't be that contentious because Latour is not a right winger, but Bruno Latour's idea of modernity being defined by this dual thing of a process of purification where you're creating a supreme ontological zone that's chiefly um, negative in content and the other, right? So for example, man in general versus nature. That's Latour's favorite example because he's like a ecology guy. But you can also have it in terms of the um, Cartesian cogito or the reason of the rationalist era uh, and so on and so forth. But modernity, broadly speaking, refers to this abstract universalism that Latour refers to as a rupture in the continuity of time. It's this blind universalism that knows no distinction in content. So in the sphere of science, for example, scientific modernity, is we are not going to base our attitude toward the external world on any prior conventions or presumptions or superstitions. We begin totally from scratch a blank slate, and then we establish some method in order to uh, derive knowledge. So that's an example of the cut of modernity, that leveling. So in political terms, that is the universal man. That's the universal subject of the state, of the republic. Now, at first, you, you, of course... You, you have me at a disadvantage here because I don't know Latour. Um, but my immediate question is, since we're distinguishing between modernity and pre-modernity, if we'll allow that term... Um, by a rupture in time in which we have uh, a fresh start and we start deploying these hyper-rational schemes to sort of redefine everything going forward. Is that a fair characterization, more or less? Um, okay, okay, yeah, for purposes of moving it along, yeah. Sure. So what does that mean, though? Whose time is being ruptured? What, what like, position are we taking to make that assessment? Uh, like, are, are, we, are we taking a universal who's... stance, for example, or are we are we... Are we just, are we just asserting that we can't? Everything else is invisible. There is simply the the, the self purported act of universalizing, or something like that. Um, if you're, are you asking what are the origins of modernity? I don't. Your it's your question's not very clear to me. All right. Well, if modernity is defined by an attitudinal shift, right? No, I don't think so. Uh, well, when we're talking about, for example, like a, a rupture in time, we're not talking about like time as a metaphysical principle. We're talking about. I think I think so, actually, in many ways, because I think the emergence of capital does represent a, a kind of yes, metaphysical shift in how time. Um, what is time? How is it measured? The mode of production changes in such a way that leads to generalized commodity production. We are talking about the rise of a structure, an institution. We're not just talking about attitudes. We're talking about a fundamental change in. Well, uh, well sure, but institute. When, when, I, when I sorry, when, when I refer to time, I'm not talking about time as it is experienced or treated by institutions or by societies or by like just humans, even a, a, as a whole. What I'm talking about is like time, time, or whatever that is. Um, I think that's that, kind of too uh, in the weeds. As for I mean, I don't know how far you want to take this. Well, that's, time, kind of, that's, but... kind of, that's kind of important, though, because if this is the defining okay, moment that well, distinguishes the modern... I, I, would say, I would say the notion of time, the metaphysical time, um, it's, I don't think we, I can just take that for granted. Like, time... I mean, okay, well, for example, that's thrown into question by Einstein's uh, revolution in Well, like, like here, here, here's an example that comes to mind, and this goes a little bit uh, earlier than maybe you're, you're thinking of. But for example, one of the major moves that Machiavelli makes, um, uh, well, between uh, Machiavelli and Hobbes, is uh, Machiavelli conceives of um, change as being something that's sort of like, it, 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 there isn't a developmental orientation either within a political community in the sense of like uh, Aristotelian teleology, where a community develops in a particular direction. It can fail to, but it develops in a particular direction. Um, uh, 
it, it, in, instead you have just constant flux and then the the uh, job of the prince or the administrator or whatever is to respond um, appropriately and in a, in a savvy way to changes as they come about. And then you go on to Hobbes later on and he sort of recreates a teleology in a sense, except it ends up being an inevitable development arising from the content of individual subjects. That's the whole state of nature. We're in, we're in like a state of war. Um, and, and because of our internal drives, we yeah, he, he, states that it's our... he begins with a, a premise in some deeper substance, which is the content of that substance, by the way, is something kind of abstract because Hobbes, Hobbes doesn't be deeper substance. I think Hobbes is, is, is Hobbes explicitly, uh, removes multiple substances from his theory he's 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 very no i think black. his meth his methodological individualism is substantialistic because he's saying that the individuals basically this the leviathan is an em emergent thing out of these base substance of the individual self-interest not not really uh you're a little bit confused there so um the explanation for the emergence of the commonwealth that's as a result of the internal drives of individual subjects the leviathan isn't simply the commonwealth the leviathan is the person of the commonwealth so it's actually what, okay that it's is the body the from. body politic i don't know why that no, no it's, it's it's not the body politic though it's 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 a it's very much not. you said it's the person of the the sovereign yes yeah. so okay. the person is the person is the face of the thing it's, it's isn't that it's what the, body politic means no it's the it's the appearance of the body the body politic for example aristotle could refer to a political body in the sense of the politeia being the aggregate of the city no i i think you're confused about the historical usage of the term body politic which oftentimes does refer to the individual connection between the individual sovereign and the political community sure but not not in not in hobbes the leviathan is is the residue of of fading sense. That's why he introduces the, the term as a result of his psychology. So um, human beings enter into community with each other. Okay, but uh, don't you think, don't you think, even war, if you were correct on that, that. Yeah. even if you were correct on that, and just for the sake of the sure. debate, I don't know, I don't want to get into the weeds of it, but even if you were correct on that, what does that have to do with the point I was making? That Hobbes, there is a substantialism there because the political community that emerges uh, as you acknowledge, the Commonwealth is emergent from individual, some baser, deeper substance. Well, no, but he's he's not he's not Im he's not implying a substance, though. Um, okay. If, if anything, there are fewer substances in Hobbes than in other thinkers. This is why, when you go later on, he's talking. He he recapitulates um, or okay, that, reinterprets. That's just, the, that just hinges he reinterprets like biblical history in terms. But that just, that just hinges. Terms. That just hinges on a frivolous semantic uh, contention of whether or not you want to call indivi the individual of Hobbes a substance. The individual. Of Hobbes isn't a substance, though it's an individual. Well, it's a substance with regard to the Commonwealth. It's the substance of the Commonwealth is the individual. I mean, if you, if you want to speak loosely, sure. I guess it's like the the thing of which the the Commonwealth is is a composite. Okay, I mean, I just think it's really a frivolous point. I mean, what's isn't it? Don't you get to? Well, we're 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 trying we're trying to get at like like a, a rupture in time, and I've heard this language before, so it's not ridiculous. I okay. Just understand what you mean in particular by it. Because um, it's something we can't really skirt over. This seems to well. Be I think the the rupture in time is defined by instead of uh, more kind of cyclical or organic kind of uh, experience of time, you have one that is defined by a strict break from that continuity, um, almost like the year zero of the French Revolution. But it's not only a break in time; it's a more fundamental kind of universal abstraction with regard to reality that reduces the supreme essence of all reality to some kind of negation, some kind of negativity that's devoid of any particular determinate content. Who does that? That is what modernity is, historically. Uh, well, sure, but when, when you say historically, like you're, you're isolating that to a determinate point, so, so where, where's the break? That I think that's that's a, a very theoretically contentious argument among theor, uh, theorists in general. Like, when does it all begin? Uh, as someone who is uh, has an approach coming from the dialectical tradition, I don't think you can locate only a specific point, one specific point, 
just a transition from quantity to quality. So there's this broad historical movement toward uh, what we call the modern era. But modernity is never one place in time. It is a specific form of time. That's my argument. My argument isn't that this is when modernity begins. It's just that there is a specific form of reality or time or okay okay but the, the problem though yeah so it's the problem like for example happens. modernity is the d distinction between the pre-modernity and the modernity is a distinction always happening it's not just something that happened once and then we're postmodern after that sure so the the problem i'm running into though is that you described it as a rupture a rupture signifies yes. to me like an event so there's there's before the event there's the event, and there's after the event. It that doesn't, doesn't. That doesn't. That yeah, yeah. It's not simply a transition that yeah, is. I, I, I get. I get what you're saying. Places, right. Yeah. I get what you're saying, but to say modernity is a form, for example, of civilization and time, implies the rupture doesn't just happen once. The rupture is characteristic of. Um, Character is so. For example, what is the rupture of? the English Industrial Revolution. How do you, where do you locate that? Well, for example, maybe you can locate that in the enclosure movement, right? Maybe you can locate that in the English Civil War. It depends strictly on the frame of reference of what you're referring to as modern. So the well, rupture- sure. yeah, but this, this is the problem the rupture, periodization. The so political this, modernity, yeah. for example, the rupture of political modernity is 1789, the French Revolution. That marks, right? Is is that all modernity is? No, but but why would that be the rupture though? Like like for example, um, there is the 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 uh, radical restructuring of of the state and like from the 14th century to the 15th century, um, you you have. Uh, I, but a because it doesn't establish. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't establish the universal rights of man. Okay. Well, they kind of do, though. Like, like the major move that Hobbes introduced, or not Hobbes, sorry, God. the major move that Hobbes introduces um, is that the uh, the Didn't sovereign the, the sovereign is legitimized by reference to the consent of the governed, and he derives this by a radical reimagining of the human being as a machine. So he draws. No, a I, I'm not denying. Hold on. From... You just referenced the 14th century or something. Aren't we talking? Why are you talking about Hobbes? Oh, Hobbes, I, I'm, I'm talking about multiple things. So moving forward from there. Okay, political, but okay, the fear, I have acknowledged theories of mo uh, modern political theory. Yes, you can go back to Hobbes. You can go back to Hobbes. Obviously, that predates the French Revolution. But the French Revolution was the beginning of modern politics as an actuality, as a real uh form of politics okay, okay sure sure out. but the, it seems like the periodization is playing a really heavy structural role here um, why because you're defining it as, as as a rupture and an event this is this is how you're this is how you're describing modernity in the first place as as the the thing that corrupts. no i'm describing it as a specific way in which a civilization relates to itself in regards to its uh, its real content so for example uh, that can be in terms of time. It is in terms of time. That can be in terms of space. It is in terms of space. The West kind yeah, of even, even, sovereignty. Even, it can be with regard to culture. It can be with regard no, to... No, other... I, I understand. But but even in conceiving of a civilization, quote-unquote, as an enclosed whole that is capable, for example, of being corrupted in this way, in like a categoric sense, that's that's not an, an, an old notion. That's very recent. Um what what are, what are okay I, i'm sorry like i feel no. like this has gone into territory where can you please get to the point like what what are you what's the point what's your point let like, me just, let I, me interject really quickly if i'm sure so president sunday um mm -hmm. it seems to me that you are trying to point out a degree of arbitrarity in the definition of modernity obviously we're not um hard linguistic prescriptivists, if people want to use terms to describe specific time periods, um, that's fine. Why are you intent on undermining the certainty of the term? What are you, what, uh, what are you attempting to demonstrate? I'm actually not. Um, the reason okay. why I'm asking these questions is because he is defining uh, the, the switch to modernity in terms of an alteration to time. 
Um, I was paraphrasing Bruno Latour, who is the reason I invoked Latour is because I didn't want to get into the. If, I wanted to basically, okay, you understand this, the fact that it's acknowledged by people who you would consider to have authority and credentials that, that modernity is can be characterized as a rupture. These are qualities and attributes that are commonly and conventionally attributed to what modernity is. So let's get to the point. Well, yeah, but that's that's from from the present tense. We retrospectively categorize these things as being modern and pre-modern based on on different different criteria. But you in particular are referencing a, a rupture in time. No, I'm time itself. No, in a I'm, no I'm not. I'm just paraphrasing. By the way, Latour's whole argument in his book is we have never been modern. That's the book. But all I'm saying is this is what he, how he uh, paraphrases it. Now, I didn't know it would be so contentious, but why? what do you think are the stakes of that contention? I, I don't know. This isn't a book I've read, and I, I don't know so, how... But aren't we supposed to debate about theory? Like, what... Well, but your, your you theory, so I'm asking you clarifying questions so I understand where it is you're coming... Like, what are the building blocks of, of your theory here? So when you introduce, for example, the idea of the Ancien Regime already being corrupted by modernity, I don't know what that Yeah, means. okay, so let's go back to left and right, because that's what this is about, right? So... All I'm trying to say is that both the left and the right take as their premise some kind of abstract, universal form of politics. It is literally that simple, right? And I'm saying that it's commonly thought that the right represents the ancient regime. But the problem with that is that by the time the historical right emerges, the first form of which is the Thermidorian reaction, which was within the uh, bourgeois revolutionaries, yeah. The right, even if it appeals to defending the ancient regime, it has to do so according to the terms of political modernity. So, for example, the ancient regime has to be. De I wrote this in my Maga Communism Substack. Well, that, that's it why. That's why it's. That's why it's reaction. It's reacting to political. Stuff. But the but you're missing the point. Uh -huh. It has to adopt the language of the thing it's reacting to. It has to defend the old order in the language of the new order. So that's what I was referring to of the modern political right. It's not some real organic past of the ancient regime. It itself takes as its premise political modernity. That's all I was saying. Okay, sure, but what do you mean by political modernity then? Because you were laying in like all of this like like hyper specific. Um, okay, like, all I mean is the form of a modern universal state that knows no distinctions in terms of... Well, well what, what are you adding in when you say universal? A modern universal state, what do you mean? Okay, I was... I was oh, uh, sorry, please. Explaining please. That. Yeah, it knows no... It's political... It knows no distinction as far as its ultimate political subject. Now, it may add um, things, for example, okay, so this is the rights of man, but only white uh, land-owning males, whatever... But these are all provisions that have to be added in arithmetically um, and, and, and recognized later arbitrarily, right? Because modernity, political modernity begins when the subject of politics and the state is just this abstract individual, abstract individuality. I didn't, I didn't think that would be uh, contentious. What is the contention there? It's, it's, not, it's not that I have a specific contention. It's that in the course of giving a description of these things which form the building block of your theory, of your entire political universe, you introduce things that you, you do not really define. Um, okay. Or if well, you do define them, you, you define them in terms of things that beg like just a, a massive amount of, of specification. Well, I, I mean, still have think, no idea what you mean by that. So I have to explain this to you. The buck has to stop somewhere as far as where we can come to an agreed upon understanding. So most people I, who don't intentionally want to be pedantic would recognize, okay, I get what you mean, Haas. Political modernity okay. is this um, Haas. Haas. universal I, modern state. 
Okay. So Look, I, I agree with right. you. I agree with you. I okay. agree with you. But I have to so point out. But I have to point out. It is you who has written quote partisanship can also be defined by a specific Hegelian sublation of established political distinction representing a type of political subject interpolated by a new form of universal statehood, the Kajevian Empire, polarity, or determinate globality. Okay, unquote. sure. And okay, so you, you want me see to explain why I'm a little that? lost here, please. So you want me to explain that? Okay, you okay, can. You? That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So the reason I say it's a sublation isn't because it eliminates it's not a negation that destroys right. the distinction it's a, a sublation. sublation destroys and preserves yeah okay good so it doesn't destroy the old thing it um it re uh recontextualizes it is another way you can look at it into a new form so the partisan i argue for example resolves the contradiction that gives rise to the right because of its telluric, it's rooted in the deeper order of rural life. The modern right attempts to contrive some law, uh, order, some logic based on uh, universal political modernity to justify uh, hierarchies, to establish the relation between people, things, people to things and other people, right? Um, okay, but, but telluric, telluric in this case, doesn't just refer to the rural, right? Telluric refers to like of the land generally, so it can refer to. Um, yeah, but which is but even in, Schmidt like, makes it clear. And... Yeah, but Schmidt makes it clear what relation the partisan, owing to their telluric character, has to r the rural masses. Okay, because he's he's talking about. See, I have to give this context. Schmidt was a German, who was fighting partisans in World War Two. So his theory of the partisan was made from the perspective of a guy who was engaged no, no, Schmidt, Schmidt wasn't fighting partisans sorry way. sorry he was part of the German state that was fighting against he was he was he was the like the the principal political theorist of the Nazi state yeah yeah but he was he had some post he occupied I'm pretty sure he occupied some post in the German state but he was making that text from the perspective of the Nazis who were Engaged in the counter theory, theory of the partisan is, is long after this. Theory of the partisan is, is after. Okay, can you can you just let me finish? Sure, go on. As I pointed out, Schmidt's theory of the partisan was made from the perspective of the Germans engaged in counterpartisan operations. How do I know this? Because I, as I argued in the text, he only defines the partisan negatively with regard to how it forms an opposition to uh, the state. For example, well, that's not strictly true because he gives positive criteria for them. That's where you're getting the whole Tellurian. The positive uh, criteria is the positive criteria is a series of negative characteristics. Tellurian's not negative. Tellurian's uh, pretty particular and positive. It's 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 assigning a, a no a, no it's not Tellurian. To to, Tellurian could be easily identified, for example, from Schmidt's perspective as being outside of the urban logistical center of operation. Well, yeah, but I mean, you could do that it's the same with the urban as well. It's just any positive statement is the negation of its opposite. Well, I have a... Well, that's why sublation is important for me, because I don't do what Schmidt does. I situate the partisan as the subject of a civilizational polarity, which is engaged in a process of revolutionary change to realize itself, but at the same time represents a definite particular content of a civilization, and therefore... Uh, the deeper order. But how's how's that revolutionary though? You're anchoring it to that which has come before. You're anchoring it to an institution, which incidentally no, no, is mirrored no, no. off of the closed whole uh, model. It's not. Theory. It's not an institution. It's not an institution. Well, what is it then? So I try to define polarity uh, earlier in my introduction, but basically, to me, civilizations, although they do change and they do fuse together and they're not eternal, change at a um, scale that is not reducible to the whims of modern individual consciousness or ideology or anything like that. So my theory is that civilizations undergo a process of reproduction. And uh, that tendency toward reproduction of the civilization can what be is... defined as the source of the polarity. Okay. You're so the partisan okay, is an, an agent Sorry, partisan is a subject of that polarity. They are partial toward the realization of a specific um, civilization whose premises are now in existence, yes. But it's not just the past. It's not the past.
Okay, you're going to have to explain this. Civilizations reproduce. What do you mean? A drawing from. Uh, so my idea is that civilizations undergo a cyclical process of re of destruction and rebirth. That you can witness, for example, let's say the good example of this is the Chinese civilization. There are various dynasties characterizing Chinese history, but there's somewhat a, there's a continuity of Chinese civilization, and these dynasties mark the points of the destruction and rebirth of at least the form of the civilization. But there's still a continuity across time. So I argue that has a deeper um, that to me there's a deeper objectivity of civilizations. It's not reducible to an institution. Okay, so so to be clear, this isn't you're not drawing on anybody for this. This is just you. Um, I don't, I don't, not any one person in particular, no. But there's, you know, it's pretty much a conventional view in China among Chinese scholars. Um, and yeah, there's the Dugan guy who will also talk about the different logos of civilizations. There's um. Okay. There's uh, uh, what's this? What is a civilization, Huss? To what me, a civil. To? What? What? What is, what is it? What is it? Okay. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Sure, yeah. So to me, a civilization is a specific way in which the contradiction, and contradiction may be a bad word, the distinction between the state and the civil society can be reproduced independently. So a civilization reproduces the distinction between the state and the civil society. For example, uh, if a political community is reducible just to the state, and if the state collapses, it all balkanizes, that's not a civilization, right? If the state collapses and a unity of the people can be reestablished, to me that proves there is an underlying civilization over which the state presides. Well, the state presides over a civilization now? Civilizations usually include states, don't they? They can. I mean, what? But but civilizations can also um, have a, for example, can be encompassed by an empire, which is a state, unless you don't want to call that a state. I really don't. So an empire is not a state. Well, I don't. I don't even know what a state means in this. I, I'm. Okay. Do you think there's, there's, a there's so many? Every every time okay, we okay, peel sure. back, there's so like let's, a million okay. different things that seem to have the so same structure. So would you characterize? The Qing Dynasty as a Chinese civilization. I, I'm. I don't necessarily buy into the category of civilization as a as a meaningful term. Um, it seems to be trying to group a whole bunch of really disparate things together for the sake of uh, a categorization scheme that I just I just don't think holds water. Like what? What's the content of civilization? Like what I, do you mean? How do you, you mean, can like, have any mean, meaningful? Do you mean pottery? Do you mean political have, forms? What do you how mean? How can you have any meaningful understanding of history if you don't acknowledge there are different civilizations? The the civilizational framework is really recent. It hasn't. It, it's it, history does not rely upon it at all. For example, there there are historical frames of reference that solely focus on the the history of particular uh, politics. So there's no the Egyptian Indies, civilization. There's no Incan civilization. There's no Chinese civilization. Well, what's the what is here? Here, answer me this. What is the distinction between, let's say, Egyptian civilization, and an Egyptian state or the Egyptian state, if you will? The yeah, as you said, the Egyptian state is part of the civilization. But you said a state presides over a civilization. Why can't it be both at the same time? Why can't it? I mean, like because because if a state presides so, over so, civilization, that implies that civilization is subsumed okay, so under. To, to give this uh, a body politic analogy, a head is part of a body while at the same time, in some sense, presiding over the body. I don't know why that's such a hard thing to understand. Well, because you're you're, you're waffling between referring to the body as the head and vice versa. No, I'm the head is part of a body. That's the <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, is. it is yeah it is yes it is okay. Okay, okay, sure, but so like, so what's the problem? I just think I feel like this is extremely. The problem like, is that when we're when we're if if, if, if we're if we're treating these things as parts of the same body, then if multiple states are different agencies with their own, you know, deliberate action in the world and and whatever, um, 
the, the analogy breaks down. You can't say that like a state presides over a civilization, which also involves other states, but then somehow these are still- No, I, okay, hold on. A state can preside over a civilization of which it is a part. Could I interject momentarily? Wait, sure. I think, and I can, I can see where the schism here is. I think the problem is that the term civilization doesn't overlap cleanly with a lot of other terms we use. Obviously, a civilization and a state don't perfectly coincide. Uh, some people use civilization to refer to, like, ethnic groups, but we have the Chinese civilization, which is multi-ethnic. The Persian Empire was a civilization. Obviously, that was multi-ethnic with all the territory they had, the Greeks, you know, so on. Um, and what's more, it seems like there are weird ethnographic, cultural, and sometimes class biases in how we apply it. The Cherokee uh, Native Americans, for example, are rarely called a civilization, even though there were more of them and they were more organized than some other societies that we referred to as a civilization in retrospect. So I guess my confusion, and I share President Sunday's in this, what criteria would you use to describe a civilization, Haas? Like what, um, if there was a line, and obviously it's always a bit emergent, but if there was a line or like a, a, a point you could build it around, what would distinguish it from a nation, a state, sure. an ethnography. I think, I think civilizations have the capacity to independently give rise to states from the civil society itself. So that's what I would say is a civilization. Wait, they from can the civil give, society? Wait, what's yeah. the civil society? A civil society characterized by, established by convention or mores or tradition, specific way in which groups of people, and I think that's an important uh, distinction groups of people not just one type of people relate to each other right so for example oftentimes trade relations between different tribes is become conventional in some okay. way here i'm just going to interject, interject right away here so the problem we're running into is that you're treating civilization consistently with how other people treat civilizations where it's something that sort of uh o o extends over state differences but then you say it arises from from civil society and then you locate that in groups so the no, problem relations. is you're, you're no no it's the deep thick texture of relations between different groups not just different groups okay but within this texture of relations there are firm distinctions between groups that have differences in 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 practice and locality and sure but like that. but those eventually historically speaking sometimes at least evolve into common civilizations because they give birth to common states sometimes at least okay but if if different groups form civilizations and then give rise to states how then do states preside over civilizations which give rise to the components that give rise to them I mean, that's dialectics. It's just like that. That's, that's, I don't think that's dialectics. I think it's just a loop. It's, dialectics it's is not, when, dialectics is when, no, no, dialectics is when you two, have. You're talking about two things that are inexorably connected together. They are, um, okay. Well, you can say they're not, but I, I don't, but I mean, the, why, but hang on, the explanation you gave isn't inexorable. Not, they could just, see, they could just not yeah. interact this way. I don't see how it's impossible for a, um, civilization to give rise to a common empire which therein presides over said groups and which you know participates in this dialectic where that extends the empire beyond the form of the state which gives rise to an even bigger empire i mean that's how the that's the history of all the land and land empires of asia all the land empires i can think of throughout Asia. that's how it yeah, but, but these these were these were hegemonic relationships between states this this wasn't just like uh what 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 well we're talking about empires in we're not talking about different empires right now like like at the same time sure but we're talking like, about the process by which single empires form that's all we're talking but about. they they form though by by conquering each other by coercing each other into into entering into a hegemonic relationship yeah but then when they conquer each center. other oftentimes what happens is that the existing form of the prior empire cannot contain the new relations established between the peoples, and that gives rise to a new empire. So I don't know what the problem is. Yes, it's a dialectic. No, no, a, a dialectic would be if you have. No, it's a, a dialectic. Like for but example, that's not that's not a dialectic though. Like a, a dialectic is when you have a relationship between two things where they 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 change one another by 
by the interaction and then a new plateau is set and then that continues in that way a, a dialectic is not just you have like multiple things that happen to relate to each other in some way dude what are you talking about i mean like like okay if you want okay if you know about marxism everyone knows about marxism now there's the relations of production and then the forces of production there's the base and the superstructure yeah the but you're, that's not that's not dialectical you're, you're just talking about a flat schema a dialectic goes back to Kant. yeah it's not it's, you know why it's not dialectical sunday because you just interrupted me that's why it's not dialectical because if you would have let me continue I would make it not I dialogical but continue okay no it's not dialectical because you literally cut me off and isolated something that was not given it's no, no, see, the escalation complete. of the conversation to a fight now no no sunday sunday i was i was uh, planning on um speaking a sentence and then you cut the sentence off in one place and put a period there and that would not have been a dialectical thing i but the sentence wasn't finished okay so what i was going to say is that at a certain point the forces of production outmode the relations of production at a certain point the base outmodes the superstructure the superstructure which court which presides over a base um changes to correspond to the new circumstances so that's dialectics so i'm saying the same thing happens with civilizations it's the same dialectical logic of two things that depend on each other which also correspond to their mutual transformation well, we're, trying, so we're trying to we're trying to justify the category of civilization here not not talk about all right you know what it's like okay so we're clearly not going to agree about whether civilizations exist i think you're just kind of arbitrarily preventing yourself from being no it's it's just that it's just that your explanation no, no, no. it's just an I, extremely I, pedantic no i'm not trying to be objection. pedantic i'm trying to understand okay i'm trying to understand your logic here but the problem though is that when you explain it it's circular so you start off with states and you no, go you don't, something I didn't say you started off with but anything. then you but then you refer to civil no, society you don't, and then refer you don't back into states off, hold on nobody said you start off with anything we are talking any given thing that you take in context is has a history, long history of a dialectic between states and civilization. Now, states have not always existed. So there has emerged a state at some point in history from But doesn't that mean that statement is false then? Not, not everything emerges, emerges that way. States aren't ubiquitous in history. States have emerged in history, which means states have not always existed. What's contentious about that statement? There, there's nothing. But if you're going to make a, a, a statement about how uh, states are what give rise to civilizations, you can't do that if you're going to write civilizations that pre-exist the state. But no, but something very, so a specific kind of interaction happens between different peoples, which you can say is a proto-civilization that gives rise to a state. So what's hard about that to understand? I'm, 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 my, my arsenal of, I mean, it's like, these, to it's explain like is, is running I, th away. I think you should have like a very rigid, like, like mechanical understanding of how this kind of works. You're talking about things that are working together in tandem, like the aspiration toward the common state is something that's happening in tandem with the very thing, with the very developments that give rise to its own premises. It's not like one precedes the other in a strict oh. way. You're talking about well, well, no, but they have to though if the explanation of one is contingent on the other. No, they don't have to. Um, they doesn't have to be a strict if line. It's, if it's contingent, on, if something is contingent on something else, it can't pre-exist the thing it's contingent on. So I think this is a really kind of silly semantic point you're trying to raise where you're basically saying you if you can't if you can't define something apps like okay well we're, we're mean, debating we're debating your political theory. okay, okay you can't define a component of it no, no no this is like this is like when you would say like okay how do you this is the thing that makes an apple right okay well not all apples will perfectly conform to that so therefore apples aren't real it's like it's kind of a really pedantic i, I don't see the point of what you're getting at really well, no, no, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, if you're saying here, this is an apple, it, it, it grows. Okay, for, forget it, forget about apples before everyone who's watching this. Um, I think, I think, I think we're past that point, Haas. So, okay, so I'm going to just try to bring this to some kind of sanity. So you asked me to define what a civilization is. I tried to give you my definition of that. This seems to it seems to bother you that this means that somewhere along the line in the emergence of the state and the emergence of civilizations, 
um, that that happened. Now, I'm not exactly sure what the problem is that civilizations give rise to states which correspond, which, sorry, which um, preside over the civilization or represent the culmination of that civilization at that moment in time. And then there, but that's also entangled in a process where eventually the state can be outmoded by the inner development of the civilization. And it's a reciprocal dialectical process across history. I think that makes perfect sense to me. Um, you have not really given me a clear objection to, you haven't really clearly um, defined your objection. No, I just, I have to wonder, like, do you actually want your argument to be understood? Because this is, this is this is unintelligible. So, okay, what, what, wait, where wait, are you wait, struggling? wait. This isn't a matter of semantics. We're we're running up on the the limit of words and phrases we can combine to move any further on this specific topic, no matter how long we spend on it. What is the next criticism that you would like to bring forward, President Sunday? Oh, this isn't a matter of anyone being more right or wrong. It's just, I think we could do this for another hour, two, three, maybe a day. Please, for the love of God, no. Okay, so to that point, civilizations, if you'd like to use an analogous term, Oz, is there anything that you think would be appropriate? Do you think, for example, the use of the term nation, state, culture, anything like that, civil society, would that I, be I acceptable? I couldn't do that in good faith because I think that the, the form of the nation state is a modern form, and I think civilizations refer to something deeper. Okay. And I think the homogeneity and so on um, associated with the term nation would not correctly characterize what a civilization is. So, yeah, so this is why this is why time becomes really super important actually, because when he's talking about deeper, he's talking about something that transcends the rupture of modernity from pre-modernity. He's talking about this this is again why he's like um really emphasizing the partisan understood as as a, yeah, as okay. a purely sure. telluric thing. We can begin there. Sure. There's so there's a common understanding. You get at least the point that I think there's something fundamental about civilizations that survives modernity, despite the rise of them, the pretense to the rise of modern nation states and the modern state. There's some deeper texture of um, relations between people that manages to skirt by under the radar and survives the rupture of modernity. So you get that point. That's great. So let's talk about the criticism. Well, the, the immediate criticism would be that the categorization scheme of civilizations in the first place is itself a product of modern thinking. It's not something that's consistent with how people conceive themselves or conceive groups historically. But, so when you group people into civilizational categories and you attach the things that, that modern civilizational theorists from Spengler through Toynbee to Huntington, et cetera, do, um, you're not actually pointing to something deeper. You're pointing to a construction that is distinctly modern itself. But it's only distinctly modern because before where it had been taken for granted, now for the first time it's being... But it, was, it wasn't taken for granted though. It wasn't. But I'm um, arguing it was. I'm arguing that the fact that for the first time we're talking about civilizations in general and modernity, that doesn't mean that civilizations had no meaningful reality before. It's just that they were never... I, I, I'm, I'm really um, being charitable with the assumption that Nobody ever referred to civilizations in the past. Something I highly well, they, doubt. they didn't like like what civilization used to refer. To, I, I really of, sort of that. no. It's I sort really of actually that, no. No, right? you can you can even see it in the etymology of the term. It, it's it refers to a process. For example, we don't it, refer to, no, no. We don't we don't, uh, to, we don't refer to we don't refer to like I don't know. It would be like statization or something. We refer to states. We just refer to states. It's just a it's just a noun. Civilization refers to to a process. It's like education. Um, okay, so it doesn't. It okay. Or amelioration. It doesn't strictly refer to any of those things. I'm just gonna call press X to doubt on the idea that no one's. No, ever it read. doesn't. But what happens though? What happens though is from the vantage point of certain very like geographically localized thinkers. There's a reason most of these guys are German. Um, they they start conceiving of the developments of things like art, music, different political okay, forms, sure. Look, 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 look. Let's just and, let's just. Let's just, um, for the sake of time, and for the sake of everyone. No, being... no, but but the point I'm getting at, though, the the point okay. I'm getting at, though, so the, the is point that is, there is there is a modernity, chronological development okay. in these things. In modernity, people start that talking about the lies, the staticness okay. that you're okay. attaching. A lot to. of a lot of things are given 
are elevated into the status of uh, general treatment with the rise of modernity. So we treat civilization, the idea of civilization emerges, civilization in general, class, class in general, as a general thing emerges for the first time, right? Uh, commodity form, the universal commodity form. I mean, I mean, like the, the Marxist understanding of class. I don't think class categorically does. No, like like the Marxist are, understanding are of class. Yes, is a scientific, very strict scientific definition. Well, well no, no. But the, the 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 Marxist understanding of class is oriented around um, like a, a specific economic form that's fairly recent. But the idea of classes is not new. The, okay, look, you, look, you look. Classes I'm, I'm trying, uh, dude, dude, dude. Uh, Sunday, I'm trying so hard, so hard. To help you understand this, something can become intelligible only in modernity that is revealed to have always existed in the past. But not if its terms are themselves modern products, because at Why that point not? you're not. Because hold on. Because at that point you're not revealing. Dude, you're not revealing. Dude, you're not revealing dude, an eternal fixture dude, of the world. What you're doing is you're redescribing for, things dude, in terms about that are intelligible to world, a modern okay? thinker. But that's not. Frederick, okay, dude. Frederick Engels says that there was commodity production in uh, ancient Greece, okay? okay? Now, is there any general like notion of the commodity, um, not only in terms of a concept, like the abstract universal commodity, but even in practice in terms of production? No, Marx says- Well, there might have the, been, the, the economics was lost. But, Marx yeah. says that the anatomy of an ape is revealed through the anatomy of a man. So that's, a, that's clear in the logic of Marx. So you, please go argue with Marx about it because you seem to have trouble with this idea that we can, we can, um, things can become intelligible to us that we just took for granted before and never really subjected to any critical interrogation. Oftentimes, we name things because they're no longer given to us. If it's totally given to us, we don't. Well, need why, to no, but why? Why would you assume just out of hand that what we name retroactively is therefore given to us? I don't assume that out of hand, but I think in the case of civilization, I do think civilization refers to a meaningful reality and not just some made-up construct by Germans in the 19th century. Okay, but but even even so, like the ones even the ones of which we have like an, an acute and, and and robust literary awareness of, like for example, like Greeks and whatnot. There, there is this is this is an amalgamation of of, of many different sources that that very much cross civilizational bounds. At every at every level of resolution, from I, I don't know what you're trying to, to religion. say. I mean, what what do you mean? An amalgamation of different. I mean, I mean the notion of I mean the notion of civilization only has the applicability that you're assigning to it on the basis of ignoring the things that make it fail to apply. What makes it fail to apply? Because as an entity, civilization implies differentiation between civilizational groups, but in when we actually look very carefully, we don't see. No, no. Civilization can be understood strictly in terms of the its own imminent development. It doesn't necessarily have to create. But a it's. Strict... But but you're saying it's. Sunday, Sunday, as, as opposed to the imminent development of another. It, so you no, are differentiating it, them in that way. Sunday, Sunday. It you're doesn't putting like a need firm to... wall between one civilization and another. Civilization. That's precisely what it does not need to imply. It just that's, needs. That's to imply... literally its purpose. No, it needs to just imply different centers. There are people on the border. Which civilization are they a part of? It's ambiguous, but there's different centers that clearly um, are not the same okay, as but, each other. But, but hang on, careful. Where is the center with respect to what? What defines the center? It's the periphery, right? Let's say so you're the, implying a line. Okay, so it, this seems to be lost on you that things can be um, intelligibly different without precluding a strict bright line, bright line rule, because they're different in terms of tendencies and orientations, not necessarily different in terms of one strict differentiation, one border, one wall. It's just that these are intelligibly different orientations and, ten and tendencies. I would like to so, interject. Okay, let, 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 just to illustrate it's, the absurdity of okay, what's... Yeah, of go what's, ahead. Then I'll... Because I think yeah. I think we've, we've actually regressed so, back to a previous topic that we were... So I, I, I'm just, I just would find it indefensible to say that Indian civilization and Chinese civilization are the exact same. There's no meaningful difference between them because on the border between India and China, there are synchro synthetic, com syncretic communi communities that are profoundly influenced by both. 
I don't think it's fair to say that China and India are then the same historically. Well, that, that's not the implication of anything that I was. I think it is though, because you're saying. Well, no, no, it's no, it's well. Hang on, no, no, it's not though. The argument is not that there is no differentiation um, that can even be tracked geographically. The argument is that you no, draw I'm not talking about calling... geographically. Why are you putting words in my mouth? I never said anything about geographically. I said the people living on that border. You're, people, when you're talking right? about a, when you're talking about a border and a periphery, that's that's a geographical distinction. Yeah, but the the but because civilizations are about relations between people, you're trying to say that oh, but because people they... people live in places, right? Like, like like they they dude, I just find this like a bafflingly pedantic. Wait, if, so wait, wait. If I, I, I'm trying to make, I, I would like to impose, if I may, an analogy. The the best thing, if I'm understanding this, and correct me if I'm wrong, the best thing that I can think of is that, in a lot of ways, it's kind of similar to um, a medieval kingdom in Europe, where when we look on uh, maps made at the time, you can see distinct lines, which uh, you know, oh, across this river and this forest and such and such, but in reality where each kingdom began and ended was really ambiguous. There was no border between the two, obviously. Um, there wasn't a, a customs agency. There were just villages, and those villages would be taxed by the nearest lord or king or whatever. And um, sometimes the same village would get taxed twice over by the two adjacent competing lords. And there was no consistency. But, and I think President Sunday is getting at this, the Distinction here is that while we can acknowledge ambiguity, while we can acknowledge uh, a fluidity at the borders, there is still a central concept that this is orienting around, right? The idea of the lordship, of the aristocracy of the kingdom. There's something there that you can point to and go, okay, well, the lines aren't clear, but this is what we're drawing the definition around. And I think he's confused about that center point when it comes to civilization. If it's not ethnicity, if it's not a state, if it's not citizenship, there's something else, something more fundamental that you're getting at. Yeah, um, well, I'm just referring to, I'm not, but the problem, I think that implies um, unnecessarily a kind of mechanical logic when I, you could just say it's a specific relationship between peoples that has a tendency to give rise to a common polity or a common state. And I think that's just because it implies a relation between two variables doesn't mean that those variables have to be fully developed at any point in time, rather than part of an inexorably uh, dialectical, dialectical maybe, line. Maybe part of the problem we're running into here is when I'm referring to civilization, um, like when I'm referring to how civilization is used, I'm referring literally to how it's how it's been used in in, in civilizational theory. So, for example, in in a, in a Spenglerian mode, it becomes like an or, an almost organic phenomenon where you have a a, a so here's, life here's, cycle. Here's how hang I'll on, hang on, pause. Just one okay. one goddamn second. You have a you have a life cycle where our artistic and and cultural and whatnot things develop to a certain like flourishing point and then die out. And there is there is an implicit there, there, there's a hole here that's being invoked. There is a kind yeah. of thing that grows, flourishes, dies. So when we're talking about civilization, we're talking about a process that has been captured within an, an entity that embodies the life cycle of that process. That is still going to occupy a specific geographical area. So when we're talking about Greek civilization or something like that, we are talking about that thing as described, but taking place between, uh, taking place within an, a, a, uh, a, a a biome established by the presence of, of Greek states and things like that. Um, you seem to be wanting to imply that this thing is, is, is in some sense pr both prior to but also posterior to political developments on the ground so that it survives the, the radical social change that is itself responsible for giving rise to civilizations this is the rupture with modernity so so I'll, that's where i'm kind of perplexed because yeah. it seems to be going in a circle okay well since you don't understand dialectics i'll just reframe it so you can understand it better i guess if you want me to define civilization in a way that maybe would be less contentious to you then i would just take it at the level of what i would consider to be the unit of the civilization which is oftentimes the agrarian the small holding kind of agrarian uh unit of subsistence defining a village or a family or even an individual which is in the actual subject of for example the empire 
And the ability for that unit to organically not only reproduce itself, but the implicit myriad of relations that it implies toward others around it, to me, is what defines a civilization. Kind of like a will to being. I think, if I'm hearing this correctly. At any rate, we'll have to well, move past I, I that know, point. I don't know what that... I'm talking that, that, about... That completely threw me off. I think we're both lost. Okay, so a specific <laughs> unit of human subsistence, which implies a definite division of labor, a specific relation of the, the family, for example, a relation to uh, outsiders, how outsiders are treated, how people... Wait, wait, uh, wait but Haas, Haas, if yeah. it's comprised of discrete units, then you lose the ability to then gradated at the border this this now becomes like a homogenous entity with firm borders this becomes like a modern state we're not talking about a civilization anymore no it's a civilization because we're talking about how these units are reproduced but but the the identity of the units remains homogenous because we're talking about the unit not of this civilization no not not necessarily it's not necessarily uh, it's just a unit of the subsistence. It's just Marxism, like the mode of production. How do people reproduce themselves? Uh, how do they? What are their but, conditions of subsistence and their conditions of production, for example? Okay, okay, but like, like, states. and how is that re? How is that reinforced and reproduced? States Not only at the level of the superstructure of the state, but at the level of the superstructure of what Hegel will call, for example, civil society, family life culture the thick text of norms and sure, so on sure sure but but that reproduction and what is being reproduced is going to differ between that which is within the state and for example that which is not within the state that is that which is like sort of situated between states say what um, what do you mean what do you mean what do i mean you're saying it's going the what? How, how 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 a state like a discrete state within a civilization reproduces itself is not going to be identical or synchronous with how another state within that civilization reproduces itself. Um, but the they're different, specific, they're different it, states, right? But hold on. But if those states are defined by a specific determinate relation toward one another, that would be included in the form of subsistence and reproduction, uh, comprising an overall civilization. If states are defined by by their relationship to each other, yeah, that if, might that if, might work in the context of like a modern. You're you're uh, already saying, dude. You're no, already no, no, no. That, that 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 could work within the context states. of like a modern state that only exists by, no, by dude, the fiat dude, dude, of surrounding dude, nations. But if we're like, talking, I'm, for example, about this, like this the Prussian just, state of Hegel, we're talking about something that that exists by reference to to its own internal. I'm literally leveling with you. I'm following you down the whole hallway of bullshit you want to go down. You said states, states within a civilization. Well, if they're, or if they're part of the same civilization and there's multiple states, I don't know what you mean by that. Maybe like um, how there well, are that's, different. That's that's the you're, you're begging the question. How there are different like, principalities there, that are part of. I'm uh, not. I'm not asserting. I'm not. I'm not asserting. I don't even know what you're talking about in that. But case. I'm. I'm trying to level with you right now. No, no, so sure, sure, sure. No, no, no. I, I understand. Here's, here's, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to. Here's the truth of this debate. I have followed you through down this path of complete pedantic jibber-jabber just to level with you so we can establish a common meaning to have a debate. I've been very generous about, you know, defining things for you and trying to work with you to come to a common understanding, but you keep trying to obscure it into these increasingly no, no, frivolous I'm, I'm not. and obscure, it's just that you're, it's just that you're, it's just that, no, 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 jibber -jabber no. Debate. it's like, just that when, when I ask you, what's when I ask problem? you to, no, 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 it's just when I ask you to explain something, you refer it to, another thing that stands equally in need of explanation like, like, but that's how everything it's not, is it's going not... to work so the buck has to stop somewhere everything's going to work with like that if i try to explain to you okay what is an apple it's a fruit well What's no no fruit? because because look 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 because you know what I mean? like, it's going to keep going forever no no so but what, what you could do and right? no, but hang on hang on what, what you could do bullshit and i'm not i'm not bullshitting you what you could do and what most political theorists like actually do is they will contextualize their work within the, like the domain of a specific theory, and they will say very specifically what they mean. I am leveraging this particular definition. No, they don't. This I includes have, X, Y, and Z of qualities, all and the move on from that there. But you're universal. None have, none have been tormented and um, annoyed with this demand of such like micro specific. Like what exactly? No, no, wait, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. That's it. 
That's it. Next point. Whatever ambiguity remains in this subject will have to linger in your hearts, okay? It will burn at you in every moment that passes. I will not hear the word civilization again or I'll start muting people. Please, God, to another point. We are okay, two hours. Gosh. We are Hang two on, hours. In. No, 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 wait, 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 What's my objection? Yes. Oh, oh, fuck. We're doing this. Okay. I thought we were. I thought we were going off entirely, and I feel like I'm out of seconds now. Fuck. Yeah, you're getting there. What? What is the concern? The civilizational model does That's not have what wide up. No, no. Go ahead. Just and then we're moving. Does not have. Does not have universal uptake among political theorists. So if you're going to assert it, and you're not going to specify which civilizational model you're deploying, then it's the you have to expect, model. you have it's, to expect, no, Marx doesn't, just have the a, Marxist model. Marx doesn't have a visualization I am, I am making literally no comment on the degree of perceived or actual ambiguity or consistency on any of these terms. I am making a comment on, we're moving forward. You, you must account for this inconsistency in, 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 in the dream world. It can no longer be here. I'm, okay. I feel like if we chart the conversation we've sure. had this far, without, we're like one fifth word, down the document. Yeah, without using that word, I guess the point that we were supposed to be debating about here is whether or not there are um, patterns in terms of ways of life, conventions, um, culture, and ways of living, I got already said that, that survive modernity which at least rhyme with ones that existed before modernity and which may or may not um, be subsumed under the category of a common civilization. Sorry, I'm not going to say the word. So that's what we're supposed to be uh, debating about. Okay, and, and, and as this is a critique being levied by President Sunday, you have, I assume, notes. What is the next point that you would like to get to? It may, it may be predicated on having arrived at a conclusion here, but in the absence of a conclusion, we're just going to have to make it work. I don't know, man. Like, the, the problem we're running into here is that the point of reference that I have, which is the only point of reference I was given for Haas's political theory, um, it incrementally builds to the conclusion that uh, of the whole MAGA communism thesis on the grounds that it is... Or I guess maybe being charitable has like the potential. We should to be just debate about that. Let's just go with the MAGA communism thing. Yeah, but the problem though is that you get there by by using a bunch of building blocks that we can't find any agreement on. So no, I mean, I'm, we I'm can. willing, I don't I'm, think it's I'm go willing to commit to retracing my steps in the form Wait. of this debate for how we get to MAGA communism. So we don't. I don't have to invoke any of the things that confuse you, like certain C words that happen to. Like we don't have to use any of those words. Let's just get into the meat and potatoes. Why MAGA communism? You can we can just debate about that. How about that? Sure, but it's just gonna you're just gonna pitch it. Is the go ahead, whatever. Okay, well you you have a critique. So do you want to give a broad? Well, the, the, the 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 critique is in how you get there. Like the thesis is absurd by itself. Okay, um, well now let's talk about that then. What is your sure. objection to the thesis? Well, my objection to the to the project that 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 seems reasonable on its surface, like if you can find a way to creatively um, redirect mega rhetoric towards uh, growing the left or towards like leftist goals, that sounds eminently. That's not, but that's not what I say. I know it's not. What you do instead is you actually redirect leftist language to promote Trumpism in the hopes that some of them will into your stuff and well i don't know what you mean by trumpism but if you're just referring to the vaguely the maga movement then yes my my argument isn't that i want to um just convert maga people to leftism i want the context and meaning of communism to be rediscovered in what i consider to be america's most powerful counter hegemonic movement despite all of um the ambiguities within it 
I, I was a counter hegemonic. Sure, I mean, uh, we I, can mean be... I mean, like, like, like a, 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 a premise of it is is a whitewashing of American history to get rid of uh, so criticism great. of. So great. That's beautiful ground we can begin with. I consider right. it counter hegemonic because I think the MAGA movement has been primarily defined not by any specific positive goal or ideology or policy, but by a collective distrust toward hegemonic institutions of our liberal democracy. That's why I consider it counter-hegemonic. The content of that counter-hegemony uh, doesn't even need to be anything I agree with. It's just the only thing that is true, though, that I find relevant here to qualify it as counter-hegemonic is that it's built on collective distrust toward the institutions of our society. But practically every political movement is built built off of distrust of institutions of modern society, and in, including I disagree. The, I don't think all the non mega leftists, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think okay. What other movement? Even even, even the even the glasses wearing uh, like like people embedded in in universities and whatnot. They're they're predated upon by administrators and things of the sort. Nobody trusts. The, the no, I think they do trust um, you're, you're the mainstream because the universities are one such institution, by the way. That's an example of the institutions of society. So you can say those institutions well, may be self well, no, no, but, but the, the bare fact that an inst the bare fact that somebody in interfaces with an institution in society as a part of their job doesn't mean that they therefore trust the integrity of, of that institution. Um, well, for I example, well, well, for example, like like institutions are straighted between uh administrators who, who are not necessarily teachers or academics and academics who are often thwarted or or, or bullied by those okay or vice versa like there, for example a lot be, of a lot of women's studies yeah. departments were able to be uh, sure there can be were able context. to be just hang, hang on a sec were able to be negotiated on the grounds that some professor or someone somewhere uh was was caught quite literally with his pants down in some in some scandal and so to cover it up they're like here, here i'll tell you what you shut so up i'm not i'm not we'll denying the possibility so -so. of conflicts okay. within institutions but i think broadly speaking and there's of course individual exceptions and everything but broadly speaking people who earn their living on the basis of working for these institutions tend to have a worldview defined by broadly speaking trust toward the integrity of the hegemony overall and yes, of the ruling institutions of society. But then why is the big bugbear of, of the mega movement critical theory? It's in the name. They're, they're, they're critical. What are they critical of? Well, they're critical well, specifically of institutions and received understandings no, of the national No, I, the, the, of from, from a MAGA perspective, critical theory is not about critiquing institutions. It's about critiquing social norms. Yeah, but that's and, because the MAGA perspective is based on total ignorance of the content of critical theory. That may be true, and that may be not true. But as far as they're concerned... Critical theory is a critique of the social norms of their everyday normal lives. Sure, not sure, fine, fair, fair, fair enough. But then, but then, theory. my question to you then, though, is given that Marx indeed is one of the earlier, not the earliest, but one of the earlier inaugurators of that critical movement. I don't why do you? So. Why do you want to? He is. Why do you want to wed communism? Criticism is to just this... Kant. That just begins with the con. That's. No, no, Marx, no, criticism. No, no, no. Oh, oh, you're you're way off there. Criticism Marx, goes way far back. Criticism goes all the way back to to Rousseau, back to Machiavelli, who like recapitulates the, the, the underlying basis of states as being okay, that's that a which is. Thing. Sorry. Marx employs criticism, of course, but critical race theory and this kind of stuff. Maga is just well, critical theory is just a deployment of critical theory to race. The idea of critical theory as a concept that's fairly recent. But in terms of people uh, having that critical, so you're, you're uh, talking about attitude the, towards. The whole, uh, cultural Marxism thing? I don't know what you're referring to. Well, well I mean, we, we could also add that as well, but cultural Marxism okay. goes farther than critical so, theory. So right? these kind of right-wing populist catchphrases generally refer to trends that they perceive to be mounting a critique toward the normal everyday life of... Sure, but but why? Why, not, do they per, why do they perceive that, though? It's not because... They're all going to university and they're just seeing with their own eyes. Oh, the professors are teaching everybody. Yeah, but I think you forgot the it's... relevant point in contention, which is you use this. Well, no, no, no. I'll, I'll tell you where this is coming from, though. The reason why they think that is because this is received wisdom from a massive, massively moneyed media empire that is forcing this down their throats all the time. Okay, I am willing to bet with you. However, massively moneyed you think that media empire. I know this are... because I'm a Canadian and I was pro Trump sure. a few years ago as a okay. result of the same dynamic. Okay. 
okay, again, let me finish. However right. massively moneyed you think that media empire is, it is dwarfed in terms of what revenues it can accrue by the mainstream media as an institution. What are you in talking about? It's, 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 that, that's patently untrue. Okay, well, if, unless, if you're going to refer to the decentralized information kind of flow of uh, right-wing information on the internet, maybe as an aggregate, it's more, I don't know. But in terms of, like, as a one block of a hegemony, there's no equivalent to the mainstream media that comes close, coming from the right. The 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 right wing media is the closest is, is a you massive... might get. The closest you might get to is Tucker Carlson, who's part of Fox News, which is huge. But Tucker Carlson's the exception, not the norm. Even when it comes to Fox News, so you're dealing with an overwhelming hegemony. Um, let's see here. So there's a Forbes article from twenty uh, February, actually. So, okay. uh, Fox has finished first with an average total audience for total daily ratings of 1.349 million viewers. Um, yeah. CNN has 524,000. Yeah, Fox this, is... This is like an order of magnitude of difference here. Right, but we're talking about the difference between, for example, success uh, for audiences and on a market and institutional hegemony. Institutional hegemony is actually... I mean, that actually benefits my argument because... Given how unpopular the well, CNN is, CNN is multinational, so CNN is not institutional. CNN is just a, is just a, a news. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and ignore the comment that CNN is not institutional, just for the sake. Well, of why why wouldn't you say that Fox News is? Because they, CNN they promoting is, a they, they promote both presidents. Fox and CNN are clearly institutional. Fox has managed to increase okay, its ratings sure. by allowing people like Tucker Carlson on the air. Clearly, right? But in terms of, I mean, these our mainstream media companies that are all owned by these same corporations. Can I, so, can I ask a clarifying I question? Yeah. I'm interested in the definition of institutional. When it comes to academia, professors have been variably pro or anti-institution, depending on the era and the context. Um, professors in Berlin were famously pro-Nazi. A lot of them were Nazis, you know, which is weird. You'd think normally the professors are more progressive. Here in the States, there were plenty of leftist professors. Um, you know, go further on, like economics profession has always been heavily institutionalized. I'm not entirely sure where these lines are. You say Tucker Carlson isn't institutional. When I think of Tucker Carlson, I think of a wealthy heir who's admitted to being, you know, a voice for the interest of billionaires, speaking on a very large institutional news network. Something distinguishes him in your mind. I'd like to know what. Yeah, I mean, his background, he may be from the ruling elite in terms of his background, but the information he's putting out there is discontinuous. Clearly, at least you could, everyone here would not object to the fact that it's extremely contentious in general from the perspective of the institutional hegemony. And to define what institutional means, it doesn't just mean privileged. Institution refers to the specific way in which um, power is exerted over uh, in, uh, grouping individuals under a specific form. So, right? what, does so he, example, what does he disrupt then? Well, objectively speaking, he's extremely contentious when it comes to how he's disrupting the most of the information people get from the mainstream media so most but, of the mainstream what, what is media, what is mainstream when this is the most watched and the most money platform because it's the most popular but msnbc cnn probably even other mainstream voices but what makes them mainstream Fox News. Okay, what I'll, does this mean? i'm trying to give an example okay that, please okay uh all had a narrative about j6 now Tucker carlson almost alone in terms of people who have this reach that they do on uh, television is going against that narrative. So here you have an example of a consensus on what J6 was, and Tucker Carlson is contradicting it. Now, regardless of whether you agree with Tucker Carlson or you think he's being honest, clearly he is going against the consensus of the mainstream. Well, but you clearly think that the right wing makes up a larger proportion of the population than the left wing, which is why you think it's of, of the working class and of the people and why you think that the... The That's not why at all. Is. That is absolutely not why. 
But wouldn't that definition of disruption then not have anything to do with institutional values? I mean, for like John Oliver frequently does segments that are contrary to mainstream liberal values and a bunch of institutionally accepted stuff. Liberals, being as they are incapable of understanding systemic critique, probably find his points on slap lawsuits to be revolutionary. There's certainly a deviation from what normally gets talked about. Would that too I don't think those be kinds institutional? Of but I don't think those deviations bleed over into antagonistic differences. Of course, there's a range of difference among and within hegemonies, but they don't become antagonistic until they become so severe as points of contention so as to, for example, be labeled enemies of the country or dangerous people who need to be censored and so on. Like, I don't, I don't really think John Oliver has ever said anything that would make it, you know, I don't think you would have members of Congress talking about the threat of John Oliver. What they, about AOC? However, members of Congress have talked about her as a threat. People on the right frequently talk about her as a disruptive influence that's trying to destroy America. And a lot of her values when it comes to economic reform and the Green New Deal are systemically controversial enough to lead to some borderline mass panics on the effects her laws might have. I mean, but I don't think AOC and John Oliver are comparable because, first of all, the right is opposed to everyone who they can... Sorry, I don't know, I don't know why we're referring to the right here, just for the sake of convention. Because there's a difference even growing, slip. there's a difference even growing in the Republican Party, so I think there is a realignment. But the people you're talking about who are fear mongering about AOC will probably also do it about John Oliver and others because they see AOC as part of the hegemony. So I'm not what sure. What is the uh, what's the realignment in the Republican Party that you perceive? What's the what? What is the realignment in the Republican Party that you perceive? Uh, between the MAGA wing and you know what oh, they're was, calling. Yeah the rhinos and DeSantis and others. I think there's a acute split that's going on there that I don't think the party will be able what, to- What's the, what, what's, what's the substantial difference between them as, as you see it? Well, I mean, I, I think on face value, it's simple. Uh, DeSantis is part of the establishment and Trump right. uh, created his own movement, which is built on collective distrust toward that establishment. Now, the difference with DeSantis is that he is breaking from a lot of the cultural kind of messaging coming from that hegemony. But when it comes to his ties to the neoconservative establishment, when it comes to his ties to the war machine and the military industrial complex, and basically a lot of the money that's behind uh, politics, I think it's clear that DeSantis is part of the status quo. In a, I don't think just, DeSantis is an outsider. Sure. It, it, just, it just seems like to me, though, then, that even if I leave aside like all of the, the the serious issues I have with with your rhetoric and your positions with respect to a whole bunch of people yet again, and with respect to the identity of uh, communism and, and the mega movement as being compatible in, in any way, shape, or form in a real way, um, it, it seems that what you're proposing is stillborn because it's tied to the cult of personality of a specific embattled persona um, that has no need of you. But. I uh, I, first of all, whether the MAGA has any need of me is beyond the point. But the significance of the cult of personality, I think, is interesting because it's a cult of personality solely built around that collective distrust that I was talking about. Trust in Trump, which is, by the way, not unconditional. The MAGA crowd has booed Trump on debt. Like, it's been recorded on occasions where he's talked about things I don't think we are allowed to mention on YouTube. Just I don't want to flag the censors relating to health issues, for example. He's been booed on that. So I don't think there's an unconditional trust in Trump. I just think his cult of personality is proportionate to the severance between these people and this part of the country with what I call the hegemony. I don't know. I, I, I suppose, but at the same time, like that distrust, it doesn't seem to be by itself to be unique. What seems to be unique again is a reflexive uh, distrust as directed by media sources um, against specific ordinances, not against institutions as such. Like I one think of the institutions, because well, no, no, because well, well, not really though, because like, for example, January sixth, well, it was in in like a real sense against the, the institutions of American democracy. Um, it was premised on the thesis that, in some sense, that had been corrupted. So it, it's not. Well, it's not I think really the institution of American democracy 
is something very ambiguous and old, going back to 1776. But when we're talking about the hegemony that emerges after World War II, we're talking about something that is outside of the Constitution. We're talking about this civil, artificial, I mean, it's what Soros will call the open society. It's a network of NGOs, um, academic institutions. Well, that's the Open Society uh, Foundation, but the Open Society as a concept is what those NGOs and whatnot are, are purposed towards. That's fostering. what I was They are saying. distinct. I was literally just saying that, the Open Society. Well, no, no, because but that's not the open society. the The open society is is like an, an ethical goal within a state. It's not. Okay, I, I, maybe you've not. You haven't Popper's read Popper, but Popper characterizes the open society as defined by this union of various different civil society organizations that will maintain vigilance in regards to. Uh, but that's that's within that's within a state, though. That's not like a, a global thing per se. Of right. course it's global. How could it not be global? What do you mean? Because it's within a state. You but, have a civil society, or you have an open society. Yeah, it encompasses various states, state. but we're talking about a this artificially created civil society defined by the promotion of open values in the open society, which is, you know, for the defense of democracy and so on, which in reality has translated... Look, I don't... Line. I don't think in your head you're incoherent. The problem, though, is that you're using a whole lot of terms in, like, really fast and loose ways. So if I'm trying to, like, take you seriously on a theoretical level and follow you, I, I literally can't because you mean six different things at any given time. Get, then get to the content instead of generalizing. Like I'm tr I'm you, trying. That's what I'm telling you. Like, like, so you it's object like to the idea, uh, the use of the word open society. We can use another word if you want. But there's clearly these... Um, yeah, but the, the, when, when we use a different word, though, then you actually start to mean a different thing. And not just by dint of doing that, but what I'm perceiving, though. I, I'm just trying to arrive do. at a common understanding of what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that when I talk about institutional hegemony, I'm not strictly talking about the state itself, because that has existed since 1776. Formally speaking, hegemony doesn't really become a useful concept until the late 1920s and the 30s, because... Gramsci is using it in the context of the rise of fascism in Italy, but it also can be used to apply to the New Deal kind of system that emerges, the European kind of welfare states, where you have these kind of corporates of uh, these kind of social corporates outside of the liberal state that that want to administer and regulate society, um, you know, regulate information and inf uh ideas and so on and so on so that's where the concept of hegemony becomes useful but when you're just talking about the constitution or a classical liberal kind of uh democracy preceding the 1920s hegemony is not really a useful concept the reign of the institutions is not is not uh very clear no no sure but if you're characterizing the mega movement as in some sense anti-hegemonic it, it kind of it, it becomes a matter of import that it takes its ideological cues entirely from a, a ma the most moneyed media engine in in the world. Which one? Uh, the 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 general right wing media conglomerate uh, with, with. I don't think the there's a again. I think the mainstream media is overwhelmingly against MAGA. Well, it's over. It's overwhelmingly against against MAGA, but that doesn't mean that the MAGA movement itself isn't taking its cues from that. What am I hearing? What what? So just because they watch Tucker Carlson, that means that we're going to pretend that most of the mainstream. Well, media if they're if they're taking if they're taking directives if they're taking directives from uh, billionaires which, embedded in these these which massive directives, by institutional the way. what? Hold on, but Tucker Carlson. Hold on, you have to understand something. People well, directors, Trump, directors can include can include people, things like the, the well, paranoia about. I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to explain. I'm gonna try to explain to you how these things work. So Trump and uh, Tucker Carlson come from these ruling families. Let's just for the sake of argument, right? But they got uh, excluded for some reason and became outsiders from the big club. So they drew their source of popularity and power from some kind of direct popularity, trying to get or working people. Most elites derive their power from networks and institutional connections. Well, they, they didn't yeah, really, like though, that. because one of the, the the way in which Trump got on the map in that particular respect was through the Republican Party and through Fox News. 
Uh, indirectly, uh, of course, Fox, Fox News was no covering. directly. He went he went on there and was able to promote himself as a contender for the president. But I don't, I don't think the people running Fox News thought they were actually going to get Trump elected. I think it was a very kind of uh, money grab. Like this is getting us really good ratings, so we're going to keep covering it. They didn't really. I don't think they really expected he was going to take over the Republican Party in the way he did. But the Republican Party did uh, allow, tolerate Trump on condition that he compromises on a number of things, which he did, right? But that's not who made Trump. You know, Trump, see, Trump got on the debate stage at the Republican debates. Who was for him, right? There was nobody in the status quo who was for him. His message resonated with people. It was extremely popular. And that's why they eventually had to compromise with him. But well, no one, no, no, one, not once, once they, they chosen by anyone, you know, once they saw that he pulled a crowd, they, they did like it, it was. Contained That's the key thing, though, was but he pulled a crowd because he was saying things that no one else was saying. Sure, but that doesn't distinguish him from the institutions themselves. That's just how the institution recognized him as. So as, I think Trump's message was not created in sufficiently palatable. Trump's message wasn't created on, in an institution. He was probably created. He was on Twitter on the toilet someday. He, he was. A, he was. A, he's. He's. So he's, there's a he's, big difference there. he's a. He's a wealthy heir and a media star. Okay, his level of wealth doesn't speak to whether what he did represents the hegemony. Uh, typically, yes, you're right. Most people who have wealth do so because they benefited from the hegemony. But that's not universally the case. For example, Bitcoin billionaires who bought a thousand Bitcoins 10 years ago, and that just became extremely rich right now, they tend to actually be anti-establishment, despite how wealthy they are, because they got their money in a way that was outside of the traditional game for how you do that. But Trump was an outsider, even within the ruling elite, before he ran for office. He was like considered a joke and he wasn't well liked among the ruling class. So he Trump Trump came into relevance entirely at the expense of what we call the hegemony. I just I just I don't see this as like a really strong argument when ideologically um the two sides functionally align with everything that they're they're targeting in I think in society maybe generally. that's your the, the bare that. fact, the bare fact that that Trump happened to be a, a somewhat ridiculous figure in polite society. Well, I'm I'm not an idealist. I'm a materialist. So you can try and say an abstract. But, you know, you're not you're not a materialist though, because you use terms like universal state. You're, right. You're I'm not, not a I'm not a materialist because you don't let me finish sentences. But no, you're not a materialist because you directly yeah, because belie you a materialist mode so, of analysis. Yeah. So you may try to abstractly qualify their ideologies as the same. But in actual functional practical reality, there we're dealing with very different phenomena between Trump and the Trump's MAGA movement and the hegemony. You, you your so. your I, I characterization, your characterization of them as the same has no explanatory value for how to understand the development. Your characterization of them as anti-hegemonic is is impoverished in the extreme. Your your point of reference is they're skeptical of vaccines. No, the point of reference is that they are built on collective distrust toward the hegemony as a whole. Yeah, but when you, when at, when press as to what the hegemony as a whole is, it, it literally is just oh, they they distrust scientists in general or doctors in general. They no, they not just scientists and doctors. About wokeism, Hold on. Trans ideology, not whatever. just scientists and doctors, but also the military industrial complex. Maybe that's an important one. Also, the new the agendas being crafted in universities with the funding of yeah, but everybody's uh, everybody's uh, opposed foundations. to the military industrial complex. It's a scary not in, term, but but in practice, that's not true. See, in in theory, everyone wants to be a hippie, but in practice, no, not everyone's opposed to the military industrial complex. But so you mentioned the medical and scientific. I, I agree. So so like it, so how, not, how apropos it was it was Trump who assassinated Soleimani. Um, yeah, he he did, uh, but he did so not on behalf of the power that gave him power, the MAGA movement, but because of his agreement with Sheldon Adelson and the neocons and Bolton and Pompeo 
that was the condition of the Republican Party tolerating his existence. I find it completely objectionable, those and other actions he engaged in, but it that doesn't preclude me from being able to form a unbiased assessment. Well, that the, the problem is it doesn't preclude you from, from no, nothing you say precludes you from anything. Like, like you're just you're just going back and forth, um, as as the situation requires. Uh, we we've gotten to I this point so. have, having established a, a grounding for literally none of the concepts. But the problem, Sunday, is you make these general characterizations of my position. But I really, as, I really don't. But know. as far as a I particular really argument in a particular position, you're just coming short. You're not able to actually give us anything to substantiate these. Gender I don't have to. We're debating your political theory. The onus is on you to substantiate it. If none of your I, I think, I think you're confusing it. You're trying to say the onus is on me. To it is. We're you. debating your political theory hold, hold, as you, per you, your request. So this is your Sunday, choice. President, President Sunday, should be called President Cut Off. You clearly are someone who has come to a conclusion before you've even heard anything I said. Well, no, I, I, I had to go through the painful I process the of onus, reading through like I a 40 page document that you wrote to get to this is, point. Well, let's, let's use this as an, to, speaking of generalities, I said, the onus is, you think the onus is on me too. And then what was I going to say? He said, well, the onus is on you to make the, well, we're not talking about that because what I was going to say is that you think- Is Hawes complaining about being interrupted? Yes, I actually am. Okay. Because I think in good faith, I've actually tried to allow you to make your argument without... No, I, I don't think so. I think, I, think, I think when you've been pressed... I think, you, 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 you think, I think that when you've been, I think when you've been even Sunday, moderately the pressed... The onus is not on me. I think you, you talked quite a bit. I think when you've been, been even moderately pressed to explain a position, um, you get frustrated and you say, what's your point? As if I wasn't asking you a question and not making an argument. No, that was earlier in the whole C-word debacle, which... You don't, we don't want I think to this was pretty, oh, yeah, I let's think this let's not revisit this. My so look, what my my curiosity is. Um, I just want I just want to finish one thing he wouldn't let me say. Okay, go go that, for it, and then yeah. I'll yeah. Okay. So you seem to think the onus is on me to convince you to agree with me. The onus is on me, yes, to do the best of my best of my ability, communicate to you. I would I would I think I've done a good job of that. I think I've done a good job of that. Just just because you don't no, want no, to no, 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 I, I disagree. Doesn't mean I don't I have think I don't think you have to I don't think you have to make me agree with you at all. I would be satisfied with you making it intelligible. There are people who have theories that I vehemently disagree with, or nonetheless, I can understand the logical I, steps. I just they don't took think you're operating in good there. faith when it comes to what your standard of intelligibility is. It took, I, I, it took it took way too much work to get here for this to be in bad faith. Consider the possibility that maybe your delivery is actually fraught. Like maybe actually the way in which you go about explaining yourself is extraordinarily but difficult. I look, I'm not, facts. look, look, I'm, I'm not a genius and I'm not an expert in this, but I've got some modest capacities in this area. But okay? Sunday, you're just if I cannot, if I cannot, if I cannot understand what you're saying, most people can't. I, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think most, when I say Trump's a political outsider, I think I'm saying something that's pretty, not that contentious for most people. Right. So I think you're going out of your way. No, to we're not, we're not talking about, we're not talking about, we're not talking about, Trump being a pariah so what are we within the about? mainstream of, of Republican so what are we politics. About? Let's get to that. Instead of making generalities about my arguments, get to your specific objections. Uh, okay, how, how the hell does, does an anti-communist, isolationist, uh, largely, largely racist and pro-capitalist uh, movement of people who are, are categorically against any type of top-down organization, how do you combine that with communism? Sure. So you read my essay, right? Yeah, the last part was So you didn't bad. read my essay because no, I, I I did because I and thoroughly was, explained and I actually I could probably read I believe that. you that you I believe you that you think you explained. So okay. Having having read it with multiple people multiple times, I can tell you no, you did not explain. Okay. So let let's get to the anti communism stuff. Drawing from the reactionary populist legacy of the McCarthyite era and the John Birch Society as well as Cold War propaganda, anti-communist sentiment is as American as ant apple pie. Watch, this taken is like from, 30 paragraphs long. Just taken from the perspective, this is just one paragraph, the anti-communism of the MAGA movement is even in a way endearing, reflecting its grassroots nature. People are simply making constructs out of old materials already laying around at home. To view this as some kind of essential indictment on the possibility of the dissemination of communist ideas, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so, so the compatibility between communism and MAGA okay. is pure Philistine idiocy. 
MAGA is not essentially defined but by Haas, But Haas, Haas, it is the stuff, first no, no, but Haas, this is, this is, this is why, defined. this is, no, but Haas, this is important. This is why we were talking about the media stuff before. The stuff they have lying around at home is filtered to them From the through these massive oh, media conclusions. Why I call that are. endearing, why I called that endearing Sunday is because actually it's stuff their grandpa told them from the past. The media in the 50s or the 60s, that, even that could be under contention, maybe it was telling them that overwhelmingly, what? right? What does that matter? It's from the past. Today, they're not getting their anti-communism from today. They're getting it from well, the they're past. Also get, they're also getting it from today. It's not just from the past. It's being... I, I don't think I don't and, think and the vital source, I, I don't think the vital sources of anti-communism are coming from uh, the same sources that the MAGA movement got it from. Like the victims of anti-communism memorial is tied to neocons. It's tied to the Rhino Republican establishment. So no, I think you're dealing with two different things. I do agree there's anti-communism today, but that's just what's so great about the MAGA Sorry. movement. The MAGA movement is less likely to buy into the actual contemporary forms of anti-communism, instead drawing on this eclectic, contradictory, uh, ready-made anti-communism inherited from the past. It's just as old and inherited as something laying around in their garage from the 1950s. It's, doesn't, it's not any indictment on the essential uh, possibilities of the MAGA movement. It's just some... Well, well, it, it, it is though because they're also they're also pro capitalist as well. Like it doesn't matter where they so you inherit say, it from. You say it's a two fact. things. You Moreover, say two when we're talking about make, you're talking about inheriting it from like seventy years ago, that's not that long. So that is outright a superficial judgment, and I'll tell you why. Because, because when you addressing ask a superficial matter, point, because because you're just using looking at the words they're using, not what they mean by it. When most MAGA people, I'm looking at the words you're using. Okay, well, you can't follow the argument. You're talking about MAGA being... Well, that's because the uh, argument is incoherent. But, can but you let even, me finish, even Sunday, here, Sunday, this Sunday, one Sunday, statement Sunday. you made... Just let me finish. No, no, you, you've talked a lot, Haas. I've actually let you talk for the majority of the conversation. So, I, I, dude, so what? You, you, you very, can't have very, I've actually allowed you to okay. speak at length. Well, I'm just going to continue speaking anyway. So the MAGA... Sure, when, you, said, when you, you said that the MAGA movement is pro-capitalist and anti-communist. And I'm saying that's superficial yeah, because you're just looking at the words they're using rather yeah, than the look, underlying meaning of what say, they're trying to say. When, when MAGA say, says that it's pro-capitalist, it's not referring to the actual system of capitalism we have, which represents everything they hate. It's referring to some abstract yes, kind they, of. They don't. They don't. They don't understand how capitalism gives. They don't understand. They don't. Under, have, they don't. They don't, uh, they don't, they don't you know, understand how capitalism is what gives rise to the fact that every every single city they live in. Is, is an unkept trash bin with tons of homeless people, tons of poor people, okay. who can't afford so, homes. Da, da, da. So they don't understand that, but that doesn't so that doesn't matter. That's not it super. No, no, that's not superficial. It does that's, matter because no, that's because not superficial. That's them being superficial. So if we're materialists, we have to we, look we, at the underlying. We are not materialists. I am a materialist. You're, okay. you're like spirit Dude, science for so is do we have a moderator or what because i just want to say something really quick no he's he's on my side remember okay. i stacked the decks it was between him okay. and Hinkle. sure so if i'm going to be joke. if if anyone is concerned with being a materialist thank you for cutting me off on that completely relevant point you're welcome then you're going to have to ask the question of what is the source what is the meaning when they express anti-communist sentiment is this because of something from a material perspective essential or are they just anti-communist because they see, for example, the way BlackRock is taking over everything and monopoly capitalism, they're associating that with communism. They're associating this homogeneity look, process of capitalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look, as I, as I said before, pro-capitalism. As are I they said, hey, 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 Haas, 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 I'm going to meet you halfway here. As I said earlier. If you can find a way to actually repurpose the language of MAGA and the MAGA movement towards uh, like a, a robust, genuine uh, uh, left-wing development or something like that, power to you. But you're not doing that. What you're doing is you're selling yourself to the MAGA movement as something that's palatable to them for your own benefit. Why am I doing that? The, the, the entire essay that we're responding to here and everything you've done here so far um, is... is for lack of a better word, essentially cucking out the language of political theory in order to uh, make okay. the MAGA movement appear more robust and more theoretically sound than it actually is. For example, 
Well, your whole notion of partisanship, you rely on a, a specific notion of partisanship that Schmidt actually directly criticizes. You derive it from him just to get to the point where you can say, oh, the partisan is telluric. What um, does MAGA what, is of the nation and of the ground. Therefore, we can we does, now have a theoretical justification Schmidt, for combining MAGA Schmidt, with... What? Which, what, what about my theory of the partisan? Was Schmidt critiquing? About your theory of the partisan with Schmidt critiquing? No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you deploy a specific understanding of the partisan that Schmidt dismisses as being which one? Uh, the, the one in which it is simply that which is um, independent and and in in some sense uh, ha has an enmity with respect to like existing structures or whatever in like a general sense. He dismisses this on the grounds that this is this is simply too abstract, and you end up just with a theory of essentially any sort of individualism. That's a but very that's, loose paradox. Well, that's not my theory. I'm not saying anyone who has a different opinion is a partisan. I in my opening statement, well, what I, makes what makes mega partisan? MAGA is not partisan because individuals in MAGA have different opinions. MAGA is partisan because it's referring to a. That's exactly why. It's referring to a collective political identity, a collective reality of America, right? That is situate, that is both based, yes, as you said, Telluric in America, but also um, opposed to the form. But it's not. Of it's not Telluric though. They had to get bussed into January sixth. They they travel to different conventions. They're they're not. They're not. I, oh, I, live, I don't think people I don't think uh, that demographic who live in Washington, D.C. would be called Telluric in the first place. Like, I don't know how many white people living in Washington, D.C. are, you know, I know there's a big um, uh, black population. You could maybe say that's Telluric because it's kind of like a similar role of rootedness in the community. But why would, of course, they would have to be coming from elsewhere if they're going to be in Washington, D.C. What is what a stupid point? Well, well, no, the point is they aren't partisans. It's not It's not a partisan movement. The I movement think is, is not a partisan. partisan. The individuals in it is, it are not partisan. It is partisans. a partisan movement. It's a partisan movement because of the way in which it has transformed American politics. It's genuinely partisan for no other reason than it is genuinely... No, no, no but the definition of the partisan is that it transforms politics. Here's, the here's, of the here's, why it's it's part, here's why it's partisan, according to me. Because it is, it is a genuinely different political movement. I'm not talking about individual opinion. Different political movement than the hegemony, the two-party duopoly, okay. the hegemony, the but, uh, whatever. Okay, but Haas, the reason why you would call it partisan and why that would have meaning is not because you've decided to just label what you think they are partisan. It's because it's drawing on a I established set of relations own... between the partisan and regular forms of politics or warfare. Yes, but they're, they're, I, but they're very I, they're very regular. Well, example, it's just, it's just example, a normal populist movement. In the case of Schmidt, the case of Schmidt, Schmidt is very uh very stressing on the asymmetry of the partisan, right, with regard to the conventional army. So there's a conventional established form of politics, and yes, here you have a partisan, unconventional form of political mobilization. But, but it's not movement. its not really unconventional, though. It's actually very typical. What um, precedent what, is there for MAGA in America? It, it's, 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 a, it's a popular voting and, 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 and social interventionist movement. That's that's based on sloganeering. That's not new. That's been around since. I'm going to ask you another question. What is a movement you would consider comparable to MAGA in American history? Uh, most of them. What makes MAGA toxic isn't its organizational form. It's the policies they they pursue and their toxic attitudes towards different groups. Can of you, So you can't give me a specific example. Obviously, everyone sees MAGA is pretty unprecedented. As far as in, in what sense is in, in what organizational or actually like robust structural sense is MAGA unique? I, because for decades and decades we've been ruled by this like one big club hegemony, and then you have a movement who, which is getting its information and getting its ideas of who rules us and whatever and how to establish power and who, what kind of things do we want, what kind of things do we accept, uh, forming a collective political reality completely outside the hegemony. So I think that's pretty unprecedented. But you, you just you just attach that into there. Like they're still they're they're still operating through 
eminently mainstream sources. They're still taking like part in 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 Tucker conventional Carlson, conventional political activism and conventional. What mainstream voting. source besides Tucker Carlson do you have in mind? They're using all of the same all all the same resources and points of contact as everybody else. You mean they're, like they're, Truth Social? Like like what? Like Truth Social, or what are you talking about? I actually don't know what that is. Well, you exactly. So that's what they use is Truth Social. You don't even what know is, what is Truth Social. It's the it's the Trump Twitter app. I'm I'm sorry. Are you are you suggesting? Are using, you suggesting? Are you suggesting you're the fact they're that using Trump? All the same no, no, are, are you suggesting the fact that Trump has has a social media app makes them unique? No, but you just said they're using the same methods of communication and interaction and all this stuff. Yeah, there, I, I, ton, tons of people are using like like separate Telegram spaces and and their Twitter Twitter alternatives are, are proliferate. Dude, I, I think I think you've really underestimated to what extent like this country is very divided. It's a separate world. Well, like no, no I, I, I haven't, but that's neither here nor there. And no, in fact, it is here. And no, no. In fact, the fact the fact that you're the fact that you're defaulting okay. to the fact that there is like right. a, a firm so bipartisan Trump divide Trump, in have the have United mind? States so actually besides, suggests that it's more common because now so, you're folding into a larger hole. So, besides Tucker Carlson, what do you have in mind from the hegemony or the mainstream? I don't know what you're asking me. You're uh, saying, oh, MAGA isn't. Uh, operating outside the mainstream because it using the same mainstream everyone else is i just what are you talking about no no no. the, the partisan is not defined by having like a hyper concentration of, of okay clearly, of I, okay, clearly my my concept of the partisan is unique it's not exactly the same as schmitz i just object it's, it's not it's not only not exactly the same as schmitz it's actually like contrary like it, it, that's it does what i not. object to that's what i object to because you said that schmitz uh expressly reject the one I'm drawing from? He did. No, because Smith, you said he critiques it for being individualistic. Mine is no, not. No, no, he doesn't critique it for being individualistic. He, he Yeah, because it's uh, abstract, because anyone with a contrary opinion is then a partisan. That's not what I said. It's not what I'm saying. No, instead you said somebody with a contrary Twitter alternative hey, is a partisan. No, no, I, you, 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 you said they use the same mainstream sources, and I said, what do you mean by that? And then but I they, named they do them. the bare the bare fact that there's also an app doesn't belie that. Like, what do well, you use? What, you use well, YouTube I, okay, what are the ones and, and you have Rumble, and, the ones, and you take okay, your Sunday, cues from television Sunday, and Twitter. What, Sunday, what are the ones you have in mind? I don't even know what you're talking about. Are you talking about an app? Are you talking about the internet? What are you talking about? I'm referring to all of them. They, they operate in the same Can you name spaces. one? Just name one, dude. Just name one, please. Well, we're on YouTube right now. This this would be an example. Okay, so that's that's a beautiful example. So, so big tech, YouTube, you're saying, well, MAGA uses the same sources. Are you not even aware of what's going on? All the YouTube censorship and the controversy surrounding it, the rise of YouTube, Rumble and YouTube censors, YouTube for censors, that same reason. YouTube but hold censors, on, YouTube extreme, censors, tankies this is an extremely and anti and anti trends. This is huge, and, hugely and, contentious in America and because everyone sources dude, sometimes dude, they they censor. You are so out of touch. language. The they censor like what you're are you talking so about? So out of touch about the basics. No, no, no your 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 entire dude, argument. The average model person. No, no, no. Your He's your not, entire your entire argument dude, defaults at YouTube this point. As pause. An example, that's really pause. Stupid, dude. It's pause. Pause. Dependent. If your entire defense of the partisanship of the mega movement is that like myriad other groups, they're victims of YouTube censorship. Like, I'm sorry, that just isn't wait, wait, wrong. wait. How can you justify such a reductive accusation? I asked you for an example of the mainstream sources. Your example doesn't. Stand. I uh, my my argument didn't require so, me so to have an encyclopedic Sunday, knowledge Sunday, Sunday. This is, of it's the a media simple, figures Sunday. that it's mega people this. in particular. I you okay Sunday. No, 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 we're talking about we're Sunday talking about the, the definition claim. of partisanship. Sure. Huh? So Sunday makes the we're claim not talking MAGA about what media they sources. consume. We're talking Sunday makes about the claim that MAGA is using what oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait, hold on. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Wait, Haas, Haas, you as well. Okay. That was getting a bit too much. I don't mind a bit of back and forth, but that was that was simultaneous. All right. Haas, did you finish your sentence there? No, no. Okay, finish your sentence. Okay, so you were saying that uh, MAGA is operate, operating in the same mainstream. I think that's wrong. But in order to allow you to defend yourself, I asked you for an example of that. You said, YouTube, your example doesn't stand. In no way does that uh, does, does that make my argument that MAGA is partisan because YouTube censors them. 
but it is an indictment on your ability to provide evidence that MAGA is by and large using the same exact sources for information and platforms that are part of the mainstream. Okay. Well, no, President Sunday. Mag Thank you. Uh, MAGA engages in propaganda through the exact same media sources as everybody else, censored or not, as many other groups are also censored. They vote in the same way. They engage in the same kinds of same forms of political activism. What distinguishes them are their 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 policy positions, and their and their social attitudes, and and their and their You're decorum. Wrong. In form, they're completely different in all the things you mentioned. But you in haven't form. been able to substantiate that except by reference yeah, to yeah. Twitter. So, so you Twitter wanted app. to bring up big tech, but if you want to talk about how they I didn't vote, want to bring up big tech. You, okay, you most, brought up the Twitter so, app thing. When most people vote, for example, they do so not because they're part of this homogeneous movement which no, no, even, you're not understanding the, the even in objection the here. Block, no, you're not, under, you're not understanding the objection here. The reasons for voting don't matter. No, no, Haas, 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 just, just chill for one second. The reasons for voting don't matter. What distinguishes the partisan from the nonpartisan is the action itself, not the reasons behind it. Okay, so They the also have to have like an attitude of intense oh, okay, political so affiliation. Fact, that would be consistent. The fact that MAGA people participate in elections and the electoral system means it's in no way possible to describe their method of organization and political existence in general as unconventional. That's no, but you need to establish that it is unconventional. And if your point of reference, once again, is that they are persecuted on YouTube and have a Twitter app, that's not good enough. No, I've referenced, for example, the different methods by which they do not only disseminate organizations, but vote in the first place how do they vote and how do they respect the outcome of the vote well no, no but no, 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 has, has not not voting behaviors as in who they vote for well, i think that's unconventional so yeah that's the voting behavior is unconventional very clearly you, you, what, what do they sneak into the voting booth what, what are you talking about no like january 6 it's pretty unconventional that's not voting. voting behavior that that's uh well, it's behavior resulting from their participation in the electoral process, which was unconventional. It's an unconventional way of participating in the American democracy. Well, well no, like, like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and insurrectionary action is unconventional. And that would actually be, that would be close. That would actually get you close there. But the one defining characteristic you now have is, is the attempted insurrection at January 6th. No, the multi, the myriad, dude. Every time I try to name anything, you just interrupt me. So you, you're not even letting me speak. I could give you a lot you're of speaking right now. Just stop whining and get to the point. Okay. So I mentioned information, right? That's comp the the method of uh, disseminating information, which is the most important thing, by the way, is unconventional. The method by which they situate themselves in American democracy. They, they use computers and social media. Is co what? They use they use social. So you interrupt me again. So we're going to be. But they use social media. And like everybody uses. Because I this can't hard. name multiple things if you're going to get fixated on one of the things. Okay. I'm talking about all of them. These are all like things so everybody social, uses. So social media, where they are root. So where literally new social media platforms are being built because of the yes disproportionate censorship of MAGA people, and it is not just oh everyone gets censored. No, there's a disproportionate censorship of that specific political movement because of the un unconventionality. Oh, no. Right-wing uh, people, right people across the board are censored. It's not just a mega movement. Okay. What is the right wing? What is the right wing? If we're not, what are you even referring to then? I don't know. Every, everybody from like mainline conservatives that they go yeah, too but far. That censorship is to... in the context of a unified movement built on collective distrust toward the hegemony, the MAGA movement. I think it's important to stress, uh, uh, it's not just that- No, no, I, I'm talking about people as, as like, as, as milk toast, as like Sargon of Akkad, for example. It, 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 is, it is not specifically targeting the, the MAGA broader, movement in particular. The broader censorship of the right-wing voices is within the context of the emergence of right-wing populism. And the American form of that was the MAGA movement. I, I got I got nothing. It, it's I can't I can't hold you to to any definition. Just everything means. Because you're not in good faith. Moment. You're not like leveling with. No, me. no, that's 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 that's, that's you. About. That's that's you, Haas. 
Um, you're not using any of these terms in good faith, and your entire strategy is is to. Explore. How am I not? I'm trying to be really simple with you, dude. It's like clearly oh, you're like way, way over your head. I'm, I'm sorry. Basic. The, the, you are like, trying to be simple. I I'm really trying hard to simplify this for you. Yes. Like I'm being very charitable with like, like just to help you understand like what I'm alluding to at least. Maybe there's a common. Do we live in the same reality? Are we living on the same planet? Like, I, yeah, I am. I am asking that same question obviously myself. Obviously, MAGA is unconventional in the context of American politics. Okay, How but that's not an argument. Okay, pause. How pause. Saying, contentious? saying, pause. Saying something. Pause. Pause. Saying consent? something. Saying something is obviously unconventional is not an argument in favor of establishing that it is unconventional. That's a tautology. You're just. You're I just know, but I, most people understand. That's that's that also doesn't get you anywhere. I, I know. I, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. Most right, people right. most people understand Sunday, the MAGA Sunday. movement. No, no, no. Most Sunday. people understand. Pause. Most people understand the mega movement as being toxic, racist, and negative. That does not mean they think it is some kind of revolutionary organization. To no, we're just using the word unconventional Sunday, and here's the problem. We're limited by a Discord call right now and a Discord video call. I, if I try to say the sky is blue, I can't force you to go outside and, and level with me there. I can't recreate reality on a Discord call, so we're going to have to try and come to a common understanding. Okay, but Haas... That, that typically pause, speaking, pause. if someone says the MAGA movement Mr. is Mr. 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 Let women let have let us, let us finish. Typically, if when people say that the MAGA movement is an unconventional development in American politics, at least within the frame of you know the past two decades of neoliberalism, most people would understand what's meant by that. It's very common even in the mainstream media to acknowledge that. You're objecting to the use of the word unconventional. Because you're saying, oh, it's the same thing as everything else. Well, I, I just think you can't really meaningfully engage with well, Okay, no, okay, I, well, well, I want to ask you, I'd like to talk to you, if I may, for a moment, President sure. Sunday, please. Yeah. So, uh, no. so, with regards to your definition for unconventional, so here's the way I see it. Let me see if I can maybe bridge this gap, okay? So, so, uh, so in a lot of ways, January 6th and the MAGA movement, because it kind of facilitated Jan 6, was unconventional. Obviously, differences exist, but... If I understand you correctly, I'm hearing echo, by the way. If I understand you correctly, President, it is that even though it was unconventional in its expression, the underlying systemic institutional forces that beget Jan 6, the MAGA movement, those are still plainly institutional. It's, so this, this seems like a distinction in expression versus underlying motivation is that how you see it um president well the reason why yeah well, well the reason why we're even talking about conventional versus unconventional in the first place is because he's trying to characterize um he, he's trying to insist upon a distinction here where this is anti-hegemonic essentially because partisan or or, or or consistent with its partisanship um the problem here is that the simple fact of a, a, a rally turned into a riot, turned into what is a de facto insurrectionary movement, even if in behind the scenes there were people who absolutely had that intention. And there were people in the crowd who did, as well as people in the crowd who, who were just along for the ride. Um, that is not sufficient to characterize the movement as a totality, or, or even just a movement by itself as apart from a single event as being unconventional. What we're actually dealing with here is an unusual event which is distinct from unconventional or irregular. When we're talking about irregular, what we're talking about is something that is defined by a kind of activity that is not generally recognized as conventional at all. The problem is that when pressed as to what okay, those so are, what we find oh, wait, are hold, hold activities, on, what we find are them engaging in activities that, that basically every other movement does, including mainstream ones. Um, like the, the storming of the Bastille is, is not a partisan movement, even though it is extreme, radical, and violent and unusual. Okay, so uh, unusuality is not my qualification for partisanship, but I'll qualify what I mean by conventionality. I'm just talking about how people are mobilized, organized, and given a collective political reality. And I think that in the case of MAGA, that was very unconventional, at least as far as what the norm was within American politics. Because within the norm of American politics has been that people, for example, Obama, Obama had a movement, right? But all of that was still firmly situated within, for example, the conventional form of American politics. And the conventional form, you know, by which 
participation in that politics occurred. Here's the thing. The, the thing you have ignored is the key concept of enmity, right? In the Obama era, I get there was the Tea Party and there was polarization, but I don't think there was a real friend-enemy distinction between Republicans and Democrats. I don't think it was real enmity. I think what MAGA brought to the table is it introduced enmity, right? It introduced this almost civil war within America, which, yes, is an extremely unconventional, implies an unconventional um, movement and political development. And it's unconventional because the prior convention had been a lack of enmity internally. Enmity was directed toward the terrorists and people who did 9-11 and that kind of thing, right? And maybe the Russians and the Chinese, who knows? But enmity was never really internal, at least recently in American politics. I don't think you can try to give a counterexample, I welcome you to, uh, before MAGA. Well, enmity in the sense of a, a, a firm intensification of the line between friend and enemy, um, that does not have to manifest simply as a single violent event. That can refer to, for instance, just a rigidification of opposition between political parties, for example. You, you can have political differences okay. that, that are not um, intensifications of war. That's just the most, that's just the most obvious case. Um, so, this is why the concept of the political for uh, uh, Carl Schmidt is at its most clear at the line between friend and enemy, but that doesn't exhaust it. But no one's saying it does. But what you're saying is that you object to the view that enmity has No, no, been no. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that enmity here is not a distinctive feature of, of the MAGA movement, which okay. is still nonetheless a what, voting movement that is what are with examples policy internal or to, a forms, to a government. What are examples or forms of enmity that you think within internal American politics, at least recently, let's say since Reagan, existed? Because I, I don't... Well, if you I had, for were... example, if, if MAGA, for example, turned into a terroristic movement that was concerned with repeating events like January 6th over and over and over again, and, and materially interfering with with the the politics as usual in, in in like a violent insurrectionary way that could not be absorbed into so uh any type any type of normal party politics here's the problem. then you'd have a case yeah you wouldn't want to have that case but you have a case here's the problem of good faith and plain spoken language if i went to an average person and i said this country has been divided like it never has before with this trump stuff since 2016 most people would either agree with me or understand what I was referring to. This is an unprecedented level of division, okay? And you're trying to say that that doesn't cross into enmity, but it actually does. What? It crosses into hatred of one half by the other, a complete inability to no, have... No, no, no. Hatred, hatred and political enmity are not the same thing. You, you can... You but can I think it has crossed completely... over... I think it has crossed over crossed over into enmity and just because it hasn't spilled directly into violence yet it doesn't has, mean though, the enmity's but not that's there. beside the point i think that enmity like as it, far it, as like I, like january 6 was was violent there were deaths they broke okay into a well, that's building. better that's more credence to my point then well no it's but, not because you're 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 uh you're relying on the fact of a violent event to justify characterizing a movement as part no of i'm not i'm i'm relying upon the unprecedented qualitatively acute polarization that followed trump's election in 2016. But, okay but but partisanship is not defined by polarization partisanship i'm not is saying defined it by is the manner in think, which that, by the manner I think in which that polarization can be activated. described as a form of enmity for example an example of that enmity is the russiagate hoax where the MAGA movement and the people behind it and the phenomena was reduced to the design of an enemy of the American state, for example, no, no, at the, least. The, where enmity Russia, would come... the outside foreign enemy is behind... No, no, where where is, enmity... That is an example yeah. of enmity internal no, no, to American no, no, politics. Okay, okay, but the, the problem here is that you're actually overlooking like why this term is used in the first place. The reason why enmity comes into play is because if you have a a logic of just war but not of a just 
quo. So for example, if you criminalize an entire category of people or an entire state or whatever, so that uh, you do not seek, for example, as, as, uh, as the end goal of, of military contention, um, a state of subjugating a foe or a state of, uh, of, of getting like agreeable terms of surrender from a foe, but instead with the, the total destruction and, and subjugation of I think you have a electric. superficial reading and you can't go below the surface that's that's uh, not superficial context. at all wait this, this is no, wait wait wait, 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 wait. To... president sunday finish your sentence you were near the end of it but you didn't finish it right yeah um the reason why enmity becomes uh important for specifically revolutionary partisan um is because uh that is somebody who will still engage in that kind of activity even outside of um, the, uh, the, the scope of state defensive action. So the first kind, so he has two kinds of partisans. There's the first kind of partisan, which is like the, the U Ukrainian, uh, truck bomber who's like disrupting Russian supply lines. Then there's the revolutionary partisan who is like the, 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 maybe engaging a lot of the same activities, but they're like part of the Bolsheviks say, and they don't stop or their goals are not limited by the defensive needs of a particular geographical region. Um, in that particular what's the case, point of bringing that up? well, because in that particular case, their enmity towards like a, a, a political entity categorically, that could go towards satisfying the conditions of, of them being, um, like partisan in, in this sense. But the problem is that the mega movement doesn't do this. The mega movement, while they do target like different demographics within American society, they still deploy almost entirely, actually basically entirely conventional methods uh, to do so. And with respect to January 6th, once again, the justification is their perception wait, wait, no, no. that the democratic process was corrupted. Wait, but that doesn't mean they're, you, again, Hegemony is not based in the 1776 Constitution. Okay, hegemony is based in what happens afterwards in World War II. So the them holding the Constitution as a sacred thing that was violated, and the democratic process as a sacred thing that was violated, is not an indictment on the unconventionality of their position. I didn't. Can you, you said I, I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't follow that. Can you say that? So again? don't. So just because they think the democratic process was corrupted doesn't change that it's an no 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 you're, you're misunderstanding me what, what i'm saying is not that the fact that they think the democratic process was corrupted means that therefore they weren't partisan the point though is that because their goal was even if it was comically misinformed um even if their goal was because their goal was to uh uh correct an institution that is domestic yeah um and and not actually enmity against an enemy per se they're not engaging in partisan Good action. Easily, this is just right. like not any popular uprising so, or any, okay, any public action. Is, is so partisan. if a revolutionary partisan is calling for an abstract return to some prior existing status quo that may be idealized and not grounded in reality, which I think democracy is, by the way, it's an idealization. That doesn't I don't change disagree with their partisan that. stance. But that doesn't change their partisan stance. Well, no, but you, you've assumed the partisan stance in the example. Where the question is what makes them partisan, right? So you okay, said that you if, if a partisan what? does and they're a partisan, so, then well, let's say a revolutionary a partisan. partisan is acting on behalf of an organization with revolutionary go goals for the overthrow of the status quo. Okay? okay. Just because those goals are based in an idealized version of the legitimacy of the prior state, for example, democracy doesn't make it any less revolutionary when the actually existing state, not the ideal state in the constitution or democracy, functions in a way opposed to that. I, I agree. However, in this particular case, we aren't talking about them doing anything at that scale. We're talking about them being under the misperception that there is a criminal cabal that has tainted an election. Like from their vantage so, point, they believe they won the election, right? I don't know why you keep, focusing, right? why you keep right? focusing on January six. No, no, because because well, it why matters. Why are you keep focusing on that? Why can't you just focus? Because it's the closest. The it's the best example you've got. Because, because no, otherwise, you're jibber jabbering no, 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 I'm not. Haas, Haas. We the, need to get Huss, to the no, no, point the of reason, the I'm not. Haas, I'm I'm perfectly willing to throw out January six as an example. Yeah. The problem for you is that that's the best one you've got, because otherwise, what you have is just a toxic community that is voting badly. No, no, it's not just that. It's a division that has cut across the social fabric of the American people 
that most people would recognize and acknowledge, but you're not doing for pedantic reasons. But now, how, let's qualify though, the bear, why, we're talking about what makes them part okay, of let, let me let me let me qualify what I'm talking about, and then you can give me your critique because you're taking this into directions that are irrelevant. Okay, All right. I'm I'm going to simplify this. I'm listening. Okay? So, and don't interrupt me, by the way, because we're not getting in the weeds of your bullshit. We're going to just simplify this. Okay. So, in the case of enmity, we are dealing with a conventional ground of political existence, which is not only the sacred institution of democracy in the formal electoral process, but everyone being uh, interpolated, I don't know if that's too big of a word for you, as the same political subject of the liberal democracy by the mainstream institutions of society. So to translate that to you, at the end of the day, no matter how we vote, we're all Americans and we're all on the same team. And we can at least all agree that, you know, we're, we don't hate each other. We don't see each other as an enemy, right? But with the rise of the MAGA movement, there's a perception from one side, for example, that these people are not even American anymore. This is the Russian agents. Or these people, to be fair with you, are the globalists. They're not true Americans. So you have a level of enmity that just if you interpret it at the level of the information being communicated before January 6th even happens, at the level of the information being communicated, it is enmity. It's a position of political enmity. No, no, I, I, I understand that. And I'm in agreement with you, obviously. I, I, I've mentioned multiple times there are, there are demographics within America that they have marked out as the enemy. The enemy, like that implies enmity. Um, but we're talking about what makes them partisan. And that's not the sole distinction because, again, the friend enemy distinction is the, hey, the most the most clear case beautiful. of the political in any. Context. I'll explain that in one second, okay? Uh, if you just don't interrupt me, I'll explain. And not one second exactly, but not too long, okay? So the reason I'm saying the enmity thing matters is because that enmity is cut across the line of an established conventional form of politics that used to contain and be the vessel of political difference and a completely new um, political movement that is f that has its guns metaphorically pointed against that. And that's the distinction in which the enmity is based. One is unconventional, one is conventional. So one is partisan and the other is based in the no, hegemony. No, 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 no. So what, what I mean by partisan, by the way, let me just do this simple, simplifying, okay? Uh, One is partisan because it's actually a political stance. It's an actual political stance that will go so far as, yes, January 6th can be an example of that. But it's actually real, a real political partial subjectivity, partisan subjectivity. It's not like one system with two parties where, okay, no matter our differences, we're all on the same side. No, it's actually partisan, really partisan, with regard to the entire system and the hegemony. So that's important. Real no. politics has not existed in America just, for just, a long you time. You said you were going to explain you, how it's partisan. American you said politics, that it's partisan. But because here's why. Because before MAGA, politics in America is like a sports game. You have different sports and teams, but it's still the NBA. It's still on the same court, right? MAGA is what upsets that. And that's what I'm trying to say. That's why the enmity thing matters. Okay, but a partisan, people... a, a partisan isn't just any splinter group within a political party, Haas. That's not what that means. What? It's not about the political party. It's about the entire, basically, in functional, practical reality, the state. The state but but we already have state. multiple parties then. Parties themselves aren't simply partisan. Like, obviously, but the party, term is a common parties, root in German, no, but when I we're agree. talking about the partisan, we're talking the something two different. two parties are not partisan. I agree with that because they're subsumed by a single hegemony. MAGA alone is truly, actually partisan, a real partisan stance. But how? Here, here's, here's where you're, you're losing me, okay? Because you have a violent event. Because it's that, a no, no, no. Hang, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Just, that goes one, beyond. One, one sec. Just one sec. One sec. You have a violent event that sort of roughly corresponds to the kind of thing you would expect for a person. No, forget January 6th. We don't have to mention it. But if we forget it, we'd lose this one, and you want this one. This one's important, okay? No, I don't even this, need No, no. This one, this one helps it never you. Happened yet. This one helps you. No, no. Let's this... pretend it never even happened yet. Let's pretend it's January 5th right now. And let's have this debate because you get into the weeds of so much irrelevant bullshit. Let's just talk about what I was mentioning before at the level of information. Clearly, okay, but, but then literally, literally all you have then is, is like a subgroup within a party 
that is generally disdained. That's not a part of which has, but hold on, it's not a subgroup within a party because it has polarized the country down the middle. But okay? but it did it didn't though because the Republican it, Party, as we were talking about earlier, is itself bifurcated between MAGA and the Republican. Right, and but the who divide are, who, is between on, the two mainland but, parties, not between but them. But the Republican Party is bifurcated. What are the demographics? Is it really a popular social base of the rhinos? No, they don't have a popular social base. They have suburbanites that are rapidly. Well, going neither does the neither does MAGA though. Like like if, if you look at the dem if you look yes, at the dem does. MAGA does have a popular social base. If you go down to East Palestine, Ohio, and talk to a random guy, he'll be for MAGA. There's chances he will be. Who who are you gonna go find some random guy who likes Mitch McConnell? I'm sorry. I don't. I, if you go to the gas station, you're not going to find. I, I a guy think. I think you're. You're, you're, not, of, uh... no, you're. You're not. You're not following me here. The point is whether or not there are a lot of people who are uh, invested. It's a popular. In it's a movement of the people. It's. A I know it's pop. I'm not saying it's not popular, but you, okay. You know, what was what was he even arguing against? Fuck. Well, so okay, Sunday. This is the debate. You're saying, obviously, my concept of the partisan is not identical to Schmidt's, but you're saying Schmidt directly contradicts mine, and that's not. But I don't he, think that's But he does, and moreover, you don't. You he don't does derive. It, no, no, but but you haven't given is, me one example. You you identifying this as a partisan movement is critical to to your thesis, but yeah. you seem to pull it from nowhere. So if you're just making it up, no, I don't. I've given you multiple reasons why I think. It can be characterized as a partisan. Yeah, but every because, single one of your because reasons it operates are like this. Imagine... outside. Hold on, because it operates outside the established form of politics. Done. But it Done. doesn't, though. It really okay. Doesn't. Why does? Then let's debate about that instead of arguing about semantics. Why don't you think it operates outside the established form of politics? Because it engages in the same system as everybody else in the. So same you're manner. saying because they participate in the electoral process, that means it's not outside the established form of politics. That would actually be a critical one, but in addition to that, um, they also uh, use the same sources for propagand for propagandization for propaganda propagandism. Even propaganda. even if I were to uh, concede that extremely tenuous and outright wrong point, that's not tenuous. You have literally nothing that distinguishes them except for fee fees. Like that doesn't do it. I'm sorry. No, what distinguishes them is that it's a unified movement built on collective tr distrust toward the status quo and toward the hegemony. That's not just Fifi's. That's actually like but a. But that, that also. Uh, so the for other, example, the other Republicans they, also complain about the mainstream media. They might and about but, globalists yeah, and about might, like all these. They like, might. They might. They but do. Ask them what they think that's about. That's their the bread media. and butter. Hold on. They might. But ask them when push comes to shove, who is more likely to be critical of U.S. foreign interventions: the MAGA movement or these people you're mentioning, and why is that? Them, them having policy preferences vis-a-vis -vis foreign it's intervention. It's not just policy preferences. No, no, no. But they they, those are, are policy preferences, though. Huz, Huz, by the hegemony's Huz, agenda. Huz, MAGA people are not flying to, to, to where the United States has military interests and subverting them. They don't have, dude. They, even they, the military, but but well, what you're referring to, to are opinions. They're just opinions. They don't have to. We're talking about the. We're talking about the uh, the Third World War, according to uh, Marshall Mc... I don't know how to pronounce his name. Information warfare. It's a national security concern, according to the military. It's important. What do you think the Russiagate thing was about? You think uh, information war is not a theater of war? It is, according to the U.S. military, it is. Okay, but, but a foreign... A, a foreign power uh, being speculated to bankroll... A, a, a political movement ah. in the country doesn't make that political movement partisan. It's it actually kind of the opposite. It, it definitely proves that according to the people in power, they don't see this movement as coming from their own hegemony. So whether they want to attribute it to Russia or Timbuktu, but that doesn't it's not matter. coming from their own be, uh, houses, that's for sure. Pause, that so that's the point. That doesn't matter. It does matter because no. it means that... No, look, 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 look. There, there was a point in time. There was that a point in time. means they're outside the establishment pause, of the pause, policy. Now, doesn't pause, it? Pause, pause. There was a point in time when Catholic presidential candidates were heavily discriminated against on the grounds that they thought they would be influenced by the Catholic Church. That does not make... By Catholic... the hegemony? Hold on. By the post-war uh, globalist hegemony that we're talking about? By what? By prejudiced people on the ground, prejudiced hillbillies living in uh, 
some rural part of America? By whom were they accused of this? It matters because one represents the... No, uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't one, matter. One because... represents, yes, because one represents the hegemony of the homogeneous Plus. universal state, and the other represents prejudices Plus. of some the, 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 the farmer in Idaho. The def... What a political organization or movement is ontologically is not determined by what its critics call it. That that doesn't work. No, but nobody's reducing it to that, but it's clearly an example of how even the ruling class recognizes them as outside the established form of politics. If they're accusing Russia of being behind the MAGA movement but every they, they day, don't, they Rachel don't Maddow, no, no, clearly international, even the, no, no, international... Even, even, even the mainstream media recognizes international media meddling is policy. international media meddling is ubiquitous. It's done in Hold both on. directions. How could MAGA be be an extension of the established form of politics when the established? I didn't say it was an extension of the established form of politics. They engage. So it's outside the established form of politics. politics. No, no, so they engage. They engage in conventional forms of politics. Is it outside the established form of politics? Yes or no? No. <laughs> but then how could that be when they're accusing it of having Russian origin? Why would they because say that? Because them being accused of having Russian origins, even by the way, if they're correct, doesn't make them uh, unconventional in terms of their political activities. So is Russia of part of the established form of U.S. politics? What? Is Do you think Russia is part of the established form of U.S. politics? No. And how can MAGA be coming from Russia? I didn't say MAGA was coming but from the, Russia. But the establishment thinks it did. It also doesn't matter if MAGA is coming from Russia. We're talking about the form of the organization. Yeah, if, okay, dude, the even the establishment recognizes MAGA doesn't come from the established form of politics because they think it comes from Russia, which you accept is not part of the established form of politics. Kind of simple, dude. Sorry, what's simple? That MAGA is not part of the established form of politics and is outside of it. No, no, no. It, a partisan is not defined by being a part of established politics or being outside. Okay, now we're partisan back into semantics. We're back. No, into no, not semantics. not semantics. This yeah, is we the are definition because of thing. You, we just agreed that we're going to get out of semantics and talk about whether it's inside or outside the established. Well, well no, Haas. As per how do you want to go back to what the uh, definition uh, of a partisan uh, is, dude? As you, per, you're President Semantics. You're not President Sunday. You're President Semantics. I'll take it, Haas. As per your insistence, we are discussing theory. This means we are discussing concepts. You need to be able to justify your concepts. Okay, concept. my concept of the partisan, in the case of MAGA, one of the reasons MAGA is partisan is because it's outside the established form of politics. There's other reasons we can get into the weeds of, but you seem to object to the label of partisan. No, no, no because, because, because look, 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 here, here's, how you, here's how you define a concept, right? A, a thing is defined by being X, Y, and Z, and maybe not no, being No, it's not strictly ABC. justified. That's a one-sided, undialectical view, because there's a lot of other things, too. Well, no, it's not undialectical or one-sided. It is undialectical. Just, no, yeah. no, no, because I've actually just referenced the, the, the corresponding... Defining a thing, a thing in the definition. Reducing something to any kind of definition whatsoever, one that, definition that's how concepts is undialectical. That, that's that's concept undialectical. Is. No, I, I, I understand that. I understand that. But okay, Frederick Engels calls it undialectical explicitly. So that's well, what he when, thinks. When I die, Marx will judge me. But when we're dealing with okay. concepts. Well, I'm, I mean by dialectics what Engels When we're means. dealing with definitions, we are quite literally dealing with what a thing is and what a thing is not. Okay. MAGA. Because even, even if, even if we want to take I a dialectical. Say, no, no, say, because Haas, Haas, even if we want to take a dialectical approach. We have to know what the dialectic is between. If we can't differentiate our concepts, then we can't do that. No, dialectics means you don't just look at something in a one-sided sense. You look at the broader... No, but you need sides, right? That still implies lines between things. Okay, but you've still just brought definitions. up one. You've just brought up one, and there's multiple. One what? It's outside the established form of politics, and, for example... It has a specific relation to the American. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be outside the oh. established form of politics. For example, no, no. For example, yeah, I think it does. I think it does. It it doesn't. For to example, to be partisan, it does. No, not ne not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Explain. In, in no no the reason the reason why um you end up being able to characterize revolutionary um political actors as being partisans in present day is because we have the total politicization of, of the entire population. But for example, you can have partisans that are deeply embedded in conventional politics in the case of an invading force occupying a territory and nonetheless, despite the fact that in international law, 
they would have the right to to govern with a certain minimal degree of humanity the area that they are occupying. Yeah, it's so um, they're nonetheless it's undercutting. So Sunday, what conventional stupid. formal politics exists when a foreign country takes over your fucking? How does well, that? Well, 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 well. For example, well, for example, um, it may be the case that this place is occupied, but they still maintain the institutions and the police force, and and let them run more or less. Which no longer has place. any sovereignty. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have sovereignty. Okay, but that so is it's neither outside, here nor there because we're so not talking. So, so it has no political power. Ergo, it is well, not. No, no, no. Because politics. no, it, it's it's been subsumed under the sovereignty of an invading force. But okay, but the sovereignty of the invading force is the. But new therefore, but but hang on, hang on, hang on. Just because of that, Dude, this though, is does, so stupid. This is so no. It's it's stupid. not because the yeah, entire not, point. No, no, Haas, 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 Haas. The entire point so of the partisan. Stupid, no, the what entire point. Haas. The entire point of the partisan is that it's irregular vis-a-vis -vis conventional state-based okay, military your argument. forces. Let me nuke your argument. Let me nuke your argument. When an invading force comes nuke and takes argument, over your Haas. country. When the invading force comes and takes over your country, they become the new established form of politics. Any vestigial prior... No, 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 no. You're, you're confused. Any vestigial, the, the established prior, form... convention, any vestigial no, no, no. prior convention of politics subsumed under their sovereignty Us. when weaponized against them is indeed outside the established form of politics because the established form of politics is the no, no, invading... The, the, the established form of politics is not defined new. by there being a persistent sovereign oh my god power. yes it was because no politics, no that's why no no Haas, Haas, yes, the, the, politics Haas, is i thought power. you were a marxist Huz, the entire international system politics of liberal Huz, stop wait 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 wait, wait wait okay president sunday the entire international system of liberal states is itself conventional and if people are taking part in politics consistent with that then vis-a-vis -vis that they they are engaging in political conventions this is why we have for example the idea of international law and the idea of the partisan which specifically emerges from a case of of uh of, of an invading force having the occupancy of a region and then being undermined by criminal by, by what they would deem to be criminal actors on the tail as they pass through like okay. this, this is like resistance movements and things like that. These are partisans. And so, yes. so politics is based in power. And if this um, priorly established by convention form of sovereignty is recognized by some international system, then the international system is the real hegemony, in which case it's not really a partisan movement, at least from a global perspective. It's part of the international hegemony you're talking about, if you're talking okay. about that. See, see, look, like you say politics this, like this is, is about a... power. No, no, it's but you say about... this. You say this like this is a statement with content. Politics is about power. You may as well just say politics is super duper with how much content you put there. But you know, but you know, you know what's stupid? Especially power is not power is not defined Schmidt by uses, sovereignty. Schmidt uses the example, for example, of the peasant rural agrarian partisan, which is very much rooted in forms of power or forms of politics at the village level and local level that are oftentimes subsumed by a greater force. And it's still deployed in a revolutionary way that's outside the established form of politics. So just because there's a structure well, that's the distinct. reason, though, the reason, though, is because in the event of an occupying force with internal to the occupied territory, a state of stability with a police force and with government in place, nonetheless, actors can not, independently or as or as uh, in some sense power. or in some sense, illicit groups can still engage in violent or insurrectionary action vis-a-vis -vis the invading force. So, for example, you can have resistance movements that do not have the sanction of government, do not have the sanction of any like police force or any military, but nonetheless, by their own by their own uh, lights and direction, will, uh, will 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 bomb supply lines, will assassinate like enemy enemy like officials or whatever, and and like this is one of the reasons why as well. Um, Schmidt points out that there may indeed need to be a, a situation which we have to consider the. Um, the, the, uh, the, the what does that even have to do civilian with civilian population as itself requiring protection from the partisans? Sorry. Okay, but the fact. What are you saying? The partisans establish a new. I'm saying MAGA. Partisan? I'm saying the MAGA movement is not partisan. What you're talking about. But no, that has not, none of what you just said. They're because they're, they're not bombing supply lines. What are you trying to say? They're not doing anything that partisans do, and they vote conventionally like everybody they're else. Not doing any of the things Schmidt observed partisans to do in his time, but we're in an information warfare age. Where okay. I'm, I have a Plus, new concept of the partisan. I just rejected the idea that Schmidt Plus, contradicts. Being an edge lord on YouTube right. does not make you a partisan either. No, it no, it doesn't. But being part one? of a broader 
being part of a broader political movement that is built on collective distrust toward the reigning institutions of society when you're when you're situated in that context you're part of a broader partisan no uh, vosh you're a liberal remember sorry what so yeah sunday you you haven't engaged with the point at all you object to the view that maga is outside the established form of politics i find that baffling but you your argument able... is only that you find it baffling. so it's let me let me get to the president sunday's argument is that maga is not outside the established form of politics it's not bombing supply lines okay good luck that has no explanation hey, hey hey look look if you can produce something else bombing supply lines is not exhaustive of all the things you can do that would be uh irregular um, and by the way, unconventional is not my term. That's that's your term. Um, irregular is is not exhausted by the unconventional, and the unconventional oh God, is not sufficient to ground the regular. Or Holy irregular. shit! Now we're gonna hinge on the difference between irregular and unconventional. It's a theoretical discussion, Haas. We are talking about the concept. No, you're they're deploying, the same. If you're you know what? Them in a I'm way gonna put my track. foot down and just say irregular and unconventional are the same fucking thing like they're not we're not i'm not this is such a no no because the irregular the irregular can be contained within conventions and indeed they are like for example the geneva no, convention can't. is partially no, concerned with, with dealing with non combat with uh, okay. irregular combat irregular and unconventional can refer and often do refer to the exact same thing so we're going to stop with can, this semantics. not in this down. case. In fact, if you've actually read Schmidt's okay. essay, this is directly President talks semantics, about. let's get to the That's objective. not semantics. This is actually the, the no, substance of the theory. No, this is fucking semantics. This is fucking obscure semantics. No, it's this really is, short. Anybody can no, watch it. It's like, it, it, read it. It's like a 50-page so essay. There, short. Can, there can be irregular activity that is situated within regular activity. That's how fucking stupid you sound. No, 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 no. The, the category of the irregular can be subsumed under conventions, right? We're doing so when we talk about it right now. The category of irregular can be subsumed by regularities. No, no, by by. Well, well, actually, yeah. Why are, if it's so different? Because it's with because because it's, it's not so absolute. Stupid. No, no, Haas. It's, it's not absolute. Haas, Haas. We're talking about international law here. We're not talking about like absolute metaphysical irregularity. We're talking about irregularity with respect to conventional military forces, as those are understood by the canon of 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 military and political thinking. Okay, what is the point of raising this pedantic legalistic? Because, because what, what you're calling what you're calling a We're talking about theory. We're not talking about international law. International law is, is going to be, it's it's law, Haas. What is what is law comprised of? Because when someone refers to an it has to be interpreted. It's, it's, it's when someone when someone refers to an unconventional method of warfare and an irregular method of warfare, they tend to be referring to the same things. Well, no, not necessarily. Um, un unconventional. I didn't say necessarily. Up. I said they. No, tend no, to. because no, no, because this is actually no, where. They don't tend to. No, no, okay, no. This, this is where. Hus, hus. In, in the context of talking about military issues, conventional can refer, uh, for example, to the types of weaponry deployed, but not actually, uh, not actually. But what I said was conventional warfare. But, but. That does not touch on whether the, the units involved are regular or irregular. Like, for example, state armies can engage in unconventional warfare, but it can be comprised entirely of regular troops. Okay, what's your point? I, I said in unconventional warfare. Irregular warfare and unconventional warfare. Irregular warfare is, is referring to the types of actors involved, not the types of war involved. I'm referring to the type of war. In which case, irregular once warfare, again, once again, once irregular again, irregular warfare in which case, Haas, 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 but, but Haas, if that is indeed where you're, you're going to fall on this, then the sword you're falling on is you have one violent event that, uh, no, contra that's that, that, not, that stands that's apart not, from again, politics as usual, what, essentially, we're living in, which you disavow. January 5th, it's January 5th, 2021. And that's it. And yes, happened. yes, yes, yes. That's what I just said. So what you've got then is you've got a bunch of, of meanie douchebags uh, who happen to vote in a way that a lot of people don't like, and some people speculate that they were paid off by by Russians at some point. Okay. But that's that's not irregular. And those, those people just so happen to not carry the baggage. Like of like the... similarly, similarly, oh, no, 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 like no, 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 like, like a lot of them will refer to Holy will shit. also accuse. Okay. Oh. And those like people, when you're invoking globalists, you're doing the same those, thing. Okay you're jibber jabbering those people happen to not carry the same baggage that for example the average uh the average political subject outside of the maga movement does therefore it is 
much easier for actual partisan political mo political partisan. ideologies, for example, to find fertile soil among the MAGA people. Unconventional warfare. Reason. So you're saying, oh, it's a bunch of it's a bunch of douchebags or whatever. Okay, well, those douchebags are more receptive. Like, who do you think, even if you want to refer to real warfare, where do you think the American militia movement will find more fertile soil? The MAGA movement or Starbucks baristas? It's okay. like it's so fucking stupid. Hey, hey, hey. no, 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 house, house. I'm not saying I'm not saying they can't be a partisan movement. Who's calling for the abolition of the FBI? I don't know who's situating themselves against the entire state. I mean, issue. I mean, I, I, think, I don't know. I it's a not lot the of people are, a lot of people advocate for the abolition of the FBI. Huh? They, but they're not. But nobody takes them seriously. They take the MAGA people seriously for a reason when they say that. Because there's actual political sitting us, members. Us, OK, I, 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 I really I really th this conventionally regular point is actually kind of important. Conven unconventional warfare includes drone warfare. Are, are drones partisans? Are drone pilots partisans? Uh, unconventional warfare can just refer to asymmetric warfare. No, that's called asymmetric warfare. No, unconventional. But, no, 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 no. You're actually wrong. Unconventional warfare refers there to. There are the, multiple. No, I, us, I get, us, I get us, there us. are multiple senses no, no. of the word unconventional. You're you're but, you're wrong here, though. Unconventional warfare. There are multiple warfare. senses us, of the word just, unconventional. Just unconventional can refer second. to us. I've let you speak that are just, novel just technological chill. developments. No, no, no. I also I'm, refer to uh, what Carl Schmitt us, describes in us, asymmetric warfare. Us. Unconventional warfare is engaged in by an agent as a strategy. Asymmetrical warfare is a description of a situation in which you have one force that has some set of characteristics and another one that has different characteristics. So, for example, a state-based army we know what it versus means they get to the criminal point. insurgency. Okay, I, we know I, what it means, but you're saying I can't use the word unconventional to describe that form of warfare, even though it was no, 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 no. for I, all I, intents and purposes. No, I, that's not what I'm saying. When Schmidt was describing, for Pause. example, if, if you, Napoleon if you want... fighting the, uh, the Spanish guerrillas in Spain, or, for example, the forms of partisan warfare that emerged in World War II, which were unconventional, right? So Yes. Okay, like so French unconventional can... et cetera, be, guerrillas. Yeah, unconventional can describe guerrilla warfare. What? No, that, that's, that's asymmetric warfare by irregular forces. <laughs> it's so stupid. You, no, no. There's no sense in which one can refer to guerrilla force. Well, one directly, one directly, one directly is invoking conventions. Uh, dude, Huss, one, this is, dude, this is, you know what? One is, Sunday, Huss. this is the Huss. jibber jabber palace of semantics. I don't want to dwell in this palace with you. Let's just get to the point of the actual debate. I, besides semantics, please. I know you're stunned because you're President Semantics. You have nothing beyond no, Semantics. No, 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 you it, no. If we're getting to the point, then please, God, get to the point. Um, I should have, I should have set an endpoint on this. That was a poor decision making on my part. Um, I figured, I figured you were a busy guy. You would just have like, oh, we're gonna do this for like an hour. Not, not. Yeah, okay, I know. Just, welcome to hell, people. It, no, no, no. I'm we're, we're all here together <laughs> as, as, um, as compatriots. Okay, the point, Haz. You said you mentioned a point. I missed those. What? do you have to say please is that me or sunday no you were going to say Haas, so go right ahead what let's let's coalesce this let's bring this to a non-partisan point okay well he was objecting to my uh, use of the word partisan to describe the maga movement all i meant to but i mean something very specific by that he doesn't want to level with me there so Sunday, how so are you do you even intend to meaningfully? No, I really, I really do. But the problem though is that you're using terms in a contradictory fashion because what's contradictory? I, I'll can I explain? So when when I say that no, a partisan has to engage in in irregular action, and your point of reference for irregular action is they are in some sense unconventional and your point of reference for unconventional is they have particular attitudes towards particular things and you will even disavow the one case that would actually work in your favor of like an actually violent action that has I, I think, I think, potential i think it's uh i think trump's within the frame of information warfare trump's kind of phenomenalization of the american state in his MAGA movement is both irregular and unconventional. How about how about this? So if, if we're talking about information, let, let's like let's try and find like a 
corresponding equivalent in, in, in information warfare, okay? Um, what I would look for there is I would look for a, a political movement that is engaged in somehow, uh, in, in a serious way, actually subverting the function of the mediums through which that information is conveyed. So uh, that, that can range from like uh, somehow subverting uh, uh, like algorithmic tools. It could be maybe you do the V for Vendetta thing and you hijack a TV station. I don't know, but something like that. You realize that. information warfare also includes a war of soft power and ideology, not just uh, the okay, so, so it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, so it, it, it literally means nothing then to you. It's just whatever you need to. No, talk because about. there there is an ideological well, superstructure. What, what is soft? MAGA what is soft does power? obscure the ability for it to be disseminated. Okay, but. That's what the whole fake news thing was about that everyone was talking okay, about. Okay, but, but soft power isn't a form of politics. Soft power is the purposing I of... The government disagrees with you. The State Department what? disagrees with you. The governments of every country disagree no, with you. So, the, the yeah. soft and hard, no, no, the distinction between soft... The distinction between... No, no. Yes, it yeah. is. Information war involves soft power because soft power includes information. But... Soft power and and hard power are distinctions introduced um, by uh, international relations theorist Joseph Nye to talk about the purposing of different types of of forces there we to go. compel so political action. What I mean, you have to give it etym etymological fucking. That, that's not etymological though. I'm, I'm telling you. I know it's not etymological, but you have to give some kind of like def like. Uh, encyclopedic fucking description of the term. No, I the use. difference is... Why are you so fixated on terms? Because you know I what know I mean what they mean, mean and you're making it up as you go. No, dude, you don't. we don't need an encyclopedia, a Wikipedia article for every word I use. We don't need to go through in 1704. It was the first usage of this term by Joseph uh, Semantic. you introduced these terms like, and you dude, haven't what? justified them. Okay, and, what and I that, that would be there? fine by okay. itself if oh, all you were so, doing so was just Sunday, naming Sunday. things. This is a perfect example. No, no, of hang on. Faith. Hang this on. Is no, no, wait. This a perfect example of your bad faith debate wait. tactic. What do uh, I mean by soft power? What do I mean by information warfare? What do you mean by I soft mean power? That, okay, what I mean by soft power is that MAGA is engaged in uh, forms of information that contradict the soft power aims of U.S. But you you haven't, you're not defining soft power. You're just involving soft power in another sentence about something else. Okay, soft power are the forms by which... Uh, the U.S. exercises its hegemony that are this non is, no, 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 just not has, directly soft power by itself. What is it when you say the U.S. uses soft power? What are they using? I was literally um, trying to give a description of that, but I don't wrong. believe you. Can you just just do it, okay? And then it's not, you're not, if you don't believe me, then how can I say it? You're just going to keep interrupting me because you don't believe me a priori. Like, dude, let me talk, okay? Soft power is cultural. Soft power is through the media. Soft power is through what ideas are being spread. Soft power is what kind of sentiments are being cultivated. Those are all forms of soft power, for example. Do you believe me now, Sunday? So when you say, because they engage in information warfare, the content of that is they engage in information warfare, because you've just recapitulated that. Dude, because every, because look, I could literally, okay, what is the, what does the word the mean? Uh, it's an it's an article specifying a particular. So it's, so the just means the. No, it's an article specifying a particular. So the I just. The, means I am referring so to. All I'm you just said was the means the dude. We're never going to be able to communicate now because you're trying to like. You're, do I literally have to? No, like, no. Uh, hang do on. I literally have to like um have a lightning bolt and like. I'm just I'm just a little confused. Do I have to, are, like, you, up, are you are you no, like, are you across the Discord pause, pause video screen are, and like like pause. um. Kind of enforce the. Um, ha, 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 is, is your example of me being like pedantic based words? on? Like, ha, dude, it, all it, words are. You know, all words are metonymic, right? They're always going to refer to other words that, in a tautological way, just describe what that word means. Wait, I'm trying to give you examples. No, that's not right? true. Hold on, that's not true. President Sunday. That one one thousand percent, it's true. Hold on, one moment, President Sunday. Uh, ma yes. Make your point, and then I would like to say something. Go ahead, please. No, uh, you go. You go ahead. I got nothing. Okay, um, so this is what we're arriving at, and when I say we're arriving at, what I mean is we've been at for nearly four hours, an insurmountable gap, okay? This is a river that you cannot cross, and this is a difference in communication styles. Um, it is, in, in, in the humble opinion of this moderator, um, the responsibility 
of people trying to communicate their ideas to understand the language of the people they're talking to. Uh, you two speak very different languages. This might literally be insurmountable. So the goal then is to understand the concepts that are being discussed, the basic ideas on a fundamental enough level that you can talk through it without needing to grasp the subtleties of the language that's being used. We've been arguing the definition of partisans for a long time now. I'm willing to bet that whichever of you came out on top, if ever there could be a winner in that discussion, uh, it would be immaterial to the broader point, or at least very minorly so. Probably because this is one of what could be like an innumerable number of such discussions. So leaving aside definitions, if we could avoid definitions entirely, if we could just communicate as much as is possible in a vibes-based fashion, let's move on to the next point. Obviously, working away from definitions means that it's difficult to mount a more systemic critique, President Sunday, because definitions are important. They're not unimportant. They're just um, leading us in a really circular conversation. Um, so if at all possible, I would like it if we could um, gesture at definitional problems rather than getting into the weeds, because we clearly can't get anything from that. Is that fine with okay. both of you? Because I don't think there's an alternative. Yeah. So I oh, will wait. try. To... You've said yeah. Haas? Oh, sorry, not Haas. You're Haas. Um, President Sunday as well, yeah? Or I would like to make one final remark, if that's all right. It's a short one. Okay, as long as it's a pair to Haas's yeah, you know, affirmation, disagreement, go ahead. I just want to note, as, as like a final observation on this, that he has simultaneously denied Russia's involvement in MAGA while also relying on Russia's involvement in MAGA in order to justify it being... Oh, I did it. I, all I need to rely upon is the accusation that Russia's involved, which implies that, at the very least, the ruling hegemony doesn't think it comes... Well, that's weaker than them actually being involved, so that's not great either, but whatever. Yeah, so you were wrong on that point. Well, I, don't, no, I, I wasn't. It doesn't mean Russia has to be behind it. It just means that there's a perception, even among the ruling class, it's not coming from them, it's coming from somewhere else. I think it comes from the American people, not Russia, by the way. And I think the American people are just as alien to the elites as Russia is. And that's my whole point about why they're partisan. You mean the American people who are like slashed down the middle by, by MAGA? That, that, that's the uh, the all... people who were left behind and forgotten about completely. The real people. The established... all right. The, uh, you know, the people who lost all their jobs in the Midwest and the flyover states and so on. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I didn't, it shouldn't have gotten that deep. I'll just simplify it really completely. I think that MAGA has disrupted American politics in an unprecedented way and that anyone who's interested in alternative political ideas in general will probably have a better chance working within the MAGA movement than working within. The Hang on, this is the commercial. Okay, well, I'm just trying to make a point for you to disagree with, but... No, we're not, because we're moving on to the next section, whatever that is. I'm not... Okay, well, I was trying to move it on to something, but you... I, I, I agree that this semantically counts as a closer to the um, previous topic of discussion. Haas, continue what you were saying, and then President Sunday, your final thoughts, and then we will move on. No, no, we can, we can close that other one, if that's... Because I thought that other one was just a black hole, and I'm, I'm going to reset it so we can actually debate. Do you have any final thoughts then, uh, President Sunday, on that specific nope. subject? Not really, no. Okay. So, since you're the one mounting the critiques then, President Sunday, was there another subject you wanted to bring up? Again, I know it's a long document, and I uh, have no idea how far down it's, it's It's a very long document, and the, the essence of what I was... What I was primarily interested to discuss was the conceptual stuff that leads to this conclusion, which is what we were just talking about before, which is why we got hung up on the partisan thing, because that's that's what all this hinges on. Um, I am, I'm not sure what else there is to talk about. I, I suppose it's a little bit, except, except for once again, remarks on like the strangeness of some sentences. So for example, one thing that just sticks in my mind is quote, a complete takeover of the Hitlerite kind is all but now inevitable, which will attempt to satisfy the patriotic, patriotic aspirations of the mega movement into consensus for war, a war which will seek to preserve the power of the bankers and globalists. I, it's it's odd, but there's there's not a whole lot else to right. go off of here. Want to go deeper on it? What you find out about it? or No, because you're just going to, we're just going to loop. So I, okay. I don't know. Is there anywhere you want to go? I brought it up, but I stand by that statement. Yeah, 
Yeah, but you understand why it's funny, right? Can you define funny for me? I just, I think not, you're using No, that not even as a joke. <laughs> just not even. Not, well, not, just why? Can, do, you, do you know why so he Do you have anything funny? besides jokes, Sunday? No, I, 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 do, I want an answer. That I think that was a valid question, Haas. Do you, do you understand why he might have an issue with that statement, just at the face of things? Um, my best guess is that he uh, is confused about why there's tendencies in MAGA which might be exploited for a consensus for war, while there's also simultaneously tendencies that can be in the other direction. I think it's an intermediate strata generally, and that's the whole point of kind of Gromsky's idea of hegemony and even Lenin's notion of the uh, two tactics. Where no, he but that. What I'm getting at here is that uh, <laughs> is that you, you, you fear a takeover of the Hitlerite kind, which is all but now inevitable, but then you, 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 you place this, the responsibility for this fear on the nefarious actions of bankers and globalists. The ruling class, yeah, who are definitely bank both bankers and globalists, oil bankers in particular, if you need to know, but yes, globalists as well. I mean, if you want, if you want, you can just say um, beneficiaries of the unipolar American system. If you don't like globalists, but it's pretty much the same well, thing. No, because uh, what what, ben what beneficiaries is, what isn't definite. You're not referring to a particular group of person. Like, is is any who, who doesn't benefit in some capacity from? So wait, okay. wait, 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 really quick really before before this spirals out, really quick. You said it was funny, President Sunday. Why? Is it the ambiguity of the term globalist? Is it the idea that a beneficiary could... It's maybe, it's maybe the juxtaposition broadly? of bankers and globalists as, an, as a nebulous, uh, world-manipulating cabal um, as, as the, the, the hypothetical or, or theorized... Uh, Not a cabal. It's not not a cabal. Okay, they're they're no, nope. they're they're partisans. Globalists. Okay, know. to be honest, globalists probably refers to like more like you know think tank people. The, the ideas that are coming from the think tanks and the bankers are referring to where the money for those think tanks is coming from. That's just a, don't reduce it all to the think tanks, but that's an example. No, but you 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 know you know you know you know you know goddamn it. well that you worded this in such an ambiguous way so that somebody who wants to read Jew there will read Jews. <laughs> you know what's funny? That, you, that, that was, that was funny? You thought Jew. Globalism is referring to the post-war globalist. That's, that's not, I don't think at least, that's not a primarily Jewish thing. Jews in the traditional anti-Semitism are accused of being internationalists. International... International as opposed, to, as, opposed to, as opposed to globalists, internationalists as opposed yeah, to Yeah, because globalism is encompassing not just continental Europe and maybe the Americas, although anti-Semitism was never that popular in the Americas, but through continental Europe, there was the idea that, all oh, the Jews are internationalists, they're not loyal okay, to any sure, of us. Sure, but... And they stabbed us to the back in World War I. You're, you're, but the you're... global system, there, I don't even think... In most people's head, if okay. I call a MAGA person, yeah, the globalist, they're going to go, sure, yeah, but you're, I don't think they're going to think Jews, right? You're, you're, you're a Duganist who primarily relies on people like Schmidt and Heidegger, and you're trying to appeal to the MAGA movement. Uh, with, I, with... Could, I could probably accept Schmidt and Heidegger are probably anti-Semitic in some sense, but Dugan is not. If you say so. Um, but by the way, uh, where, where do you, where do you, wanna, explain... where do you want to go next? I, I don't. I don't know. Like, I don't know. So I, my sure. my my analysis here is exhausted largely because it was intractable in literally every. By the way, well, I'd, 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 I'd like to yeah. add something if I may. Yeah. Um. I I stepped out of line a little while earlier by being a bit too inquisitory and doing more of a debate than a moderator thing. That's just me sliding into familiar habits. But I do want to ask this, Haz. Um. Regardless of how you may feel about the term, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that Nazis do use globalist as a dog whistle. Obviously, that doesn't I, mean I the am. term. I am, but I think that's more of a niche internet 
ideology kind of thing. Whereas on the ground, when I talk to people and they say globalist, who are not like terminally online, like boomers, for example, they do not mean Jews. They are talking about, you know, people in Washington and Wash. Walsh- they're not, they don't, I don't think anti-Semitism is that prevalent on the ground as it is online among younger people. I agree so, that lots of people use the term outside of an anti-Semitic context. I mean, if you go back and you look at some of the stuff that Bernie Sanders has said, for example, um, if you were really uncharitable, well, he's Jewish, but if you were really uncharitable, you could be like, ah, what do you mean by that? So it's not so much like the innate definition of the term or anything like that, but um, it is such an ambiguous term. Like to you, I, I ask, you say globalism. That I can think, mean a lot of stuff. Do you mean like food? Like, you know, they say a kebab on every corner, right? Do you want every yeah. country to be a cultural? Well, I think uh, I'm referring war? to I'm referring to this kind of uh, the ideology of the unipolar American system built after World War II. But, you know, I think it's it's an inherent in the nature of uh, anti-Semitism that, of course, when you say the ruling class, when you say those who rule us and those in power, just because you're not qualifying some specific theoretical analysis, will some people read that and say, oh, you're talking about Jews? Of course they will. But I don't think you bear the responsibility for that unless not you a, say it's on, Jews. On, on the subject of Dugan, does he not distinguish between quiet, loyal, good Jews and bad Jews who are the rest? Where, where does he do that? Um, this is referenced in a couple of places. Um, I am not a massive Dugan reader, but this seems to be... I, I, I am a Dugan reader, and I've never heard him say anything well, of you that might sort. Wanna, you might want to get up on that a little bit, because it seems like this is a... Thing I'm asking you to cite your sources about. on Dugan's anti-Semitism. Oh, I just, I just, I just searched um, Dugan and Jews because I was curious, and uh, it's, it seems to be a fairly ubiquitous point on that. Okay, give me citations. Um... Well, actually, give me one second. Yoram Hazoni apparently has a has an interesting quote. That would be an interesting one. Bear with me for one second. Just read it out and tell me where it's from. Uh, this is from Dugan by Yoram Hazoni, who is a Jewish conservative in the United States. If you're familiar with him. Okay. So um, it's, is it the Dugan's primary source? Somewhere else. This from Dugan, quote, completing the Palestinian genocide is also part of the Zionist plans. Then there will come a period of Jewish rule on a global scale when the peoples of the earth recognizing the supremacy of the Jews and submit to them. This is what Israel lives on. Where did Dugan uh, say that? Uh, this is quoted in the Asia Times, I believe. Let me pull this up. Yeah, please find the primary source because yeah, give me, give me it doesn't really sound I'm, like Dugan. I'm getting there. It kind of does, though, honestly. Um, okay. Here we go. Dugan is a... Uh, Russian, okay, so in his May 6 essay for the Chinese website, uh, which is called, here we go, Dugan's website, which is defunct, which makes sense. So this is, this is older. Um, but the quote is, the traditional pre-modern uh, European order was defeated and completely destroyed at the beginning of the 20th century. The, uh... that's not the quote, hang on. Here we go. Sorry, it's up here. I was reading a, a quote from somebody else. No, 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 no. The, the, on, on the article, um, it, it, it breaks after a photo of Dugan to uh, somebody else. So where's um, the quote? Hmm? <laughs> the quote, dude. Uh, right here. The Zionists did not recognize either the decision to create a Palestinian state. Where, where's the, the primary Israel source for that? What? Well, it appears, to be, it appears to be from Dugan's website, now defunct. We're, we're not here to debate this. I was just on, link, pointing out that this seems to be a common source, thread. Because I would be surprised if Dugan said that. So well, the, the primary source is defunct. It was Dugan's website. It's no longer Oh, so it doesn't... Oh, so it's... I guess, uh, that's, I guess we just have to take whoever's word. No, no, no. But I, I'm, not, I'm not leaning on yeah. Dugan being anti-Semitic. I just looked out of curiosity, and I found a bunch of quotes right, that well, seem to refer I'm to I'm not him. familiar with any... So this seems to be... Well, there's a lot of discourse about him being anti-Semitic, so it might be worth... Uh, yeah, he's, he's accused of that. He's accused, but of he's that. accused of that with 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 quotations. So if you want to prove those no, quotations are false, that would be interesting. I just want you to cite them from things he's actually said or written. Um, source or and Dugan. by the way, the reason I know Dugan is not anti-Semitic yeah, is because he has routinely defended. Judaism as a legitimate traditional re- religion of Russia. Okay, sure, but that's also, like that's like how Richard Spencer. He's also, he's no, 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 no. But hang on, R- Richard Richard Spencer. Argued. Richard Spencer insists 
that other care. other races should also have their own state to maintain their own cultural. But Dugan doesn't that say that. Dugan says races. Jews who are Russians are our brothers, and their religion is tradition a part of our civilization. Yeah, but he defines Dugan, he defines being Russian by being quiet and submissive to the Russian state. I don't know what you're talking about here, but Dugan. Uh, also says that he admires many of the aspects of Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah and so on. I don't ever see him say anything anti-Semitic, anything bad about Jews. I've never seen it. It would be a surprise to me, actually. But it's interesting how Jews just get brought up for no reason. I just think... Uh, that's well, no, no, they, they got brought up in this context because you're referring but to who is mentioning bankers where and globalists in the context okay. of fearing a Hitlerite takeover. Yeah, we are ruled by bankers and globalists. That is indeed true. Rockefellers when you're are specifically old. when you're specifically Dude, appealing, Rockefellers are not even Jewish. Rockefellers when you're, are the when you're speci- oil bankers. Sure, the when, oil when bankers you're when you're specifically are the appealing, Rockefellers when and you're they're specifically not when you're specifically appealing for merging communism with the MAGA movement in particular, which is who you're killing. Do you want to know why bankers and globalists matter? Because that's the form of monopoly capital today. I'm a Marxist-Leninist. It's supposed to be oh a united front against monopoly capital. That's the whole You're thing. not a Marxist-Leninist, though, because you keep defaulting to fetishizing the universal state. That's not a Marxist-Leninist position. That's a Hegelian position, which is the root of fascist ideology. No, it's not. It's yes, it is. Alex... That's literally what the doctrine no, of fascism Alexander, directly Alexander corresponds to. Geneva, no. Giovanni Gentili no, was. No, no, it's... Yes. Hegel yes. is not the legitimate basis of uh, Giovanni Gentili, who departs and breaks. He was a Hegel. Hegelian. What are you talking about? Giovanni Gentili breaks from Hegel in the most fundamental of ways. Uh, he's not a real Hegelian. He's not a... there. He doesn't. Yes. The universal state is also employed by Kojev to describe the Soviet Union. I think Stalin would agree with it. Kojev wrote a letter to Stalin uh, completely. uh, You can read it yourself. But no, it doesn't only... I mean, it originates with Hegel, yeah, but... Well, Stalin... I I argue that... So if you want to know the Marxist-Leninist position, which is the socialism in one country thing, civilization states and universal states will indeed survive, possibly for hundreds of years before the final dissolution of the state as such. But the Soviet Union, in Marxist-Leninist doctrine at least, is a, can be described as a universal state. And uh, there's nothing about that that's incompatible with Marxism-Leninism. No, no, it's actually direct, that's why Marx literally wrote the critique of the philosophy of right. Which was directly criticizing Hegel for fetishizing if a universal the state, state as a universal if form. If the universal state is based in the proletarian dictatorship, then Marxist criticisms don't apply because it's based in class struggle. But it's not. A, it's not a universal state if you still have class struggle schisming the whole thing, right? That's, that's yes, it is. That's precisely state. what makes it universal. But but it's it's not though. Yeah, it is because the proletariat is the universal class. So a, a state based on the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, which is suppressing the development of it's all... It's not the universal class if they have to be dictators, right? Yes, it is, because class... You didn't read my... You didn't listen to my opening statement. Class does not refer to discrete, strictly defined social formations fighting. It refers to but oscillations. It, does, it refers to virtualities competing over intermediate strata. So there's no pure proletariat or pure bourgeoisie. It's a virtual orientation. It's not, uh, it's not like, uh, you know... Cla- uh, classical physics of billiard balls hitting each other in the fucking in, in empty space. It's referring no, no, to classes, It's classes, referring to orientations. No, it's not just referring to orientations. Yeah, it is. Classes are no classes are defined by having real control over real resources or lacking thereof, or having real relationships based does, on okay, production or the sale of how, do, how does that no? How does that control work? This is like Marxist. Critique what do you mean? How does that control work? Because you think somehow that this is like the aggregate of individuals. How does, how does who who owns the, the material you, no. of production control work? How do they own it? Do they own it as the sum total of individuals enter into a Lockean agreement with each other to own it uh, on a basis of individual discrete? No, by, by social convention, no. um, the state reinforces their decision making capacity so with social. respect to yeah, it's, you're right. it's, it's, it's products and it's it's, it's, it's social, not individual. So yeah, class. What? 
does class that refers to something oh, social? They're, they're, of course, they're social. They're social classes, Haas. Yeah, that's my point, dude. So you can. Am I have having? A, a, I feel like I'm having a stroke. The you the pro, first of all, the proletariat is identified by Marx as the universal class of capitalist society. It is the class which epitomizes the universal interests of all of society and all of humanity. Point one, okay? In a proletarian dictatorship, when this class is elevated to the status of the supreme subject of politics in a dictatorship, that means you indeed do have a universal state whose interests coincide with the interests of the whole country. Oh, apparently somebody, Rather than has, a, a, somebody, has, a, somebody has a link to the Dugan clip. Send it to me on Twitter. Don't, don't try to post it to YouTube. I can't see it there. Back to the Dugan stuff. <laughs> oh, it's, just, it's interesting. Okay. All right. Let's... This, is, this is purely for your benefit. You've been educating me. I want to return the love. Okay. I'd love to hear what this is. See what I think, this is. I think I think Vosh is completely checked out at this point. Nope, still him. here. What are you uh, What are you playing? I'm not playing anything. I've been staring blankly forward for the past four hours. Oh. I'm fully engaged, locked and committed. All of my neurons are right here with us, open and vulnerable to the shelling they've been taking. You got it yet, Sunday? Uh, hang on. People are... I don't think are, you're gonna get it, but I... Not everyone, not everyone is as technically savvy as I am. So how's everyone's night going? Good? No, I feel like death. I'm glad the power hasn't gone off yet. That's that's been good. Yeah, I got some coffee. It's really helped. I caught some kind of cold the other day, and just everything hurts. Like I'm 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 fine. I'm just like just intensely uncomfortable. I'm sorry. What about you, Haas? How's your superior? What archaic ethnic term do you use to describe yourself? Haas. Yeah. What? How are you doing? What ethnic term? Yeah, don't you don't you have a ter what 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 do you describe yourself as? This, there's he's like a, a YouTube video on this. It's like he's, a thing. He's, he's a he's a Mongolian Khan, isn't he? Is it is it Mongolian? Yeah. How how are your Mongolian your superior Mongolian genes holding up? How are you doing? Well, uh, it is certainly a night and a debate. <clears throat> Those are both true. Over in Russia, oh, it's go. actually the day. So are we <clears> waiting <throat> for Sunday's uh, thing about Dugan? Web archive. Okay, yeah, apparently I found it. Give me one sec. Um, translate to English. Oh, there's a video. Which is playing automatically. Can I stop this? I don't know if this is going to be TOS. I'll have to read quickly. Um... Oh god, this is a massive brick of text. I don't know what this is, guys. Well, after this conversation, you should be familiar with those, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm this this isn't helpful, guys. I don't I don't know what you're looking at here exactly. But this I don't think this is the thing that we're looking for. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, hang on, I see. So it was the... Can't we just assume that Dugan is anti-Semitic because all Russians are evil? That's the logic I've been using for my streams for the past year and a half. Works out for me. Oh, that was the quote. I can't remember what the quote was, though. It was too long. Tough crowd. Um, well, uh... Haas, was there anything you wanted to talk about, or are we just going to sit here sulking while, while I thought you were uh, going to provide something. 
for the Dugan thing, but well, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not invested in in Dugan being an anti-Semite. I just, I looked at it when you said he wasn't. I mean, you um, just, just brought it up again, so I thought it was going to be your saving. No, no, because you you were right. insisting, you were insisting that you were just com completely uh, innocent when you were once again appealing to the mega group in particular with bankers and globalists as the, the. Uh, yeah, I think I am innocent. Historical bugbears. I think I am innocent. Uh huh. Oh, here we go. Right. Got it. Here it is. Bless you, Web Archive. So we pulled this up. I'll put it into Can you the... share it in the group chat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me one sec. Just let me confirm this quickly. So here we go. So. Uh, global scale. The completion, yeah, here we go. You'll have to you'll have to translate it, but here I'll send it I'll send it to you in particular. The completion of the genocide of the Palestinians is also included in these Zionist plans, and in their opinion there will come a period of Jewish rule on a global scale, the fifth monarchy when the peoples of the earth, the Goyim, recognize the supremacy of the Jews and submit to them. Who's he talking about? Oh. They're all being violated the Talmud commandments, the Zionist leaders, in fact, yeah, yeah. So it's It's not it's not like a Hitlerite approach to it, but it's So isn't he just describing uh isn't he describing uh ultra nationalist currents of Zionism? Not what he I mean thinks, he might but... be. I, I'm not a fan of Yoram Hazoni. I'm I'm not invested in defending the integrity of what he says. I'm just saying there's a lot of people talking about this. I, I am not I don't I don't have to hinge anything on whether or not Dugan is an explicit anti Semite or not. Yeah, I think he's just describing some what some crazy people believe, not what he thinks. Oh, well, there you go. No love lost between you two, huh? No banter. What's your uh, what's your favorite sword on the wall there, Haas? you have to answer the question um so i mean just to be clear dugan's also making a lot of like opposite of anti-semitic arguments here he's saying that zionism is against the jewish religion and stuff from the orthodox jewish perspective so it's interesting you use this source i i just someone just sent this to me i i didn't i don't have this to hand all right I I think Dugan's a, a bit political theorist. I, I I have not invested in him also being like a Nazi. Yeah, but I think things like that matter when we're talking and about. He's not that. far off. He's he's a, he's an apologist and theorist for a a murderous, aggressing, fascist regime. But that's beside the point. So do you have no objections to raise any anymore? I, I have I have myriad objections. However, I am we, we've we've canvassed I think the extent of of what our generous host is is able to. Uh, Whoa, no, survive. I'm not I'm not the uh, weakest link here. Don't you quit on my account? I got my coffee. I'm fine. <sighs> well, what do you want to talk about, Oz? You can also stop if you want to. I'm not locked in both I, here. I, 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 I can't. I, I am, I am, I am unable to. It's a, it's a rule now. How are you doing, Haas? Well, you seem to have objections Sunday, and it just seems like you're unable to defend those objections without getting into the weeds of semantics. Well, no. When you're giving definitions of things, and you're okay, instead of trying to, to instead them. of trying to um, accuse me of using words inappropriately, which is already tenuous, not inappropriately, like make... contradictorily and inconsistently. 
Yeah, which you haven't been able to support. And that's why we can't get into the weeds of that, because it's a loop. Well, no, I, you, I, I, I would love to be able to Can you make just, like, an effective argument against uh, my political theory or my position? For example, do you think it's in contradiction with Marxism? Do you think it's uh, somehow... Um, do I think... Do I think uh... Yeah, okay, yeah, it is. Sure. Why is um, that? Well, for a start, you're once again, like, moving heaven and earth in order to justify orienting this around um, a, a particular um, community that is, is originating on the basis of uh, capitalist expansion and exploitation. So the, the, you mean, the you telluric... Mean, you... Hold on, to be clear, you're referring to the United States of America as a polity. Yes. The the okay. Tellurianism the Tellurianism wait, of the wait, MAGA wait, movement. Wait, 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 wait. Then the how do you hang on, hang on. I'm not done yet. The Tellurianism sure. of the MAGA movement is one that's going to be rooted on a, a, a community that established itself by exterminating and abusing the natives and enslaving Africans <laughs> and, and other people. Okay, so, but Speaking of Marx and Marxism, are you aware of what Marx and Engels themselves thought about this community that you're saying is uh, the worst thing ever? Because Engels actually advocated for the annexation of Canada. Marx defended, I don't even agree with him on this point, but he was so fanatically pro- It's like the most agreeable thing I've ever, ever He was so fanatically pro 19th century America. He defended the annexation of Mexico. He famously, in a racist quip, called the Mexicans lazy Mexicans, and he was glad the America expanded and took over Mexico. So I don't, not saying I even agree with Marx in that regard. I think it was mistaken. But Marx and Engels thought, in his letter, especially to Abraham Lincoln, he, they thought that 1776 was a revolutionary development and that the United States was a legitimate uh, community and soil for socialism. As a matter of fact, Engels said, that even European socialism, in some sense, originates in the Americas and Amer and the original uh, settlements and the Shakers, which Engels uses as an example directly. Both Marx and Engels are you almost ubiquitous. They're very clear that okay they like they think America is the future, land of the future. Okay, okay, but but Haas, okay. But Marx and Engels were also racist. It isn't like the the, hey, we're the stinging about, retort that you you think it is. We're talking about Marxism. You're saying I'm I'm not. Well, we Marxist. were talking about Marxism for a reason, You're right? You're saying I'm not Marxist because uh, I'm trying to. I'm saying I'm well, saying the fetishiz I'm saying the fetishization of of historical states is. What do you mean not, fetishization? What I mean, treating them as if they have, in your language, some some deeper underlying reality. Yeah. So the Communist Manifesto says the class struggle will be national in form. Ever since then, real Marxism has acknowledged that all class struggle is national in form. But that doesn't mean the nation is the end. That, you have situated the nation. No, no, no. No end. one's talking about the end. But we are talking about the definite context within which class but struggle you is. Are, but, you, but you are, though, if you are situating the nation or the land or something like that as, in some sense, a deeper reality beneath convention or beneath like historical change or whatever you would even go so far well, as to say, no the notion the notion that um a civilization or we're not going to use that word is deeper than the artificially contrived modern state is in no way uh opposed to marxism but it's, How it's is not it? deeper than the artificially contrived state because it's 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 but that's a materialist you realize that's a materialist insight right the idea that the real for example well, that's that's neither that's Lenin, neither. I'll give you an example of this. So I think Lenin was a Marxist. You might disagree. If you say Lenin's not a Marxist, then there's no common meaning we can have. But Lenin says, for example, as simply and as readily as he says, for example, we want to abolish the modern state. That's what Lenin said. So how will laws be enforced? Well, Lenin says, as simply and as readily as any crowd of civilized people, even in modern society interferes to put a stop to a scuffle or prevent a woman from being assaulted. And secondly, we know the fundamental social cause of excesses, which consist in the violation of the rules of social intercourse. 
So he recognized these rules of social intercourse that are somehow not reducible to modern states. I am situating those rules of social intercourse well, into the deeper. I'm, I'm not, well, well, hang, hang on, hang on. There's there's a difference between saying that all norms and conventions reduce to modern states, and saying that there is a a civilizational. They net exist deeper which, than the modern state. Yes, but they don't exist deeper than the modern state. Just because they but exist Lenin apart thinks or so. independently does not. But make Lenin it thinks so. But Lenin thinks so. He thinks when the state is gone, they will still be there. Well, well, no, because civilization has not been invoked there. Neither is nationality. What we're talking about in that he, case, it, it is definitely. No, we're just talking. We're just talking about other forms of association. <laughs> it is invoked. In he says the word "civilized people." Of course, it's invoked. Well, civilized doesn't necessarily refer to a civilization as a discrete unit, right? Like so Lenin about, uses the word "civilized." Use, no, no, but but that that this is where once again, like the distinction between civilization as a a cultural unit that has an inside and an outside and civilization is a process of essentially a kind of cultural education that's where these two things are distinct no you're so take, when he's you're talking about civilized like we, we will refer to civilized as like people who are well-mannered sometimes we're not therefore invoking like a specific type of political entity but what lenin's saying in my view implies there is a deeper texture of social relations than the state at... but that doesn't necessarily mean it's civilization right well i think it's i think it's civilization and I think Lenin would agree with me. And I think the Russian state, uh, Soviet state agreed with that insight. I think even Stalin agreed with that insight. He said, for example, in the aftermath of uh, the invasion of Hitler, he said, the Hitlers come and go, but the German people remain. The German, basically, civilization remains. So there was a recognition within Marxism, Leninism, that civilizations are indeed deeper than modern states. Uh, in practice, I mean, and then when we get to Mao in China, it's like game over, dude. That's not even up for dispute. The idea that China is a deeper civilization than the various states contending China, in the China is a, is a massive and highly varied place. Well, I'm just telling you what Chinese Marxists think, and they're Marxists, they have no problem referring to China as a civilization deeper than the modern state. And if they're not Marxists, yeah, I guess I'm that, not Marxist. Is that, is, that, is, that, is that because they have a robust reason for doing so, or because the policy of the Chinese Communist Party recently has been to try and foment nationalism to patchwork? But it's not recent. It's, it's, it's not myriad recent social schisms. It's not recent at all, problems. even before they No, came it's, not, it's not that recent. It's going on for like 30 or so years. No, more, no. Than before than Mao, when Mao was a guerrilla in the 1930s fighting Japanese, uh, in late 1930s, there were yearly uh, tributes paid by the Chinese communists to Genghis Khan for being, and this is their, in their own words, having fundamental contributions to Chinese. Oh, okay, that, that, that's cool, but you're, you're invoking just once again, like another propagandistic reason for doing this. They're, they're, okay, they're, well, Mao was a Chinese Marxist, and Chinese Marxists... And clearly, a partisan, by the way. And a partisan. Yeah, that would be an example but of Chinese Marxists clearly understood unequivocally there's no room for dispute that civilizations deeper than just modern states not just well recently. i mean ex and, and that's why they desecrate you're gonna say well that destroyed. just served their political purpose i mean no no no. i was gonna say and that's why they destroyed and desecrated uh, all of the the confucian um, who are you to say that what do you mean, who am I to say? This is a matter of historical record. They didn't destroy all of it, but if they there was... They destroyed most uh, of it. In fact, they made a big show of, of, of bringing them back out. Who are you to say that's not them. part of... Who are you to say that's not part of... In fact, it was a big thing in 2008 when... Uh, do you think... When they were... When I think was... You know, yeah, keep talking ...was quoting it. Confucius... It's not like we just got your point and you're just talking about it. Okay, we got the point. No, no I haven't finished speaking. Cultural. You don't know what my point was. We got your point. It happened during the cultural but But you didn't, though. No, no, I wasn't talking yeah, about the Cultural did. Revolution. I was talking about 2008. Okay, talk about 2008 or 2023. It doesn't matter. There's nothing written that says civilizations can't undergo these iconoclasms where they radically try to overturn prior traditions. Okay, that but then, but the then it, begs the it begs the question, though. You say the German people remain, but Hitler's come and go. Okay, what are you referring to then? The people clearly don't We're remain referring to an organic their, historical Their ethics process. don't remain We're because they... I was going to answer, but you wanted to keep talking. But I, I was referring. But you were. I, I was answering you. Like, but I'm referring to. But an you were already interrupting me. All right.
So, uh... If, if, if indeed the Hitlers come and go, but the German people remain, well, then how do you account for the, the radical restructuring of Germany? Um, the obvious yeah, fact because that all civilizations Germans die. change. They change. But you're you know, referring to it as a right? deeper reality. What so are the, you talking the, about them? So the changes underwent, going, underwent by civilization does not eliminate the continuity because it's still the same people's history and development. It's not like uh, there's some idol, and then if you burn the idol, the civilization disappears. It's no, not like there's a statue that but, every, but the civilization for something up. for something to change, right? It has to have some fixity as well. There has to be something that is enduring the change. It's not just dying and being replaced by something else. It's changing. Yeah, the people, the people's history. That's what history is. A people's history. That's what's history of civilization is this is like the Archimedes but, but clearly theory. not because multiple peoples can comprise a civilization then they never interact they have to interact in some way well not necessarily because civilization doesn't involve them constantly interacting with each other you mean family similarities of course not every individual interacts but historically constituted peoples like i'm sorry i don't you mean this individualistically or like different ethnic groups because within a civilization, all the groups do interact in some way, but not all the individuals, obviously. Well, no, because the, the civilization is defined by common practice, ritual, and culture, and things like that, and, and like forms of organization. All right, no, I don't want to get back into the semantics. I don't either. Today, but we're just talking about whether I'm a Marxist or not. You're saying I'm not a Marxist because I propose there's this deeper kind of... Even I'm, saying, I'm saying I'm saying the the MAGA thing you're is saying, dumb. You're saying Marxist I'm not a Marxist because I think that the historically constituted community of America. So you think the historically constituted community of America is illegitimate and antithetical to Marxism, but Marx and Engels and because Lenin, your basis of that isn't materialistic. It's based on this mystical woo woo perception that there's some Im embedded cultural identity in the soil, despite the fact that it was literally appropriated by a. You can entity. you can uh, give a bad faith interpretation of what I mean by the deeper embedded reality, but it was a reality acknowledged by all major Marxists in history. What? Including Mao, and especially Mao with regard to China, where it's just ubiquitous. But Stalin understood that for Russia. Well, we're talking about okay. Now we're talking about China. Because you're saying, you're calling it, okay, then Mao is also mystical, woo-woo, deeper reality of China. Uh, maybe, maybe. Like, okay, I, well, I don't, I don't know what, what currency you think Mao has with I'm him. I'm a Marxist like, I... like Mao was. I'm a Maoist. Yep. If you think that's not a real Marxist, you can have your real Marxism and you're covered in your books sitting down. So me mega communist is mega Maoism? Yes, <laughs> quite literally. Yes, it's something. Uh, I, you know, I think I make it clear in the uh, the tag. I am a Maoist, of course. I am. Mao Zedong thought specifically. Does that does that just refer, as far as you're concerned, to the invocation of of? No, I the think Mao Zedong thought. Or, what are you referring to here? Oh, I shit, think my, Mao. My I side with China and the Sino Soviet. Oh split. damn it! My internet's dead. Hang on. Mao Zedong. I can hear you. You can. Yes. Yeah, we can all hear you. Mao Zedong thought oh, is an no, advance weird. in uh, Marxism-Leninism because of his introduction of primary and secondary contradictions and uh, his, rad his radical uh, contribution. I thought you were a Stalinist. Yeah, uh, I am a Stalinist and a Maoist. You were, See, uh... Stalinists will typically be divided between the Hoja and the Mao. I'm a Mao guy, so... Okay. Uh, I thought that was common knowledge. Apparently not. Uh, oh, here. Here, somebody wanted me to ask you this. So, uh, in your essay, this is completely out of left field, uh, it thrusts to the fore the basic question, did America have to culminate in what it is today, or beginning from the very same premises, would an entirely different outcome have been possible? Make America great again really means roll the dice again, repeat, with all the Deleuzian connotations, the origin of America. Reset American history, return America to the mercy of its progenitor. Nothing could evince the sign of middle-class midwit consciousness and historical nihilism more than the slogan, quote, 
America was never great, unquote. America was great. It was great when it was other, when it was other than what it only seems now, when it was latent with culminating into something else, a time that has been forgotten because it is impossible to remember. The time passed over, echoing forever into the annals of a lost past, lost but still felt like deja vu, like a trace memory from the future. Last sentence, I promise, MAGA is there in real America and not here in the empire of lies, whose most principal and founding lie consists in the notion that the highest necessity of spirit culminates and the now putrescent modernity. I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed. Um, can you explain this one to me? Is that what your reader has asked you to explain? Uh, yeah, in particular, they, they want to know what the Deleuzian connotations are. Oh, okay. So this is drawing from also an essay from Slavoj Žižek called Repeating Lenin. So the basic Deleuzian idea is that novelty emerges from repetition. Typically, one thinks that when you repeat something, it's just going to be the same thing. Uh, but for Deleuze to truly... Re so the Freudian kind of slogan or whatever was uh, that which we repress, we are doomed to repeat. And Deleuze kind of inverts this with that which we um, repeat, we are doomed to repress. So the moment of real repetition is the revolutionary moment where you return to the origins of uh, one's being, truly return to them, and thereby enable the possibility of another, another alternative. And that's where novelty comes from. I'm given to understand that in Deleuze, uh, difference is repeated, not a thing. It doesn't matter. That's the point. Difference... Difference is what's truly repeated. Yes, that's the point. Um, oh, oh, okay, but Real you're difference. not referring to difference here, right? You're referring to an, 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 a, a conception of America, a, a thing, like a thing in the past. Uh, if, okay. Amer that's, what is a, that's a past thing. No, you can say it's a particular difference, though, if you're going to go from the Deleuze thing. But wh how, then why don't you take your gripe up with Slavoj Žižek, who talks about repeating Lenin. Well, Lenin was a person, not just an abstract concept of difference. Because you don't know how these concepts are used, Sunday. You try to have a... No, I don't. I'm, I'm a mouthpiece for Deleuze right now. Don't exist with you. This isn't... I, my my, my, Sunday, my reservoir was exhausted once we Sunday, once you folded on the partisan you thing. Tend, you tend to get... Um, kind of caught up in trying to give like wikipedia descriptions of words no this isn't this isn't this isn't uh this isn't a wikipedia description i've got a i've got a i've got a i've got a you don't robust, actually know how to i've got a robust following of delusians who are who are most distressed by this use of deluse and i promised them i'd bring this up well they can, i'm 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 out okay look just because i invoke a concept from a thinker by the way doesn't mean uh, I'm saying, oh, Deleuze com agrees with everything I'm saying. Okay, Zizek doesn't agree with Deleuze fundamentally because okay. their ontologies are totally different, even opposed, right? Uh, but he can still employ Deleuzean concepts to try and um, as something useful. So what's wrong with that? That's what I'm doing. Well, there's there's nothing wrong with that if 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 you're going to blame Zizek for this being used in a in a weird Andalusian way fair enough no my business. no I, I i think your understanding of concepts and thinkers is metaphysical you assume that there's what does a, that mean because instead of trying I, to, I, li I literally just said this wasn't my understanding i was just asking this on behalf of somebody else okay. um who says zizek agrees with deleuze deleuze has a lacanian reading which doesn't contradict zizek no, 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 zizek's sure. ontology was built in contradistinction to Deleuze, just because, see, this is the point. Hey, what, do you, what do you mean by me being metaphysical? Can you explain that? Yeah, you assume that if you don't agree with every single thing a, a thinker says, you cannot actually employ the spirit of the concepts they use to illustrate. Like, for example, Deleuze... That's not true at all. No, no, no. Actually, it's entirely the opposite. The, the, my issue, for example, with your use of Carl Schmidt and the notion of the partisan... It's because you're actually betraying the spirit of what he's talking about in order to well, you have force the conception that. of mega communism as being you partisan on the basis of word association. But the problem is that you haven't justified that. I think in the spirit of what Carl Schmidt's trying to say. But I did though. 
I did. But you didn't. You got into the weeds. But of I did. Semantic. Yeah, I got. We got into the weeds. Of but semantic. your your garden needs weeding, my you're, friend. You're sorry. Sunday. You're going off a strict literalism of the dead letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. Okay. So that's the problem. And well, it's not a, it's not a law. Theory. It's actually the launching point of the theory that you're doing. <laughs> I, it's literally like no, you're no, doing no, no. it even with the we're, phrase. We're, no, no, even hang, the hang phrase, on. the spirit of the law, the dead letter of the law. Oh, we're not actually literally talking about laws right now. Dude, it's like this is a but we're We're, we're not, though. And here's why it matters. It's because, so stupid. No, no, no. Here's, here's so why it matters. Stupid. Yeah, I know. I know you're, you're tired, too. Here, here's why it matters. Um, if you are making a theoretical account of a thing and you are leveraging somebody else's theoretical work to justify it, if no, you I'm misrepresent not that or anything. If you I'm fail not to follow the No, I'm not saying, using Deleuze as an authority to. No, we're talking about Schmidt right now. I'm, talk I'm talking about Schmidt right now. Well, I'm not using Schmidt as an authority to benefit the credit. But you do, because that's the only thing you have to motivate the use of the term partisan in the first place. And you're leveraging the identity not, of Megacon it, as me the mega movement as partisan in order to justify Dude, it. I don't use Schmidt to impress people who wear glasses like you. I use Schmidt because Sh anyone who's familiar with Schmidt will see in good faith the continuity. And it's a useful... What do you have, uh, against, uh, what do you have against glasses? It's... It is useful. What do you have against glasses? I'm not allowed to have 2020. Because it's, it's like you're this arrogant PhD guy, whatever. I took your PhD from this debate. I have three of them now. But because it's clear that Schmidt's concepts are useful for the purposes of my political theory. Elitism is when bad and eyes people. So I am using Schmidt to make it easier to understand where I'm trying to get to. But you're reading it in the opposite way. Where it's like, oh, you don't have the right or the uh, you don't have the authority or the credibility to use Schmidt because you're using him improperly from the perspective of what's allowed in my academic institution. Well, you're looking at the dead letter of the law, and you're being. But, but I'm not though. You're invoking a theory in order to Sunday. justify an argument. President semantics. The only that's reason not semantics. That's that's you a structural component the, in your, the, in no, your theory. No, no, it would be it would be semantics no, if it was on, if it was inconsequential to your conclusion. No, it's but it's the all, way you get to your it conclusion. It is one hundred percent inconsequential when we're talking when you're using the jibber well, jabber. It's, in, it's, in in it's inconsequential. It's inconsequential. It's inconsequential because the coherence of your theory is not to you a valuable component of it. Yes, it is. It's just that you are constantly calling into question my use of terms. So as to kind of uh, call into no, question. No, in fact, no, no. I, 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 I'm actually, I'm actually you're not just really. objecting to the use of my terms and the way I reference thinkers because you're trying to somehow prove that I'm not credible enough or I don't hold a PhD, so I'm not allowed to reference them. And I'm not. I'm I don't. Not, I don't I've not, never. He, I've never claimed. My PhD. goal is not. I don't have a PhD. My goal isn't to give some kind of neutral encyclopedic description of Deleuze or Schmidt, but to actively put into use the concepts they were employing to analyze our current reality. Okay, but if the concepts, more, if the more, if, more if, fundamental if, way. If so the you word, if the word, hang on, hang on though. But if the word, the Haas, and your if goal the word is you're good. using, Haas, if the word you're using is invoking the concepts they're deploying, but you misrepresent them, then that's a problem because you're still, I, you're you still, can't. no, no, but you're still, you're still leveraging the work that they did. You're just misusing it. That's why the meaning of these terms anything. matters. You haven't, you have not shown how anything has been improperly used. You're just, you're saying, oh, Carl Schmidt was talking about war. There's no way you could apply Schmidt's concept to something that is not literally referring to blowing up trains and supply lines. That's the extent. No, no, I, I gave you, I gave you an example of with no, information. That, no, 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 be, no. Be that is the extent of your like, ability. Like, there, to there's a way. Hang on, hang on. Like, let's say, let's say. Of, uh, Let's say my use of these thinkers. No, 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 no. Let, Let's say, let's say if, 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 if the mega movement did all the stuff that like anonymous was doing, right? Something like no, no. that. You want to go back to the stupid. MAGA movement, anonymous, anonymous is not a political movement done. Well, it's not a political movement, but what I'm saying though, is if they started engaging in, for example, breaking down, um, like, like typical, typical, like security barriers. In, no, in, that would just be illegal acts. That would be a state of literal warfare. It's literalism you're engaged what? in because it's the direct dead letter of the law. Okay, if the MAGA is not committing illegal attacks against infrastructure, that means it's hang on, hang on. So not we can't, partisan. 
I think the problem Sunday is especially when what you're what, what you're, what you're doing. Me. What I'm talking about is partisanship you're putting, versus hegemony you're in the ground. Tremendous, I'm not putting, talking about partisanship you're putting, versus necessarily pause, the. Uh, you're putting an astonishing amount of effort. Law. Pause. You're putting an astonishing amount of effort into justifying you basically just making shit up as you go. Okay, but. Again, that's, that's just, the, you're just posturing. You're just posturing. You I'm, claim I'm, I'm making No, I'm not. What I'm saying is that what you're calling your political theory is just you posturing. No, I'm not posturing for anything. Everything I've said but You're is only grounded. posturing. You're only posturing. You can say that, but you Look, haven't this, this is. I'm going to take my glasses off. This is me you posturing. Can say okay? it. You you're can only say posturing. it all you want. You can say it all you want, but your claim is tautological, and I don't know why anyone should be convinced to take it seriously. How's my claim tautological? Even even if I was making it up, I didn't even make a claim. Well, you know how you know how just, you know how uh, disingenuous such a. Even if I was making it all up as I was going, what does that have to do with the meaning that is attempted to be conveyed? There's it doesn't mean it's meaningless. Clearly, I'm trying to say something. In good faith, your role would be to try either to decipher what I mean to say. I or tried. To but this whole game of like, oh, you're in front really hard. The sacred objects of academia, dude. I shit what? on your academia. All your professors, I'll debate all of them. It doesn't matter. I don't care about your <clears> academic <throat> institution, and I wipe my ass with it. Okay, you can say that. Oh, you don't know anything about Schmidt. Okay, let's pretend you're right. Let's pretend you're right, which but you're not. I don't. I don't think you don't. Does that about have, this is, no, no, no. I actually, so I actually gave you credit. This I actually gave you credit. So I no, gave you credit. So hang on, hang on. Because hang on. it has to do with how these thinkers are being read Us. by people like you. You read these thinkers in this, like, you're putting them in a box, and it's just like these, it's the dead text, this dead letter of law. I'm reading these thinkers, and I'm trying to relate what they were writing to the things that at least I find important. No, no, but Haas, if, if today, there, right? no, no, but, but Haas, there are examples, Haas, 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 there are examples of what Schmidt is talking about in the theory of the partisan that exists today. Mega, the mega movement is- Yeah, I longer. know, but I think- So what you're actually doing is using the dead letter of the law, as you put it, no, in order to bury no. those other things Holy to fuck. the advantage of something that's Dude, a part of a sales know. pitch. Dude, Sunday, the problem with you is you can't comprehend the possibility that a concept can be applied in a novel way. Of course applying, it can. No, but you're not no. applying it in a novel way. Hold you're on, using, shut up for no, a no, second. You're just Let me be more you're, precise with words sorry, since you're, you're semantic Andy. Thing. Let me be more precise with words then since you're semantic Andy. I'm extending the concept of the partisan to domains and spheres that Schmidt was not directly... But, but you're not though because he covered those yes, as look. well. No. He no. didn't cover the internet. He didn't cover uh, the American two-party system. He didn't in cover... In which case, look, 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 look. In which case, you could find an analog Schmidt to it, and that would be the useful. Age. No, no, he if you found... Dude, if you dude found an, what? Okay, let me ask you a question. What would Schmidt have written about the nature of partisanship in the information age? Uh, you probably no, don't know that. No one no, knows no. that. Well, He's well, fucking dead. I'm trying to do but, that. But, but, but I can actually have an answer to that. Because history has actually... Pause. I actually have an answer to that. Stupid. I actually have an answer to that. So, for example, if uh, some group was engaging in, uh, once again, like breaking down uh, the ability of, of countries to like exchange over the Internet, which which has been done as a form of sanction recently, um, things like that, that would be an example. That would be a very okay. interesting example. So, um, so WikiLeaks, so WikiLeaks, arguably break, engages in something a little bit ability, similar to that. Okay, what about breaking the ability for the hegemony to exercise ideological hegemony over a population? <clears throat> That's a goal that is not descriptive of of a, a mode of engagement or the yes, irregularity of yes, that mode. Yes, that is literally. No, it's not because Noam you could Tom do that with a bomb, dude, or you dude, could do that with a nuke. Dude, you could Noam do that with an Tom army. Be, That's not. Noam Tom Tom not Uniquely Noam irregular. Chomsky's book, it's called Manufacturing Consent. That is how the system fucking what? engages. Yes, that's how the media works. They do actually functionally, yes, in, oh it's not God, just the world, yeah, it's something they actually do. Shit. Okay. It's not just a fucking so world. It's gotta, actually... We gotta, we got a Chomskyite Maoist. It's actually, I'm not a Chomskyite. It's just like, to be, to, to, to bring up someone who I think shouldn't be too contentious because he's a typical left lib even people like chomsky acknowledge that how can you say it's just a goal of course i'm it's i'm not I'm, I'm not but what you're describing once again is is not the activities of the partisan 
Um, Vosh, I am deeply no, offended that you've been gaming this whole the, time and you not, haven't not even invited us to play Quake. Partisan, unbelievable. Not the activities of the partisan as strictly and exclusively defined by Carl Schmidt in his work. But whether or not the concept of the partisan can be extended in ways that Schmidt did not directly foresee, you can't say that you can't uh, make a definitive judgment and say, no, that's not possible. That's an arbitrary stance. Or, uh, that's completely unjustifable. You didn't you answer can't my say, question. Which is, your favorite, question. which is your favorite sword up there? Can I see it? Hey, I accept your surrender, dude. Simple as that. Oh, so you have to answer the question. If, if, I, if I surrender, though, can I see it? No. Well, I don't surrender then. Fuck you. I've got a, I'll show you my sword. I don't want to see it. Mine are cooler than yours. My, mine are cooler, and they aren't just glittery showpieces. They're actually like cold steel, windlass, like battle ready stuff. Well, I pray you don't go to war with words because you'll be ended up getting cut up. I don't care how big your sword is, those words will do enough. That is like, it. that is such a clip. Some, somebody, somebody please save that in chat. That was beautiful. Well done, Haas. You are. Truly, the the warrior poet of the modern age. Um, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Um, you're using the word poet incorrectly. <clears throat> um, clearly, that's not what the concept of a poet uh, refers to. And there's nothing you said was meaningful just now. You're improperly using and abusing words. No, I, there's no communication that's possible. It's just an improper use of language because I said it is, and I've defined the the matrices and boundaries of what meaning is arbitrarily because i'm a guy who wears glasses and has a phd that was coincidentally just taken from me because i have I uh you you i have a bachelor's degree so I'm, I'm sorry to inform you you've taken something of significantly lower value than a phd okay all right hold on that's enough all right all right i'm sure we can all agree that this has been an extremely productive conversation we all gave it our best, and that's I hate what matters. So nope, and that's what for matters. Letting this go on for this long, dear God. Uh, now, this in, is punishment for the you, Professor Flowers shit. If you don't want to be disqualified, both of you have to say something nice about the other one, and it can't be ironic or a thinly veiled insult. All right, uh, President Sunday, you're first. Your beard is magnificent. Okay, that was straightforward. Haas, you're up next. This is a nice cardigan. Come on. I don't know what a cardigan is, but I'm like saying sweater, but better. Faith. I'm saying this in good faith. I can't think of a single thing, and I'm trying hard. Okay, then by default, President Sunday wins this debate uh, on that and Haas's inability to answer the favorite sword in the wall question. Uh, congratulations, President Sunday. All right, well, if you want, I like if the you middle one. If you want to say so, I'm confident in the uh, neutral audience ability to judge it themselves, but. I'm, I thought for a second I'd try to find something, but I just find Sunday to be such an insufferable and pedantic, pretentious person. And I don't think it's, I mean, I think it's just, ext he's extremely arrogant, posturing, and just doesn't want to have a good faith human debate. Historians will not forget your inability to say which sword was your favorite. Um, this has been uh, uh, unmitigated suffering. I should have never agreed to this. I hope you both have a wonderful day. I'm going to go eat a day's worth of food, which for me is quite a lot. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to remind myself what true suffering feels like. And are there any final words? Uh, not so much for me. Uh, thank you, Vosh, for uh, your excellent um, moderation. Um, I'll also, fuck you for letting this go on for this long. Uh, and uh, thank you, Haas, for agreeing to whatever on earth. You yeah, my so final words is Sunday. You should probably just read the Substack again. You clearly failed at the first time, so just don't give up. Don't give up. That's my word for you. I'd rather eat myself. You'll learn. You'll understand one day. So anyway, that's it. Bye bye. Well, hope you're doing well, man. Thank you, Vosh. You have a good night. Have a good night. Appreciate it. He's never going to moderate for me again. I I had fun in um in in a very specific way that I will not define.